रिकॉर्डिंग ऑन कर ना अभी अभी आई कैन स्टार्ट Good morning, everyone. This is Viha Poor, today's webinar coordinator. I welcome all the panelists, seniors, and participants in this webinar. Today, we all are gathered on this virtual platform to listen, Professor Dr. Yogendra Singh. I must tell you that people have come from various corners of India. I have never heard the different names of towns and villages in my career. I welcome you all once again. Today's webinar subject is earthquake resistant design of high rise RCC structures modeling analysis and design. Earthquake engineering was always a popular subject of the webinar for structural engineers and today same is proved once again because of large gathering. Secondly I must admit that Dr Yogendra Singh is one of the most popular teacher and expert I have seen. Now I request all the participant and panelists to turn off their audios and videos. without wasting much time i briefly introduce our webinar convener mr jayant kulkarni who is founder member and managing director at epicons consultants since inception 1985 he is graduated from vjti mumbai further he pursued masters in structures in the same college he has specific interest in various areas of engineering like codal provisions seismic retrofitting tall buildings concrete mix design advanced entity and evaluation conservation of heritage structures and indian aesthetics more than 8500 projects are successfully completed under his technical and administrative leadership in multiple avenues of civil engineering like structural <coughs> structural design project management architecture entity and infra company has received many awards from respected organizations the most prestigious award is centenary industry excellence award from institute of engineers now different aspects of his personality he is involved as trustee in we need you trust a registered charitable trust we need you focus on pre primary education computer education trade course and socio cultural programs We need you did not stop in lockdown as well with the help of Atos Sintel and Navi Mumbai Municipal Corporation they distributed ration kit to 406 families and also provided ready meal to 40000 needy migrant workers in Gansoli area now i request jain kulkarni sir to address the audience and introduce to efc good morning everybody uh i once again welcome you all such a large and great gathering i am so happy as i said the credit goes to yogendra singh also to cc for giving publicity and you all who keep interest in spending good time epicon friends of concrete is knowledge sharing platform since 1999 next it this activity is conducted under umbrella of epicon consulting private limited uh, i so 9001 2015 certified company and one of the objective defined objective of company is imparting technical knowledge to our staff engineering fraternity and society at large our inspiration goes back to late engineer ap remedios so that is how it started in 1999 these are few of the photographs of the parties along with the participant we had been conducting workshops in past now started conducting webinar since lockdown 79 workshops in 21 years and 15 webinar in last 8 months efc is an humble effort to create knowledge sharing platform and develop a facility for continued education for practicing engineers corporate consultant government semi government authorities builders and of course faculty and student and this is a brief graph i can't give you the entire list but we can see only two sample workshops and all the webinars conducted 
in last eight months. Today we are at webinar 116. 117 is outstanding structures, 17 January 2021, and advanced indicated evolution. It is on 21st February 2021. Yeah. Now our thought leaders. Of course, the mm. credit goes to my teacher and principal, Dr. V. N. Gupchuk, Pro Vice Chancellor then, my first employer, Mr. Kernik and Mr. Shikhande. Mr. Avi, you have to mute yourself. Uh, Dr. P.C. Basu, who in fact Mr. started Kaapis the entire, entire series of lecture on earthquake, first person, Alpha said a very dynamic person in earthquake engineering. And of course, Are... Dr. M.G. Gargi, who had been helping us in many of the workshops, including conceptualization. Okay, can. We, have, okay. we have team, good team, apart from myself. There is Anand Kulkani, Ravindra Deshpande, oh. Arvind Prolekar, Parashar Moghe, P.P. Pandey. All these are unit head and directors in our company. And of course, this is not enough. All the office staff, including secretaries, drivers, peon, and many, many volunteers from different departments, they happen to be the part, organizing part of this particular workshop and all the workshops in the past. With this, I thank you all for participating and we continue further. Oh, yeah, mute. Manish. Now I, now I oh. request Manish Padikar to introduce uh, Aran Kulkarni, sir. Yes, thank you, Viha. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, myself, Manish Vadikar. I am Senior Design Manager in Epicons. Now, I would like to introduce our director, Mr. Anand Kulkarni. He graduated in 1987 with specialization in structures. Further, he studied his post-graduation from Sardar Patel College of Engineering. He has 33 years of vast experience in the field of structural design of various types of structures which includes residential, commercial, institutional, and industrial structures. His expertise includes design of tall buildings. He is involved in design of more than 100 numbers of tall structures, ranging from 100 meter to 250 meter height for leading developers. He is a member of American Concrete Institute. Next. Below are the images of few tall buildings completed under his guidance. Runwal Pinnacle, Height is 245 meter. Raymond Tower, height 220 meter. Mahindra Roots, height 150 meter. SPR City at Chennai, height 180 meter. Runwal Forest, height 180 meter. Runwal Greens, height 160 meter. And the Autograph at Mumbai, height 170 meter. This is the same building which we are going to demonstrate today in our workshop. Thank you, Manish. Yes. Uh, now I would like to introduce our EFC team member and our senior director, Mr. Ravindra Deshpande. He is college friend of Jayant Kulkarni, sir. He is graduated from VJTI Mumbai and further pursued master's in structure from the same college. He has more than 40 years experience in the field of structural design. He has experience of handling various industrial, commercial, residential, and institutional projects. His expertise in design of tall buildings. Let's see some photographs of his projects. Corporate office, ONGC, Dehradun, Naukar, Palazzo, Tata Housing, Kolkata, DMART, Dharia Mansion, Girgaon. Now I request all the panelists to turn off their videos and audios. Now I request Parvekar sir to give preamble. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this topic today needs no preamble as such, uh, which is already proved by the huge response. The topic is close uh, to heart to all the structural designers who are designing buildings. Ever since, ever since we have been working with the new IS codes, 1893 and 13920, we are having so many questions in mind regarding modeling, analysis, and design. 
and detailing of all the stall structures. Let's hope that uh, at least some of them get resolved today. At the same time, we expect that uh, today's presentation will open a new window to the students present. They are present in large numbers as they will be exposed to the practical examples. With this, I uh, complete the short preamble and would like to highlight some protocols to be observed during the course of the day's proceedings. Uh, I'll request all the participants to put their technical questions only in question and answers tab. Please don't put your technical questions in chat box. It's very difficult to manage at two places. Please put your all technical questions in question and answers only. All other chats like uh, administrative things and all such things you can may have, uh, put in chat, but please put the technical questions in question and answers only. Only in the, those, all those in the question and answers will be dealt with. We'll be taking question and answers in the evening in the, uh, there is a, a time for that. So uh, please uh, have a patience to have the answer for that. And as requested earlier, I request all the guests to, to put their audios as well as videos of because it will give more bandwidth to the uh, all the, uh, And we'll have a complete session for having dedicated question and answers in the evening. With this, I request Dr. Yogendra Singh. Uh, before that, I would like to introduce you. Uh, he will introduce, uh, introduce him and then we will start. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we have introduced everybody else except for Yogendra Singh. Yeah. So Professor Dr. Yogendra Singh, he is assuming position of Railway Bridge Chair, Chair and Professor of Earthquake Engineering, IIT Roorkee. B from IIT Roorkee, MTech and PhD from IIT Delhi. Research interests include performance-based design of building and bridges, seismic vulnerability and risk evaluation, non-linear modeling and analysis, and seismic evaluation and retrofitting of structures. About 25 years of research and teaching experience, guided 13 plus student, I think it is an old slide, published 65 plus research articles in various journals and presented more than 100 papers in national and international conferences. Member of several expert teams for post earthquake damage service, Convener of BIS Expert Group on Performance-Based Seismic Design of Structure, collaborated with NORSA Norway, NGI Norway, NTU Singapore, Stanford University USA, University of Edinburgh UK, University of Windsor Canada, University of California US, and University of Porto, Portugal. This introduction is not enough. His introduction is actually his performance so you can see he's an expert and interested in performance-based design. And now you can see his performance for the next six hours. And we can really get introduced to him. Yogendra Singh, sir, please. Thank you very much, uh, Kulkarni sir, for uh, this introduction. And uh, thank you all for joining uh, this morning. Uh, I welcome you all. Now, coming to the topic which we will be talking, actually, there will be two topics which we will be taking up. Okay, before that, I have to share my screen. All right. I think my screen is visible now. Yes. Okay. So I have not intentionally kept the word tall in my uh, presentation because the topics which we will be covering are applicable to all RCC buildings and our special focus will be on tall buildings. So whatever are the special issues in tall buildings that we will include, but these are very well applicable to low rise buildings as, as well. So uh, two, talks I will be presenting. One, the first one will be on modeling of RC buildings. And the second one will be on earthquake distant design of RC buildings. Now, uh, we have conducted several talks and you people all have background 
in uh, modeling and analysis of uh, tall buildings. So I will limit to those, uh, or my focus will be on those topics which are not well understood. Regarding uh, those topics, we are getting most of the questions. Uh, before this webinar also, I have got some questions. So those uh, topics I will try to cover in more detail. If we were uh, having this session face to face, I could have invited your questions there. I, in fact, I uh, love to have questions in between. Uh, but here, perhaps that will not be possible, but still uh, you can send your questions in uh, chat box or in question answer uh, box. And I will try to take up those uh, as much as possible. Uh, otherwise also uh, towards the end of each of these two talks, we will have uh, a question answer session where I will to try to take up those questions which you have sent online. So coming to this first topic, that is modeling of RC buildings. So here, uh, two keywords are important. One is the modeling. So I will elaborate a little bit about what do we mean by modeling and uh, how we can uh, achieve a reliable model. And then the other keyword is RC buildings. So we will not be covering here what specific issues are involved in case of steel buildings. We will be uh, more focusing on RCC building, but of course, some of the things are common, which will be applicable to both the types of buildings. So in general, a building has to register two types of loads. And these two types of loads, we can divide based on their direction of application, the vertical load and horizontal load. And accordingly, there are two systems. These two systems are not independent of each other, but I can say that two actions which the structural system of the building has to register. For vertical load, we have a so-called horizontal framing system. And this horizontal framing has to register dead load, live load, snow load. And the horizontal uh, load is registered by vertical framing system. And this vertical framing system has to register wind load and earthquake load. These are the two primary loads which our buildings are subjected to in horizontal direction. In addition to these loads, sometimes uh, blast load also may be required to be considered in the horizontal direction. So the same vertical framing system will register all these horizontal loads. And this horizontal framing, which is registering vertical load, uh, consists of mainly slab and beams. And when I'm saying that uh, slab and beams are registering vertical load, doesn't mean that these will not participate in registering horizontal loads. Slabs have very important role in registering lateral loads also. And that is going to be one of uh, the main topics for today, that what is the role of slab and how should we design slabs for horizontal force. Then beams, all of us understand that uh, their uh, design is governed not only by vertical load, but these take part in uh, lateral load, horizontal load resistance as well as part of the frame. And uh, lateral load, horizontal load is registered mainly by frames, shear walls, and masonry infills. And uh, frames, most of us, or many things about the frame we understand, but shear wall is not that well understood. So the other focus of my discussion today will be shear walls. So different types of shear walls, and uh, a very common question which we are uh, hearing from uh, designing engineers is that what is the difference between a column and a shear wall? When can we say that a column is a shear wall? At what aspect ratio we can say that now it is a shear wall and we can design and detail it as a shear wall. So we will try to understand that issue also. And masonry infills, which mostly we are ignoring. Uh, now the infills uh, may not be only masonry. There are other types of infills also being used in the country, for example, uh, the AC block, the lightweight AC block, there are other types of partitions and sometimes even the concrete, uh, reinforced concrete infills also are being used. So what will be the effect of those on the performance of the building during earthquake? All these issues we are going to take up. So uh, just to give you an idea, a rough idea, this is there uh, in our new code also, IS16700. There are different types of structural systems. So when we are talking about RCC buildings, so these are the systems. So we can have frame, then we have shear walls, 
and as we are changing these structural systems their efficiency to resist lateral load is increasing so for gravity load in any case we have to design uh, a framing system which will uh, take care of the uh, vertical load but as the height is increasing the effect of lateral load is increasing because the lever arm is increasing so if we assume that uh, uh, let us say the lateral load is acting in the middle of the building so as the height of the building is increasing the moment caused due to lateral load is increasing and not only that the lateral load itself is increasing because in case of wind it depends on the height in case of earthquake it depends on the mass and as the mass and height of the building is increasing the lateral force will increase and its lever arm is increasing so we require more and more efficient systems as the height of the building increases and this is the increasing uh, order of uh, performance and when we are saying performance or efficiency of a structural system two things come to our mind one is the stiffness in case of tall buildings particularly stiffness is more important because the design is governed by inter story drift so if the building is very flexible it will collapse due to period defects so we don't want our building to deflect too much so stiffness becomes very important then in addition to stiffness strength is obvious so if we are having larger force and larger moment then the strength of uh, our lateral load resisting system should also increase but when we are talking about earthquake then another issue will come into picture and that is ductility so when we will talk about these structural systems or efficiency of these structural systems we will talk in terms of these three parameters the stiffness strength and ductility so stiffness and strength increases in this order which is shown here so we have frames which we can use up to 20 story generally we use uh, um, frames alone up to 10 stories then we have shear walls if we are adding shear walls then we can go higher then we have dual system frame and shear wall we can go further higher then we have framed tube what are these systems and how these systems are working that i am going to take up in the subsequent uh, slides and uh, we have tube into where inner tube is the core made of shear wall the outer tube is made of frame and we have modular tube or multi cell tube where multiple tubes are bundled together and it is also sometimes called bundled tube then there are further advancements where we uh, combine vertical trusses with tube so if i have to go if we have to design a super tall building um, 100 story or more or of that order then perhaps we have to combine uh, the tube with the truss also and those system we can see in case of steel uh, structures so in case of steel structures similar uh, framing systems we can see here the difference is that what we were having uh, in case of rcc buildings uh, what we were achieving through shear walls here we achieved that through braces so what you see here there is a, a brace frame and this behavior of the brace frame is analogous to that of uh, shear wall and then we have frame tube different different uh, plans of the frame tubes here and also the trust tube i will show that uh, a similar effect we can also achieve in case of rcc buildings where we are not using uh, steel braces but we are using rcc panels our code is 16700 provides a limit on the height so that we are using i mean in general there should not be any limit it's up to you what system you want to use for any height uh, but for the sake of achieving the targeted stiffness and strength code has given these limits theoretically these limits should not exist so in case of moment frame uh, in zone 4 and 5 or in case of tall buildings tall buildings means those which are taller than 50 meters we know that frames cannot be achieved but in case of uh, zone 2 and zone 3 where the horizontal force is less especially due to earthquake they are permitting it up to 80 meters and uh, similarly there are limits available all of you have seen these limits so i will not uh, repeat those you can just have a look at this what we see here is that as the system is changing from moment frame to uh, frame tube the permissible height is increasing and as we are moving from a low seismic zone to high seismic zone the permissible height is decreasing 
So in higher seismic zones, the permissible heights are less, uh, which is obvious. Then similarly, there is a limit uh, given in uh, IS 16700 on the slenderness ratio also. <clears throat> now this slenderness ratio uh, governs the flexural effect in our building. So any building will be subjected to two actions. It will be subjected to uh, sliding of a floor with respect to the other, which we call shear behavior of the building. So it's similar to a shear beam where one section is not rotating with respect to the other, but it is sliding. And the other effect is because of the overturning. And overturning effect gives rise to compressive force in the leeward columns and tensile force in the windward uh, columns. And uh, to control the amount of the axial force, the slenderness ratio is given. So if the building is very slender, then the little force will cause a lot of uh, axial force in the column. And we will see in afternoon session that as we are increasing the axial force in the columns, even if you are providing adequate reinforcement and concrete for it, its ductility is reducing uh, drastically. So we don't want to permit uh, too high axial force. And that's why there is a limit on axial force. And today morning also, I saw one question where, uh, which is related to this limit that uh, how we can calculate this limit and can we increase this more than what is given in the code. So the ductility is affected drastically when the axial force is too much. So that's why there is a limit on the slenderness. And uh, another issue is uh, with the stability. So if the building is very slender, it will have uh, large deflection under lateral load. And uh, as a result, it will be prone to large period time. Then coming to modeling, because uh, this talk is focused on modeling. So what this mod modeling is, generally uh, we think that modeling is, uh, we are uh, putting the different beams and column and shear wall elements one by one, and we achieve the shape of the building. And that is our model. So this is a misconception. Modeling cannot be done by putting beams and columns together. Many cases we will end up in a wrong model. So what we are doing in modeling is actually we are trying to simulate a, an aspect of uh, uh, behavior of the structure. So it is, first of all, it is an idealization. So modeling is always approximate. The true model of a structure is the structure itself. We can never make a true model. So whatever model, whatever sophistication we do, whether we are using finite element or we are using uh, frame method, we can never achieve the true model. Whatever model we are doing, it is always an idealization. And that's why the courts always put this limit or that limit um, on our uh, results so that we do not rely too much on modeling. We should use our results properly. Then every model is prepared for a particular aspect of behavior of a structure. For example, the model for gravity may be different and model for literal load may be different. Model for dynamic behavior of the structure may be different. Model for static behavior of the structure may be different. And whether the model which we are making for a particular aspect of behavior of the structure is correct or not, that will be known if we know the behavior. So the knowledge of the behavior of that structure is a prerequisite for making the model. If you do not understand the behavior of the structure, then you will not be able to make a reliable model. So it is very important that we understand the behavior of the structure before starting the model. And uh, how we can understand that? Of course, during discussions and uh, classes, we can understand, but that's not the only source of this knowledge of the behavior. We have to study in the books and uh, we have to look from the papers, research papers, that how a particular structure is behaving under a particular type of loading. And that understanding is very, very important. And that's why before going to the actual modeling, I want to discuss some important key aspects of behavior of tall buildings. So first thing we, are, we have to discuss is the frame action. So suppose I have uh, two cantilever columns 
and these columns are connected by slab or these are connected by a beam which is rigid in its uh, own plane but it is not able to transfer moment to the columns so the joint is pinned we can treat this as pinned joint or we can also think that the out of plane um, uh, stiffness of this slab is very small a close example of this is uh, flat slab because in flat slab there is little capacity moment capacity between the slab column joint so we can treat something like this and when it is subjected to lateral load uh, if both these columns are equal then the uh, load will be shared equally py2 and py2 and due to that there will be a moment and moment will be this load into lever arm so py2 is the force which is registered by each column and h is the height so ph by 2 will be the force uh, sorry moment uh, registered by uh, both the columns now suppose i make one change that i make this beam rigid and it is rigidly connected to the columns and then the same force p is applied then we know that the moment which will generate at top and bottom that will be the load will be distributed again uh, py2 and py2 but now this column will deflect in double curvature and as a result in the at the mid height we will get a point of contraflexion and now this moment will reduce it will be ph by 4 so you can see that the moment in this case is half and where has the remaining effect of this force gone that has gone to this overturning here there was no vertical reaction at these uh, base of these columns but here we see that the vertical reaction will develop this is ph by 12 upward and this is ph by 12 uh, downward so the equilibrium will be satisfied together by these moments which are developing in the columns and these uh, axial forces and reactions which are developing in the columns so we can see here the moment is reduced to half of that and in lieu of that we are getting axial forces and reactions this is by virtue of this beam which is rigid but in reality the beam will never be rigid so in our real frame we are going to have the columns and beams both are flexible but the joint is integral so if we are having this integral joint so moment can be transferred then we know that the moment will be somewhere in between these two so it will be in between ph by 2 and ph by 4 so uh, we can always estimate this for this moment and we will see that it it will be somewhere in between and the similarly the vertical reaction will also be somewhere between 0 and this ph by 2 now what is happening here what we are achieving by making the joint between the beam and column integral by transferring the moment here we are able to reduce the moment in our column and that is our first step towards development of uh, lateral load registering systems so where we are um, replacing the bending moment by axial force now what is the advantage the advantage is that every member inherently is very strong and rigid in axial action as compared to bending action so for example if i give you any element and i ask you to uh, break it you know by common sense even even you need not to think you will try to bend it like this for breaking you will never try this because you know every stick is very strong in axial action it is very difficult to break it in axial action but you can very easily break it in uh, uh, bending so more and more load we transfer through axial action more efficient the system is and uh, this principle is used or has been used in development of all these structural systems which we have seen naturally what will be the next step the next step will be a braced frame we are where i have provided a diagonal bracing also and uh, in this case what is happening the bending moment becomes zero there is no bending moment and whole of this p force is registered by the axial action and uh, by developing these reactions ph in this case the reaction will be ph by l so whole of the force is being registered by axial forces in the members and strength and stiffness of this member this system is even higher 
But as I said that we, in case of earthquake, we have to look not only for strength and stiffness, we have to look for ductility also. Now, what is happening to ductility? Ductility will come from the yielding of these uh, members. So if I'm having cantilever columns like this, then the yielding will occur here in the columns. And if the yielding is occurring here, whatever ductility is available in our columns, that will govern the performance or ductility capacity of our structure. And we depend on ductility a lot. Uh, just to give you an example, in our typical design, we are depending about 20% on strength and about 80% we are depending on ductility. So ductility is also very important. So when we are designing our uh, later load registering systems for tall buildings, which are governed by earthquake, so in high seismic zones, so it is not only the strength and the stiffness, we have to look for ductility also. And that's why in codes, there are so many um, limits uh, because the ductility, we never estimate explicitly in our designs. Ductility is uh, understood, but we are not estimating ductility in the same way as we are estimating the stiffness and the strength. The stiffness and strength, we calculate, but the ductility usually we do not calculate. Ductility is taken into account through response reduction factor R. So when we are designing these systems, we are selecting these systems for our uh, later load resistance in uh, the building, then we have to keep in mind the ductility also. And how the ductility will vary? We can see it from here. If it is a frame, typical frame, then we are designing our columns stronger than the beams. And uh, actually the plastic hinges will first form in the beams. And there is a reason why we want uh, the plastic hinges to form in beams because in columns, we do not get, get that much ductility as we get in beams because columns are subjected to axial forces also in addition to bending. And uh, as I said in the beginning also, the ductility reduces in presence of axial force. So we uh, design our structure in such a way that the hinges or the yielding takes place in beam and not in columns. And uh, if I plot the load displacement curve for this type of system, we get something like this. And you know the ductility ratio is the ratio between the maximum displacement. Sorry, this axis system has interchange. Actually, displacement is on x-axis and base shear is on the uh, vertical axis. So the maximum displacement to this yield displacement, that ratio is the ductility ratio. And this ratio is very important in earthquake resistance. On the other hand, if I'm having a braced frame. It is definitely more stiff and more strong as compared to this frame. But the problem is that here, this member, the diagonal member, this is yielding, this is developing the hinge. And when it is developing the plastic hinge in compression, um, no matter how uh, squat, how stocky this system is, even if it is not slender, if, 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 if its slenderness ratio is very low, but when the plastic hinge takes place, it will be subjected to buckling because after yielding, the effective modulus of elasticity of the material will decrease. It will become almost zero. So at that load, in that condition, it will be subjected to buckling and after yielding, it will not be able to take much load. So if I plot the load displacement curve for this, it is different in compression and this is different in tension. Again, I have made the same mistake here. Displacement is on uh, x-axis and base shear is on y-axis. So in compression, it buckles. And as soon as it buckles, it loses its little load capacity. So when this diagonal is subjected to compression, that means the load is towards right. And we know in case of earthquake, load is reversible. So in case of frame, I have not plotted on tension side or on the other side of the load because here, the same graph will be repeated in, uh, it is having a symmetric behavior. So same graph will be repeated for the other direction of the loading. But here the direction will be different. In case of tension, we can get good ductility, but in compression, we will not get good ductility. And that is the problem with this type of system. And uh, that's why the system of uh, uh, eccentrically based frames has been developed. And in eccentrically braced frames, we ensure that our braces are not yielding. The yielding occurs in the link portion in the beam. And due to that, we are achieve 
uh, good ductility also. So in addition to strength and stiffness, we get there the good ductility as well. Now, in another way of enhancing uh, the later load resistance of our systems is by elongating the system along one line. So if I elongate the system in one direction, I'm putting more material away from the neutral axis, then the effective moment of inertia will increase. So in case of a frame, we have what we call typical shear deformation behavior. So when a frame is subjected to lateral load like this, each floor is sliding above the other. So this sliding action is similar to the shearing action in our uh, beam. And we also call it uh, shear beam, shear column action of our frame. And here the deformed shape is like this. The story shear is maximum at the base. So the story drift will also be maximum. This story drift is nothing but similar to shear strain. That angle we are representing by shear strain, the angle of distortion. So here we can see that it is maximum at the base. And as we go up, the story shear reduces and becomes almost zero in the top story. And there we can see that this is almost vertical. So the shape will be like this. On the other hand, if I have a shear wall, shear wall is like a cantilever beam. And uh, this will have predominantly bending action. So sometimes people say that uh, perhaps the shear wall name is not correct. We should call it bending wall because its behavior is mainly governed by flexion. And the difference between flexure and shear is, you know, in case of flexure, the behavior is governed by uh, the curvature and curvature is proportional to moment. So curvature is maximum at the base and curvature is zero at the top. But curvature, when you integrate it once, you will get slope. And when you integrate it uh, once again, then you will get the displacement. But the slope is zero at the base. So that's why you see the curvature is maximum here. The rate of change of slope is maximum, but the slope is almost, slope is zero at the base and gradually the slope goes on increasing. But what gives rise to uh, here is that the deformed shape of the frame and shear wall are very different. The shear wall, if I have a shear wall building, its mode shape will be something like this. Its deformed shape will be something like this. On the other hand, if I have a frame building, actually it will have a deformation like this. And more interesting phenomena happens when I combine the frame and shear wall. So when I'm combining the frame and shear wall in the same building, and this combination occurs through the slab. That's why I said that the slab is very important in case of later load resistance also. It is doing the distribution or redistribution of the forces between different later load resisting uh, elements. And as a result, because this shear wall and the frame are interconnected at every floor level through a slab, these have to move together. And the resultant shape will be somewhere in between. So it will be a combination of the two. And what you see, this resultant shape will cause the forces in such a way that in the bottom portion, the shear wall will be supporting the frame. And in the top portion, the shear wall will be uh, loading the frame. So the load in the frame in the top portion will be increased because of this so-called frame shear wall interaction. And we can see that due to this interaction, a lot of force will be transmitted through slab. The in-plane forces which will be transmitted through the slabs. And our slabs need to be designed for those forces. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this also, that how we can design our slabs to transfer these forces. Now, then one important question which we have been uh, raising or which, we, which has been uh, rather troubling us is still, it's not clear in our code that what is the difference between a column and a shear wall? And uh, can we say a wide column as a shear wall? Because in some of the cities that, uh, especially in Northern part, we have seen that uh, people are using uh, uh, very thin columns. So one dimension of the columns is thin, the other dimension of the columns is large. So in shape, it looks like a shear wall. So can we design and detail as a shear wall? And uh, both the answers are coming. Some people say that, yes, we can, uh, if a column is wide, then its behavior will be like shear wall and we can design it as a shear wall. Now, what I want to uh, bring out here is 
that whether a component is a column or it is a shear wall is not decided by its aspect ratio it will not be decided by its cross section that how long the cross section is it will be decided by the shape of the bending moment diagram so this is very important because you have seen here the frame and shear wall these are deforming differently so the deformed shape of the column is going to be different and uh, not only that the shape of the bending moment is going to be different when uh, here i have not shown that but if you see this closely each column will be subjected to a double curvature bending shear wall is not subjected to double curvature bending shear wall is having maximum moment at the base and then this moment goes on reducing towards the top and if i am using frame and shear wall both then it is possible that the bending moment changes sign near the top because the force on the shear wall will change sign in bottom portion you are seeing it is acting towards uh, right and in the top portion it is acting towards left so it is possible that the bending moment changes its sign at the top but the shape will be such that it there will not be points of contraflexion at every story on the other hand if we are talking about a column as part of frame there will be point of contraflexion at every story mid height so this is the typical bending moment diagram uh, which we are getting for a column so uh, for both the directions of earthquake force when it is towards right or when it is towards left we will get the bending moment diagram like this and uh, if we uh, take during time history this is what we get from static analysis this is what we are getting from time history so in case of time history analysis uh, higher modes also come into picture and this may not be symmetric about this axis but what we see here is that there is point of contraflexion at the mid height so if we are getting this type of bending moment diagram then what we have to do we have to ensure that the top and bottom of a column at every story should be detailed to undergo inelastic deformation or to develop plastic hinges so we have to expect that the plastic hinges will occur at the top and bottom of every story there is a possibility so we have to do the ductile detailing accordingly but on the other hand when we are talking about okay this is another uh, example of a frame where the bending moment in uh, column and beam is shown the typical shape and we can see here we are having point of contraflexion and the maximum moment is occurring at top and bottom of each story column so there is a possibility of yielding here and there is a possibility of yielding here also and uh, accordingly we have to do we have to provide confinement in the bottom portion of the column as well as to top portion of the column on the other hand if we compare it with the shear wall then even if it is uh, uh, a uh, coupled shear wall like this which is connected through these uh, coupling beams we will have the jig jag type of uh, bending moment but we will not have points of contraflexion in general the shape will be such that the bending moment will be maximum uh, at the base and it will go on reducing along the top and here the ductile detailing will require a different consideration we have to ensure that the plastic hinge should form at the base and plastic hinge should not form in the upper portion so in case of a shear wall the bending moment diagram is different and at the same time the possible location of the plastic hinge is also different and we ensure that there is good ductile detailing good confinement at the base and in the top portions we have to protect it against uh, formation of plastic hinges and that we do using capacity design and in capacity design actually here i have shown that this is the actual shape of the bending moment diagram which we will get and when it is reversible then i will get the bending moment diagram like this so an envelope is made by this dotted line and this envelope is further increased in such a manner that in the bottom portion we have a critical height up to that we continue the moment capacity to be the same and um, this hcr the critical height this is roughly equal to the Uh, length of the shear wall so up to that length we have to keep the reinforcement same beyond that we can reduce the reinforcement 
but no where the reinforcement should be reduced in to that an extent that the bending moment comes below this envelope so this is the capacity design concept in case of shear wall and recently uh, people have learned that when the plastic hinge forms here in non linear analysis actually the shape of this bending moment diagram changes and uh, the reason for that is because the mode shape change after the hinge forms here and as a result the bending moment near the mid height increases and what they have suggested recently that this constant moment should continue roughly up to the mid height of the shear wall we should not reduce although our analysis will give us bending moment diagram like this but while designing we should provide reinforcement almost constant up to mid height of the shear wall and beyond that we can reduce it uh, to that extent so that the plastic hinge forms only at the base it does not forms in the middle so if we are clear about this behavior and the yielding of the shear wall we will be able to uh, model and design the shear walls correctly otherwise if we depend just on this bending moment we are bound to make an error and in that case the plastic hinge will form in our shear wall somewhere in the middle because the, you can see that the bending moment in the middle is very small if we are talking about a coupled shear wall or a um, dual system frame shear wall action so here the bending moment will be small and if this bending moment is small and we design only for that much moment then during um, time history or during the application of earthquake we will develop plastic hinges here also and if the plastic hinges develop here then what is the problem the problem is that the ductility of the system will reduce drastically so ductility of the system is maximum if we are having plastic hinges at the base and if the ductility if the hinges are forming in the upper stories also so first of all wherever the hinges are forming we have to provide ductile detailing we have to provide confinement that is one issue even if we provide confinement if the plastic hinge is forming here the ductility of the system as a whole is going to reduce drastically now a further improvement is in uh, coupled shear wall so in coupled shear wall uh, what we are getting is uh, that the openings are arranged vertically in uh, our shear wall and these vertically arranged uh, openings distribute the shear wall into two shear walls one on the left side another one on the right side and we can represent these shear walls by their center lines so shear wall can also be treated as a wide column so it is having the dimensions equal to the length of the shear wall here and the thickness and we can represent by the center line similarly this portion of the shear walls which is in between the openings that we call coupling beams and beams also we can represent by dotted lines so we can represent a shear wall also by a frame only thing is that in that frame the size of the columns and size of the beams will be larger then if we see this portion of the shear wall which is between the opening and the edge of the shear wall if i take this section which i have shown by this box here so this portion is representing a section of the shear wall and we know that uh, from the bending theory if we ignore the shear deformations then the plane sections which are plane before bending will remain plane after the bending and if those are perpendicular to uh, the neutral axis those will remain perpendicular to the neutral axis so when this shear wall is subjected to lateral load what will be the deflected shape the deflected shape will be something like this both the shear walls are going to bend in the same fashion as we have seen earlier and this uh, plane section which was plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis this will remain plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis so this section will occupy this position this section will occupy this position and in between it is the coupling beam and what we see here that the coupling beam will be subjected to very large deformations very large bending moment and uh, shear forces now if it is subjected to very large bending moment and shear force what is the critical issue the critical issue is that its length is small so 
it will be a shear critical member. So its behavior will be governed by the shear force, not by the uh, bending moment. And as a result, we have to provide adequate shear strength to this. And in lieu of that, we are getting an advantage. And the advantage is that because of this arrangement, because of these shear walls connected uh, together, we will get the high strength and also higher ductility as compared to the walls if these were separated or these were just connected by um, slabs. We can see the deformed shape in this graphical view also. So here, when the shear wall is bending, this plane section, which was plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis, it has to remain plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis here. And accordingly, we can see that the same shape is being occupied by the coupling beam in between. And as a result, this coupling beam is subjected to uh, damage. And invariably, the coupling beam will be damaged during earthquake. And uh, due to this damage, due to the yielding, which is occurring here, we will get dissipation of energy or uh, the ductility. And that helps in resisting the earthquake. The principle is like this. Suppose I have two shear walls of width B, then the total moment of inertia of these two shear walls in the lateral direction will be two times T, T is the thickness and B is this width. So two times TB cube by 12. So that is one by six of TB cube. If I combine this, if I put them together, then this moment of inertia will be T into 2B now becomes the depth. So T into 2B cube by 12, which I can write down as four by six TB cube. So the moment of inertia will increase four times of that. Now, if I do not want to combine or if I do not combine these like this, I do not integrate them, but I connect this through beams here. Then what is going to happen? Then the moment of inertia will be somewhere between this one by six TB cube to four by six TB cube. So it will be somewhere in between and how much this moment of inertia will be, that will depend upon the shear transfer capacity of these coupling beams. So if these coupling beams were continuous, then the moment of inertia will be four by six TB cube. But if these are not continuous, they, there are openings in between, then this will be somewhere in between. And that will depend upon the capacity of these to transfer the shear. So these, in case of um, coupled shear walls, these coupling beams are the crucial link. We have to focus on this design of these coupling, design and detailing of these coupling beams. That's why all the codes emphasize on design of these coupling beams. Now, another further improvement of this system is what we call core and outrigger. So in core and outrigger, we have a concrete core, and then we have columns outside the core. The columns are connected uh, to the core through beams like this. So when it is bending, then uh, in case of shear wall, the plane sections will remain plane, but our beams are flexible. So beams are going to bend like this. And as a result, here there will be a warping. And uh, the moment of inertia here, if I calculate, the moment of inertia in this case will be uh, that of the shear wall plus that of the columns. So the moment of inertia of the columns is not very large. But suppose this top portion I make rigid. So this is called outrigger. So outrigger is a horizontal rigid member. And that extends that plane section, which is perpendicular to the net neutral axis of the shear wall, beyond the shear wall, and up to the columns. And as a result, what will happen? This uh, leeward column, this will be subjected to uh, compressive, sorry, tensile force and the windward column that will be subjected to compressive force. And as a result, the total moment of inertia of this system will increase. The total moment of inertia will be now the moment of inertia of this uh, shear wall plus area times H square, area times distance square of these columns. So the resultant later load resistance will increase significantly if we provide this outrigger system. And further enhance this outrigger system, we can add a belt. So here we have a shear wall. On the shear wall, we have uh, an outrigger. And in addition to that outrigger, a belt is also provided all around. And as a result, what will happen? 
when the shear wall is bending it will bend this outrigger and outrigger is connected to this belt which is all around the building perimeter so that belt will also bend in the same fashion because it is rigid and usually we achieve this belt by uh, making a solid story so we make uh, one story solid and it behaves like a horizontal shear wall and uh, due to that it is engaging all these columns which are around uh, the shear wall and uh, the effective moment of inertia which is responsible for stiffness and strength that will increase tremendously and uh, uh, similar system we can also have at the base because in case of uh, shear walls it is not only important that we should ensure that the shear wall should uh, uh, yield at the base we have to also ensure that the shear wall should be fixed at the base because if the shear wall is rotating at the base then uh, that stiffness and strength will not be mobilized so to mobilize that stiffness the base should also be fixed and if it is uh, connected to a small foundation then that foundation will uplift and as a result the shear wall will not be fixed at the base so similar type of outrigger system and the belt system we should provide at the base also so either we have to provide a very thick uh, raft foundation so that the shear wall is really fixed at the base or if we are not providing such thick or such thick raft is not required in that case we should have a similar belt and trigger uh, outrigger system at the base so that the shear wall is fixed at the base this is also important then the next system is uh, frame tube so frame tube we can consider in um, two directions i mean in two ways we can visualize it it is a tube made of frame so we put four frames along the perimeter of the building then its lateral load resistance increases and uh, the concept is very similar uh, to what we have a solid rod and a pipe so we know if i put the same material with the same material i make a solid rod and uh, i put the same material in case of a hollow pipe then the lateral moment of inertia of the hollow pipe is uh, much larger as compared to the solid rod so more material i put along the perimeter the more efficient the system is so here we are doing that by providing these lateral load resisting frames along the perimeter intentionally i have used this word lateral load resisting frames because we may require some more columns in between to support the gravity load but those that system is much flexible as compared to this system so that is not resisting much of the lateral load the lateral load is registered by this outer uh, perimeter frames only so this we call uh, frame 2 when which consists of at minimum four frames uh, put on all the four sides of the building now these buildings are subjected to uh, shear lag there is a problem of shear lag and due to shear lag the corners corner columns are subjected to large axial force whereas the columns in the middle of the flange are subjected to less axial force so that reduces the efficiency of the system and to enhance that system we can provide a belt all around so at some of the intermediate stories if we provide the belt then shear lag effect will reduce alternatively okay this is one of the examples um, of one of the early and uh, the tallest building the world trade center which is no more so uh, these twin towers these were made of a tube in tube system or a frame tube system so in tube in tube system what we have similar to frame shear wall we have a, shear, a, a, a tube at the core which houses all the services and lifts and the staircases so that is made in uh, shear wall so it becomes a very rigid tube and the outer tube is a frame and both the tubes are connected through these floor diaphragms so these act together and transfer the load from uh, one to the other so this system increases the strength and stiffness further because the inner core which is made of solid tube that is much more rigid and strong we cannot put such a tube made of shear wall on the outer perimeter there we need openings for windows so there we have to go for frame but uh, interior tube where we are providing service core there we can have a closed uh, tube and uh, that closed tube 
increases the efficiency of the system. Then if we have to go even taller, we have to combine uh, uh, the truss with the tube. This increases the efficiency further. And these trusses are sometimes also called mega trusses because these are not uh, um, encompassing one story. These trusses are taking care of several stories. So the size of this truss is much larger than our conventional trusses. Similar arrangement we can also obtain in case of RCC buildings by providing shear panels in a particular fashion. So this will enhance the stiffness of the frame tube further. We uh, can take care of the um, shear lag phenomena by providing multiple tubes. So here we have multiple valves and uh, a large number of columns are either at corner or those are at the junction of the bav and flange. And as a result, these columns will be subjected to larger force as compared to the columns in between. And overall, the efficiency of the system will increase. Then we have seen that in case of uh, all these systems which we have discussed, the floor has an important role. And the floor, we also call it diaphragm. So floor has two actions to perform. One action is that it is uh, registering the vertical load and there it is acting like a plate. So it is subjected to bending in out of plane direction and that bending is represented by a plate. So if I'm interested in design of slab for gravity load, let us say a typical low rise building where its role in uh, lateral load is not that crucial. In that case, I can model my plate, uh, sorry, I can model my slab using plate elements. That, that will also work. And uh, that will give me the bending moments in the two directions and I can design for that bending moment. But when we are talking about a tall building where shear walls are also there, there may be some rigid frames and there may be some frames which are not uh, registering lateral load or so-called gravity frame or gravity column, then earthquake force will act everywhere. Earthquake force will act on these gravity columns as well. Earthquake force will act throughout this floor. So, and it needs to be transferred to the shear walls or these rigid frames, which we are providing to resist the lateral load. And that transfer is made by this slab. And uh, this slab is transferring these forces through its in-plane action. And because of that in-plane action, we call it diaphragm or membrane. So the role of diaphragm and membrane, if you are familiar or must be familiar with uh, this finite ele element uh, nomenclature where we are having plane stress behavior. So this behavior is plane stress and where the stresses are developing in its in plane. So if I have to model the behavior of this diaphragm for lateral load, I have to model these using plane stress element. And generally, we will combine both. And when we combine this plate with the plane stress, it becomes a shell element. So shell element is ideal for modeling of a diaphragm. But suppose my diaphragm is solid and uh, uh, the shear walls and the frames are distributed throughout, then I understand that diaphragm action is not, in-plane action is not uh, that important. It will act as rigid. In that case, to minimize the computational effort and minimize the size of my computer model. I can represent these by rigid diaphragms also. What is rigid diaphragm doing? Rigid diaphragm is ensuring that there is no deformation or very less deformation in the plane of this slab. And load is uh, distributed to different elements in proportion of their stiffness. So otherwise, if there is not a rigid diaphragm, then load is not distributed to the elements in proportion to their stiffness. In that case, the load is distributed in proportion to the tributary mass. How much mass is associated with a particular element? That much earthquake force will go to that element. But if the diaphragm is rigid and it is properly connected to uh, my later load resisting elements, in that case, the load will be transferred in proportion to the stiffness of later load resisting elements. And that's why I can have something like a gravity frame or a gravity column, because somehow if I make the stiffness of this uh, column much less as compared to the other frame, then very less literal force will go to it. 
and it can easily resist that much force without uh, much reinforcement requirement and much detailing requirement. So I can design this column not to yield uh, during earthquake. So in that case, or to have limited yielding so that it can uh, continue its uh, vertical load carrying capacity. But at the same time, it is not required to resist the lateral force. So by virtue of this diaphragm only, that is possible. If this diaphragm is not rigid, if we do not have this action available in our uh, building, then I cannot have this type of distribution of load from one member to the other by changing their uh, stiffness. So how the load is transferred, that is explained here. Suppose we talk about wind load. Wind load will act over the whole face of the building. And when the wind load is acting on this face, let us say a typical panel, it will go to the top floor and the bottom floor. If it goes to the column, from columns also, it will go to the top floor and the bottom floor. And from this floor, it will be transmitted to these shear walls. Because this frame, which I have here, this is not rigid enough in outer plane. It is taking or it is registering the force in the x direction, but it is not registering the force in the y direction. So y direction forces are to be registered by the shear walls. But y direction force will act over this face. If the wind is blowing in this direction, then it will act actually on this face. And from this face, it has to be transmitted to these shear walls. And that transmission takes place uh, due to this uh, diaphragm action of the slab. And uh, we can um, understand this behavior like this also. Suppose I have a building, this is a hypothetical type of building where I have a long uh, floor like this. And in between I have columns which are flexible and at the end I have these shear walls. Then what will what is going to happen? If earthquake is acting in this direction or even the wind force is applied in this direction, then the wind force or the earthquake force will be registered by these shear walls which are at the end, but it will be applied throughout. And as a result, this diaphragm is going to bend in this shape as it has been shown here. And due to this bending, there will be bending moment and that bending moment will cause tension along this long edge. So along this edge, there will be tension. Along this edge, there will be compression. And when the wind or the earthquake reverses its direction, this roll will also reverse. This end will go in tension and this end will go in compression. So in real building, it may not be this drastic as I have shown here, uh, just to illustrate uh, the concept, but there also this action will be there. And due to this action, we need to provide continuous longitudinal reinforcement along the perimeter because this, will, this action will happen in both the directions. So we should have this continuous reinforcement. Suppose you provide opening here, you provide a large opening here, then what is going to happen? That opening is discontinuing our compression element here because this edge has to take compression or when the earthquake will reverse, then the tension here. So that's why the codes have limits on uh, uh, the location as well as the size of cutouts in floor slabs. Because the floor slab is not only registering the vertical load, it is having an important role in lateral load resistance also. So typically here, we have to provide some additional reinforcement to take care of the tension which will occur due to this banding. Usually we are having beams along the perimeter. So if we are having beams along the perimeter and there is no cutout, then it will be taken care of by those beams. That's why so far you might not have bothered about this. But when you are talking about a tall building and uh, there may be a flat slab, there may not be beams here, then we require a additional reinforcement here. And that reinforcement can be even computed. So here, the, this dimension of the slab will act like a depth and we can calculate the bending moment and we, we can calculate how much reinforcement is required uh, in as when it is working as tension cord or if it is working as compression cord, then how much reinforcement is required, we can design for that. Okay, so it is illustrating the calculation of the same moment. We can treat this as simply supported. Okay, so if, uh, yeah. Then another issue in case of uh, diaphragm is that this force, which is being applied over the whole floor, 
is to be transmitted to these shear walls. So at the interface of these shear walls, large shear force will develop because it has to be transferred through this connection. So first thing is that the reinforcement of the slab should be anchored into the shear walls, but even then it may not be adequate. In that case, what we have to do, we have to do the collector elements here. So we have to provide, if the beams are running in this direction, then those beams can uh, act as collector elements. If the beams are not running, then we have to provide reinforcement dispersed into the slab. So in this slab also, we should provide some additional reinforcement so that the shear wall can mobilize its uh, strength through the load transfer from uh, these dispersed uh, collector elements. So if we see typically, so here, the force will be acting over this whole slab and it will be registered by the shear wall. So this portion of the collector element will be subjected to compression. Whereas this portion of the collector element will be subjected to tension. So we can calculate that how much force is being transferred through compression and how much force is being transferred through tension. And accordingly, we have to calculate this reinforcement. So uh, in modern design of tall buildings, design of slab is also very important because invariably you will be having cutouts for uh, different regions in, uh, especially when it is core, then core inside will be cut out. And the connection between the shear wall core and the slab becomes very crucial. And that connection needs to be designed for the shear force. And if uh, it is exceeding, suppose here is our shear wall, this is the floor, what is shown by these arrows, this is where the shear transfer takes place. And suppose this is not adequate, then what we have to do, we have to provide this reinforcement here, which will be transferred through this collector element. And this problem becomes very important when we are uh, talking about that so-called back stay. I will come to that back stay later. But here, this is the top of the ba basement slab. So the top story of the basement, that is having this slab. And this shear wall is registered or it is uh, um, restrained by this slab at the base. And as a result, this slab will be subjected to very large force. So all the shear force in the shear wall will be um, accumulated from the top and all that is to be transferred. So this slab has to be designed especially for uh, this load. So the thickness we have to increase and we have to provide additional reinforcement in this portion. If we have openings here, then we can understand that our uh, tension and compression cords are discontinued and that's why the code has limits on this. Uh, you are all familiar with, with these limits. If there is any point, uh, we will take up in the discussion. But the purpose of these limits is that the tension and compression fibers here, which will occur along the boundaries, along the edges of the slab, those should remain intact and their sufficient size should be available to transfer those forces. Now, uh, this backstay fact, I was discussing there. So if I have a shear wall and uh, there is a tall building, there is a tower of a basement and this top slab of the basement, this is very crucial because when the shear wall is going to bend, let us say in this direction due to this lateral force which is applied, it will be registered. The first resistance will come at the level at the top of the basement and here a force will be applied opposite to this. And as a result, the bending moment diagram or the shape of the bending moment diagram in the shear wall will change. We will get the maximum bending moment at this level. But this diaphragm should be rigid enough and this diaphragm should be strong enough to transfer. Some of the questions were there that uh, what is this backstay fact and uh, what is the sensitivity analysis? So the behavior of the shear wall depends on the behavior of this slab. Suppose this slab is very rigid here. Then what will happen? The shear wall will be subjected to a couple here. There will be a force towards right at this level and a force towards left at this level. So whatever bending moment is accumulated in the shear wall here, that bending moment will be registered by this couple. And this foundation slab and this backstay slab, the podium top, 
this should be rigid and strong enough to develop these forces. Suppose this is not there, then what will happen? In that case, the shear wall will act like a cantilever. And in that case, the foundation will be subjected to a bending moment, lot of bending moment. In this case, the bending moment at the foundation will be reduced because of this couple. So the bending moment in the foundation will be less, but there will be a horizontal force, in-plane force, uh, which will act uh, in the foundation. So how much bending moment will be transferred to uh, the base of the shear wall? That will depend upon the stiffness and strength of uh, this back stiff slab. And that's why this analysis and design becomes very important. And in case of earthquake, this uh, slab is going to crack, the reinforcement is going to yield. So it becomes difficult to estimate exactly how much force will be transferred here. If you are making a model, let us say if you make model of this full structure and model the slab also using uh, shell element and you calculate what is the bending moment and you may think that this bending moment is accurate and you should design your foundation for that bending moment. But it's not the correct picture because we are not modeling what will happen during earthquake. During earthquake, this is going to crack. The slab is going to crack. The reinforcement is going to yield. So that's why the stiffness of this backstay diaphragm that is going to change. And as a result, the code asks us to do a sensitivity analysis. In one case, we will assume that this is fully intact. The slab is fully intact. And in that case, what forces we are getting, we will design for that. And in that case, the bending moment is going to be maximum at, in the shear wall at this level. In other case, we will take the minimum resistance which may be offered by this slab. And when we take the minimum resistance, then the bending moment at the base, at the connection of the shear wall with the foundation, that is going to be maximum. That's why we have to consider two cases in this case. The first case, we assume that everything is rigid and uh, no displacement is allowed at that location. And in second case, we assume that this is flexible and then the bending moment will be transferred to the base because we have uncertainty about the behavior in uh, our model. Secondly, if we have two towers of different heights and those two towers are also connected, then the similar back stay effect we will get here also. And we have to understand that this shear wall is also going to yield at the base. So whatever forces we are getting in this slab are not final. Those will also depend how this shear wall is behaving. So again, we have to perform a sensitivity analysis at this level also. Uh, in first case, we are assuming because we are performing a linear analysis. So in first case, we are assuming that the shear wall is also intact. The slab is also intact. And in the second case, we are assuming that this shear wall has yielded at the base the slab might have also got damaged. And due to that, the shape of the bending moment diagram in our shear wall is going to change. And uh, accordingly, we should consider both the extremes for design. And that's what is the sensitivity analysis, which code is asking us to do. Now coming to computer modeling, this was about the behavior. Now let us see how we can use this behavior in our uh, analysis or how do we use it uh, in our computer model. So I talked about modeling and I explained that modeling is nothing but uh, simulation of a particular aspect of behavior of the structure. How the computer helps us? The computer, each computer program has a library and that library is representing some components of known behavior. For example, it has a beam element or a frame element. That frame element has a known behavior. We know that how this that frame is going to behave. Actual beam in our structure may not behave in the same manner exactly. But this uh, element which is given in the library of our computer software will behave in a particular fashion. This is well known to us. And here is the difference where there is uncertainty, which we have to uh, consider while interpreting our results. So every structure is considered as an assemblage of members and elements. And these members and elements are having known behavior. And uh, this behavior is represented in the library of that software, which we are having. So we can choose the appropriate element from there. 
So we may not be required to write the computer program. We may not be required to write the stiffness matrix, but we have to uh, know what is the behavior of that element. So generally two types of uh, elements are available in the library. One is what we call a skeletal components or skeletal uh, structural elements. And another one is the continuum. So skeletal are like beams, columns, braces, trusses, and sometimes shear wall also we can represent as a column. And uh, these structures are modeled like frames or trusses. And uh, the characteristic of these elements is that one dimension is much larger as compared to the other, as we see in case of a frame. On the other hand, in case of continuum element, we have either 2D or 3D continuum. Examples are, uh, we just saw uh, the slab, shear wall is another example. These are 2D elements. And then we have, in some cases, we require 3D elements also. For example, I want to model soil as continuum. Then in that case, I have to model the solid um, soil as solid element. Or if I want to model a dam, so there these elements will be required. Uh, mostly when we are dealing with buildings, we do not model soil explicitly using solid elements. So this is not that much required, but the frame elements, plane stress element, plate element and shell element, we have been using very frequently. And uh, please be clear about the degrees of freedom. You need not to understand, you need not to go into the details, how the stiffness matrices of these elements are developed. but please be clear what are the degrees of freedom whenever you are using any software, just look into the manual that what are the degrees of freedom? Because that will give you an idea whether you are connecting your frame, your elements properly or not. Then the output, the stress resultants, which you are getting in output, for example, bending moment and shear force you are getting, those have a sign convention. And if you do not use that sign convention properly, it is quite possible that you uh, put the reinforcement on the wrong side, so on the wrong face. So this becomes very important that the manual of that uh, software which you are using, you should go through carefully. This is a typical frame element. Its stiffness matrix looks like this. I will not go into detail. At least some of you might have uh, studied this in graduation or post-graduation. So this is a typical stiffness matrix. We need not to go into these details, but what we need to understand is this, that what are the degrees of freedom in my element? And secondly, whether <clears throat> my frame element is based on Euler beam. So Euler beam stiffness matrix will be something like this, where we are ignoring shear deformations. And in case of slender frame elements, slender columns and slender, <clears throat> sorry, beams, we can ignore the shear deformations. There we will get a, a stiffness matrix like this. But on the other hand, if I want to uh, model a shear wall, I will come to that later. Then in case of modeling of our frame elements, we are representing the elements by a line. And that line is along the centroid, the geometric centroid of the element. So this line which we are using is always along the centroid of the cross section. People have difficulty sometimes in understanding this, that how they should place their element. So if the centroid of two connecting elements are not matching, for example, when the beam is at an offset to the column, the size of the beams and columns are different and column uh, beams are uh, flushed with one face of the columns, then there will be an eccentricity between the two centroids. So the column centroid is somewhere here, the beam centroid is somewhere here, and this is an eccentricity. And this eccentricity will give rise to additional bending moment in the columns. And if we are ignoring it, our columns will be highly under design. Sometimes this offset can cause large uh, bending moment changes. So it is very important that this offset, which is shown here, this offset needs to be considered. There are several methods available in the software. If we, are, if we understand this, uh, options are available. We can take care of this just using offset command. Or if nothing else, we can just connect a rigid element between the two. So we can take a rigid beam. Although I will not recommend that to be used because that gives rise to some numerical errors. 
So preferable is that we use the offset command because in offset command, it is using the geometric relationship uh, between the degrees of freedom. And that is more stable than uh, that. If the size of the column is changing, then also this issue will be there or the shape of the column is changing. Then also there is a possibility that there will be an uh, offset. So I have highlighted this because this is one of the common omission which we do as a designer. We tend to skip this. So please do not skip this. This eccentricity will cause moment in the bottom column that is equal to the axial force into this eccentricity. In case of a low rise building, perhaps the axial force was small, but in case of a high rise building, this axial force is going to be very large. And in that case, even a little eccentricity here can cause a lot of moment in my column below. So this I cannot afford to skip. This offset has to be modeled. Then coming to the beam column joint. So I am representing here the beams and columns. For example, here, both beams and columns by lines. So column is represented by a vertical line, beam is represented by a horizontal line, and the intersection is a point. Intersection of two lines is a point. So our joint is a point. So if I'm modeling it uh, in um, uh, usual way, then my joint will be represented by a point. But in reality, joint is a finite uh, area. It has some dimensions. So that dimension needs to be modeled for its rigidity. So earlier we were recommending that the joint should be modeled as rigid. Whatever is the portion common in beam and column, that portion should be either replaced by offsets or it should be replaced by rigid arms. But it has been seen recently, not that recently, but it has been observed that this portion of the beam and column, it is subjected to uh, shear deformations. And due to shear deformations, the effective stiffness reduces. It is not perfectly rigid. There are certain uh, deformations occurring in this zone also, the so-called panel zone, where we are having uh, the overlapping portions of beams and columns. There are deformations here. So how we can take those deformations into account? One way is that I am modeling this explicitly. I should take into account the stiffness of the joint also, but that becomes very cumbersome. But in ASC 41, they have given a simple way of doing that. They are saying that if my beam and column are of uh, similar strength, then what I can do is I can consider this offset as half, not the full offset. I do not consider the full width of the column as rigid in the beam. And similarly, full depth of the beam rigid in the column I consider the half width of the column and the half depth of the beam as rigid. So this will take care of the flexibility. On the other hand, if my column is uh, stronger than the beams, in that case, I can take the column portion as rigid and the beam portion I will take as flexible and it will take care of the flexibility of the joint. Similarly, if my beam is rigid as compared to column, then I can take the portion of the column or the portion of the beam, which is overlapping with the column that has rigid. So with this modification, I can compensate for the flexibility of the joint. Then another important issue, which is um, giving rise to a lot of discussion and uh, difficulty is the stiffness of RCC section. In case of steel, that issue is not there. In case of steel, we know the stiffness is very easy. It is uh, E into I, where I, if it is rectangular section, it will be BD cubed by 12. If it is a flame section, we can obtain like that. But there is a problem in case of RCC. Why that problem? The problem is because the concrete cracks, especially during earthquake. So we allow the concrete to crack during earthquake. And when it is cracking, its whole section is not effective its effective moment of inertia reduces. And how much reduction will take place? Of course, it will depend upon the amount of cracking. If more cracking is there, there will be um, lesser effective stiffness. So we need to estimate the amount of cracking. And then also it depends upon the stiffness, sorry, on the axial force. So this effective moment of inertia 
which depends upon the cracking and the cracking depends on the axial force. So if my uh, member is having large compressive force, then naturally the cracking will be limited. And in that case, the effective moment of inertia will be larger. So effective moment of inertia in case of columns subjected to larger forces is going to be more. Then it will also depend upon the reinforcement. If my member is having higher percentage of reinforcement, then again, the cracking will be less. And in that case, uh, the effective moment of inertia will be uh, more. And I can obtain this by plotting the so-called moment curvature diagram. So you may be familiar in both ETFs and SAP and even in STAT, there are uh, um, software available, uh, options available for section analysis. And using that section analysis, you can uh, plot the moment curvature curve. And the slope of the moment curvature curve that is representing the effective stiffness. If it was a steel member, then this initial curve would have been a straight line because there the stiffness is not changing. But in case of RCC section, it will not be straight line. Initially, the slope will be very large. You can see that the slope is very large, the stiffness is very large. Why? Because initially the section is uncracked. And in that case, the stiffness will be even larger than that of the gross section. Why it will be larger than that? because steel is having a modular ratio greater than one. So if you convert the steel into equivalent uh, concrete, the size will be more than B into D. And in that case, the effective moment of inertia will be more than BD cubed by 12. So initially it will be very rigid, but then concrete cracks here, then the slope reduces and here our steel yields. So when the steel yields, the slope reduces further. And when the, all the bars yield, then it becomes more or less flat. So the slope of this diagram is giving me the effective stiffness. So you can obtain the effective stiffness for your member yourself by plotting the moment curvature diagram, by uh, putting uh, the proper reinforcement, which is actually there, the stress strain curve of the concrete and steel, and also the axial force. So the shape of the moment uh, curvature diagram depends on the axial force. You can do this experimentation for yourself. But the problem is which slope I should take here because the slope itself is changing. The slope is also not constant. If I take initially, the stiffness is much larger. If I take it somewhere here, then the stiffness reduces. Okay. And uh, because this displacement is less, actually this slight change which you are seeing here makes a lot of change in the stiffness effective stiffness. So in case of earthquake, we are, this is the protocol that invariably we are taking the stiffness corresponding to the slope of the secant line at first yield. So here my first rod yielded. So at this point, I will draw a straight line from origin passing through this point and slope of this line we consider as the effective stiffness during earthquake. Because in case of earthquake, invariably our members will yield. So our members are expected to yield. And because those are yielding, I'm getting the secant stiffness corresponding to this. But in case of service load or wind load, where the cracking is not that much, there the stiffness is going to be higher. That's why you see in our code, the stiffness modifiers are given for two conditions. One is the so-called factored load and another is so-called unfactored. We will see later in the afternoon today that unfactored means serviceability level forces and factored means the design basis uh, level uh, earthquake forces. So when we are calculating for earthquake, we have to consider the stiffness modifiers corresponding to the factored load condition. If we are doing it for serviceability level earthquake, or we want to do it for wind, then we can take unfactored. But we are checking the drift limit, which is given in our code as 0.004, Please note that it is corresponding to design basis earthquake. And when we are doing it for design basis earthquake, then we have to consider the factored load or the stiffness modifier corresponding to the factored load. There is some confusion in the code IS16700. Originally, it was written correctly, but later on in amendment, they have uh, issued some clarification 
and in clarification they have made some changes that has caused confusion but please take the original code that is correct and it means that you have to calculate the displacement for factored load corresponding to the modifiers at the factored load okay so different codes in fact differ because as i said this will depend upon many things so asc41 which has been developed for performance based design that is a displacement design so the values there are the most reliable and you can see here in case of beams it is the stiffness is only 30% of the gross stiffness and <clears throat> it is having the shear deformations also but here you can see that actually there is no reduction this 0.4 ec because the shear rigidity is, is actually g into a and g is if you take uh, the value of mu as 0.25 it will come out to be uh, 0.4 so actually here is no reduction this 0.4 do not think that it is a reduction it is actually not a reduction it is the actual value so shear rigidity is taken full and uh, flexural rigidity is taken 0.3 times the gross rigidity in case of columns actually it varies depending on the axial force so level of axial force is 0.1 into ag fc dash so ag is the gross area and fc dash is the cylinder strength of the concrete and if the axial force is small that is less than 0.1 ag fc dash then this is 30% if axial force is large greater than 50% of ag fc dash it is 0.7 and in between it is to be interpolated Uh, today morning i got a question where it has been said it has been asked that uh, should we use the gross area or should we use the equivalent area can we consider the steel area also no these values has been calibrated in such a way that it is representing the stress on the gross area so gross area means b into d it is not multiplied by modular ratio so you need not you should not take into account the Uh, steel equivalent area of the steel so this stress is to be calculated on the gross area and if it is small less than 0.1 ag fc dash then it is 0.3 and if it is more then it is to be considered 0.7 and one more thing as the axial force will increase from 0.1 g to 0.5 uh, ag fc dash then the ductility of the section is going to reduce so we prefer the axial force to be low not more than 0.4 ag fc dash so our stiffness should be less than much less than 0.7 ec into i gross so this is what is given in our code in our code uh, for unfactored load and factored load so we should understand here for the factored load because this is equivalent to this and we can see here in case of slabs it is 0.25 in case of beams it is 0.35 which is same which we have seen in case of asc 41 it is 0.3 here we have 0.35 so it is close to it in case of columns it is given 0.7 but as i told 0.7 is the maximum which is a very high axial force which we usually do not permit so this stiffness is actually on higher side the column stiffness should be lower it should be between 0.35 and 0.7 so 0.5 will be a better estimate and similarly in case of shear walls in in plane action also cracking will occur but here the stiffness is larger and if we see this uh, in uh, this tbi tall building initiative uh, code they have also talked similar service level linear models and mcr level so what our code is talking about unfactored and factored and as i explained unfactored actually means service level and factored means mcr or db uh, level where the yielding is occurring so when we are calculating the strength then we have to use these values and when we are using it for vane or for serviceability level earthquake for any purpose then we have to use this so for us this is what is important and you can see here it is uh, 0.35 for shear wall it is 0.35 and uh, out of plane it is 0.25 basement walls the cracking will be less because these are quite long so there uh, this is 0.8 times and so, so on so for different elements 
this effective flexural stiffness is to be taken. Then in case of modeling of walls, um, shear walls, two things are important. One thing is they're in plane action and another is out of plane action. So if we have a regular building where we have shear walls oriented in both the direction and sufficient amount of shear walls are there, then the out of plane forces in the shear walls are not significant. You can ignore them. In that case, you can model shear walls for their in-plane actions alone. But if it is a uh, it is having shear wall or it is it is a my one type of system where the shear walls are primarily oriented in uh, uh, one direction, in that case, the shear walls will be subjected to significant out-of-plane forces also, and it is then preferable to model or it is required to model the shear walls in uh, bi-directional mode. That means we have to model the in-plane stiffness as well as out-of-plane stiffness. And as you see here, the stiffness modifiers in in-plane and out-of-plane are different. In in-plane, it is 0.35, in out-of-plane, 0.25, because the cracking in out-of-plane will be more. So two models are possible. One is we can model uh, the shear wall using white column. And uh, um, hopefully in the evening, we will show you the both the, we will show a comparison of these uh, two types of models using white column and using uh, continuum. And in continuum, if you are using plane stress elements, then you are considering only in plane effect, out of plane stiffness you are ignoring. Preferably it should be done using shallow element where in plane and out of plane, both moments are obtained if the uh, out-of-plane moment is insignificant, that will automatically be reflected in your results. And it should also be designed for PM1, M2 interaction. By axial moment interaction, we should design our shear wall also. Uh, at the moment, our code uh, 13920, that talks about design of shear wall. And there it is talking about in-plane uh, moment capacity only. But actually there will be an interaction. That interaction can be ignored only if the outer plane moment is really small. But in many cases you will find in our buildings that outer plane moment may not be small. And in that case, we, if we are modeling it using wide column analogy or shell element, we will get both in plane and outer plane moments. And uh, uh, same type of PM interaction as we are using in case of columns, we, we can use in case of shear walls also. Another issue in case of shear walls is uh, that we have to consider the shear deformation and shear deformation depends upon the relative shear rigidity and the flexural rigidity. So it depends upon this factor alpha, which is the ratio of 12 EI by LQ and GAR by L. So one L will cancel out. So it becomes 12 EI by L square GAR. This factor decides and the change in the stiffness matrix as compared to frame is that here this alpha element is uh, appearing. This is based upon the Timoshenko beam theory. So when you are using a wide column model to model your shear wall, you should be clear that whether that software is offering you the Euler beam model or it is offering you the Timoshenko beam model. So in case of shear wall, it is important, it is necessary that we should use the frame element based on Timoshenko beam theory. Then this rigid arm I have uh, discussed, this offset. Uh, in case of shear wall, it becomes even more important because in case of shear wall, the length of this uh, overlapping portion is very large. And if we are ignoring it, if we are uh, taking the connection, the joint at the center line of the shear wall and the beam, then we are making large error. So that needs to be taken into account. A typical wide column model for a coupled shear wall will look like this where shear wall is also represented by a linear element, a column. The beams are also represented by linear elements, but this overlapping portion, this is represented by rigid links or through offset command or through the body constraints. So you can define a node here, another node here, and those two nodes you can connect through body constraints. All the three will take care of this rigid portion. Then I was talking about the degrees of freedom. So sometimes we, as I said, that we can model the shear walls by plane stress elements also. 
these plane stress elements have two degrees of freedom per node and it does not have any rotational degree of freedom but if i am connecting a beam to my shear wall then there is an issue the beam has a rotational degree of freedom but this uh, plane stress element does not have any rotational degree of freedom here so what will happen effectively the beam will be re released so it will act like the beam has been released here and you will not get any moment in your beam here so if you want to model your shear wall using plane stress element you should be careful you have to do a trick in which you have to connect a fictitious beam between these two nodes i have shown here only single element single plane stress element for the shear wall but actually it will not be like this there will be multiple elements but i am not connecting this beam with intermediate elements because if i connect this rigid a beam sorry by intermediate nodes then it will affect the stiffness of the shear wall also so i am not doing that i am connecting this only at the end nodes and this beam is rigid this is a fictitious beam in real problem uh, real structure there is no beam here so this is a fictitious beam which i am doing i am uh, embedding only for this purpose so that my real beam can be connected with this fictitious beam and it will take care of this lack of rotational degree of freedom which we are getting here so that's why whatever software you are using what element you are using you should look at the degrees of freedom and see whether the degrees of freedom are compatible or not then uh, we can use this uh, uh, same methodology for non planar shear wall as well so i can represent the shear walls by vertical column elements and uh, uh, i have to use, provide these elements at the center line at the centroid of the wave and the flange and the width of the shear walls i can consider by these rigid elements so if i provide rigid elements like this so this model can very well take care of an out of plane uh, or sorry uh, non planar shear wall also in finite element it is easier we have to just mesh all the shear walls uh, or the bab and the flange of the shear wall uh, we can use again plane stress or shell element if we are using uh, shell element it will take care of the out of plane bending moment also then uh, um, same method we can extend to the modeling of uh, diaphragms as i said that the diaphragms are having a very important role in uh, analysis and we can model these diaphragms explicitly using shell element so the problem which we are going to demonstrate you in the evening there these uh, diaphragms has been modeled as uh, shell elements so if you model these diaphragms as shell elements then the rigidity will be automatically taken care of but that will make your model very heavy it is taking a lot of time in running even uh, your model analysis will become very difficult Uh, doing with that type of model because the number of nodes or number of degrees of freedom will be very very large you can reduce it if your diaphragm is simple and it does not have large openings in that case you can treat the whole diaphragm as rigid and uh, that is rigid diaphragm action is available but please be clear this modeling you can use only if you are sure that your diagram is not flexible so that you can do by modeling one diaphragm separately so take out one story along with its uh, columns at top and bottom and apply an inertia force on this diaphragm and see the deformation of this diaphragm with respect to the deformations of the column above and below so if the diaphragm the, the deformation of diaphragm is much small as compared to the deformation of the columns as given in is 1893 then you can treat it as rigid diaphragm otherwise you cannot treat it as rigid diaphragm so if you want to reduce the size of your computer model you can use this rigid diaphragm uh, action but you have to demonstrate that your diaphragm is really rigid um, it can be done either through the uh, commands which are available in the software for example master slave command is available in stad and uh, uh, rigid diaphragm command is available in etabs so you can use alternatively you can th there are different types of tricks people do one trick is that we again introduce this fictitious element so fictitious diagonal elements which are released at the end so that these do not affect 
the bending capacity of our beams and columns but at the same time it makes like a horizontal truss arrangement and uh, that will ensure that our uh, diaphragm is moving as a single component so it takes into account the rigid diaphragm action of our slabs the last thing which i uh, actually there are more things uh, in the uh, presentation which i will share with you you can go through that but here because we are going towards the time and so one thing i want to discuss is this uh, uh, infill so it is important uh, that these infills are also modeled uh, we will show you what effect these infills have on stiffness and strength of a structure and uh, these infills increase the stiffness anywhere 20 to 60 times and uh, strength also can be increased two to three times and now is 1893 has included a provision by which we can consider the stiffness of these still there is no provision available in our code through which we can consider the strength of it but we can consider stiffness of these and these infills are source of lot of problems during earthquake the first problem itself is that these are providing stiffness and uh, as a result the period is reducing and when the period is reducing the base shear is going to increase because of the shape of the response spectrum which we have sayg is going to increase so that is the first problem second problem is that during earthquake or during any later load when uh, the frame is deforming we get separation at these opposite corners so here we are getting separation whereas we get compression along this diagonal and a component of this compression will act horizontally because it is in touch with the the column here and the beam here and this force is applied diagonally so it will have a vertical component and it will have a horizontal component and as a result it pushes the column here and it causes the failure of the column if it, this column is not provided with adequate shear strength so we have to ensure that this column here and similarly when the earthquake direction will reverse uh, it will happen with the lower um, end of the column like we have here so this lower and upper ends of the column are to be provided with adequate shear capacity so that their shear capacity is more than the horizontal component of these struts due to the infills so these infills act like shear struts modeling is relatively easy if we want to model the stiffness that is relatively easy we have to just provide these diagonal elements and these diagonal elements have to be uh, released at the ends these are not uh, frame elements these are truss elements so because these can provide only the compressive force these cannot resist any bending moment and uh, the stiffness of these diagonal elements we can obtain using these formula which i have taken from uh, our code and here we calculate the effective width a so this a is giving us the effective width of this strut thickness is same as that of the infill if it is uh, 230 thick infill then thickness will be 230 and then we need modulus of elasticity because the stiffness will depend upon ea and l so all uh, l will come from the geometry e and a we have to provide a will be the area will be the width that is small a into thickness so if we assign those properties the stiffness will be taken care of the period change will be taken care of but the strength is not modeled because we are doing only linear analysis so effect of strength is not there so for that what we have to do we have to calculate the strength of this infill then we have to calculate its horizontal component and we have to check our column for that horizontal component that uh, the column should be strong enough in shear so that it does not fail due to this effect okay yeah i promised i will cover period also uh, kulkarni sir uh, how much time i can take should i stop here or i can still take 5 minutes no you can you can take around 5 to 10 minutes Uh, but then then we have got another 20 minutes of uh, parametric study and okay. when the 130 we should have lunch maybe 5 minutes here and there okay okay no problem yeah so uh, p delta analysis also this is important 
uh, you understand what p delta is actually what is happening uh, when we are having combination of vertical load and horizontal force that will always happen because our uh, building will be always subjected to vertical load as well as lateral load lateral load due to wind or earthquake and vertical load due to gravity dead load and live load so when our building is deforming this vertical load is also moving along with the building and as a result there is an eccentricity created in each column there is an eccentricity created and that eccentricity will give rise to additional deforms it may be also considered as additional lateral force which is giving rise to this additional displacement so suppose uh, due to uh, earthquake alone the displacement is delta 1 delta 2 delta 3 delta 5 etc and then there is vertical force acting on each in each column due to this gravity load dead load and live load and that vertical load also shifts by this amount delta so there is an additional moment which is equal to p into the interstory drift the difference of this delta from the lower story so that's why we call it p delta effect and there are two types of p delta effect one type of p delta effect is what we call p capital delta so this p capital delta is because our story is shifting by delta so that is our p capital delta then if you see a column here this column is subjected to this delta but at the same time it is also deforming if it was not having any capital delta even then it will bend and due to that bending there will be additional moment occurring and that displacement we are calling small delta so any member will be subjected to p capital delta and p small delta effects p small delta is representing local bending bending between the two ends of the column and p capital delta is representing the displacement of one end with respect to the other so how much one end is moving or the upper end is moving with respect to the lower end that is p capital delta and p small delta is the uh, displacement of the column due to its own bending even if the top and bottom ends are at the same uh, in the same line even then because of its deformation even if it is not buckling buckling will add to it but even if it is not uh, buckling there will be some bending and due to that bending we will have p small delta effect now p capital delta you can analyze easily in all the software two methods are available one method is what we call non iterative solution based on axial forces and here the stiffness matrix itself is modified so when this stiffness matrix we obtain when uh, there was no axial force acting on our member but if it is subjected to an axial force also in addition then this stiffness matrix gets modified it has these terms pyx so here we get these four terms get added or we can say that the stiffness matrix becomes some of these two matrices in fact the second matrix with a negative sign so we get this type of uh, effect because of the period type effect we can consider it like this also but for this we need the axial force in the column in advance so axial force should be known then only i can develop this stiffness matrix so here we don't require any iteration but we require axial force now you will uh, ask that axial force will be known only after i perform the analysis uh, before performing the analysis how will i know the axial force so what we do is first we perform an analysis for gravity load only without p delta because in gravity load we assume that capital delta will not be large there will not be any significant capital delta under gravity load so we perform an analysis without p delta and from that load we get p and using that load p i can develop this stiffness matrix that is the so called non iterative procedure based on axial forces so axial force should be known and how we obtain this axial force axial force we known from the gravity load and from where the gravity load is coming the gravity load is coming because of the mass m into g so in some software you will also find the non iterative procedure based on mass so based on mass means that whatever mass sources you are doing it will perform an analysis for those mass sources without p delta 
and from there it will get the axial force and that axial force it will use for analysis or for development of the systemus matrix and analysis will be done based on this stiffness matrix which is reduced because this minus sign is coming here so actually the stiffness is going to reduce due to this pdl type so that reduction it takes into account alternatively in the second procedure which is an iterative procedure that procedure is more accurate more accurate in the sense that when this building is subjected to lateral force then also the axial forces develop axial forces in my members change axial force do not remain same so what is happening when i am applying this lateral force earthquake force then they, these columns will be subjected to compression these columns will be subjected to tension and due to that the p delta effect is going to change so this procedure does an iterative solution it will first perform an analysis without p delta effects so we will get delta 1 delta 2 delta 3 delta 5 etc then it will calculate the additional effect of this p delta how much additional displacement will be calculated and that additional displacement will be added to this in each iteration and successively these values of this delta 1 delta 2 etc will be obtained and if the difference between the next value value in the next citation to the previous citation is reducing that means my structure is stable if this difference is increasing if it is not reducing that means my structure has become unstable and it is failing due to earthquake or due to uh, the combination of uh, gravity and earthquake so due to the speed and time so uh, this method takes into account the variation in the axial forces due to earthquake also okay but you can see that due to earthquake actually there is no net vertical force whatever vertical force is increasing in one column the same vertical force is reducing in the other column because it has to be balanced so whatever p delta additional p delta effect i am getting here that much will be reduced from here so more or less both the methods will give us the same answer it is a matter of choice you can use any one and just to give you an idea in eters we have this option one is the non iterative based on mass and another one is this iterative based on load so as i said this non iterative based on mass this calculates the axial force in advance by some method and then based on mass and then that axial force it considers while deriving the stiffness matrix and uh, in case of iterative it does not consider the effect on stiffness matrix it rather applies the p delta effects on the structure as a whole using p delta now this is important that we should consider this properly in our design so if you remember in is 456 two such charts are available okay so what are these two charts the first chart it is saying that it is for no sway condition and the second chart is for sway condition now this is always confusing to the designer what is this no sway and sway can we have a tall building or uh, even a multi story building where no sway where there is no sway sway will always be there so um, whether we are using shear walls or we are not using shear walls sway will be always there what the code has specified that there is a limit of uh, the so called stability coefficient so let me say let me tell you first what these are representing these charts are representing the combined effect of p capital delta and p small delta what is this p capital delta p capital delta is the one which we discussed just now it can be considered in the structural analysis but there is p small delta also what you see here this is p capital delta and this is p small delta whatever deformation is occurring here that is p small delta and additional moments due to the vertical load will be caused due to p capital delta as well as due to p small delta p small delta cannot be considered in your analysis by usual methods the method which i discussed just now that can take care of only p capital delta so p small delta has to be taken care of at the element level when we are designing so for p capital delta we have two options either we can perform a p delta analysis or we do not perform p delta analysis and consider this p capital delta delta also at the member level so if i am considering both 
P capital delta and P small delta, then I have to use the second chart, which is for sway condition. Sway condition means that it accounts for P capital delta as well as P small delta. And as a result, you see here, the effective, effective length here is going right up to infinity. So when it is not having any restraint, when beta two and beta one both are zero, what does that mean? That it is not having any uh, restraint. And when it is not having any restraint against rotation, its effective length will become infinite. So it will vary from one to infinite because it includes the effect of P capital delta as well as P small delta. Now, the other chart, it includes the effect of P small delta alone. It does not include P capital delta. So in which condition you can use this? If you have performed P delta analysis. So if you perform P delta analysis in your model, then you need not to consider P capital delta effects. You have to consider only P small delta effects. Okay. So in that case, you consider these charts. If you are not performing P delta analysis, then you should consider these charts. And it has been seen that this second charts are very, very conservative. These will give you very large moments in comparison with what you will obtain from P capital delta analysis. So it is always advisable that you perform P delta analysis in your software and then use the effective length factor using these charts. And uh, here you can see that the effective length is varying from 0.5 to 1. So the minimum is 0.5. When we have fixed fixed condition, then it is 0.5. And uh, maximum when it is pinned pinned condition, it will be equal to uh, 1 times L. The common error our designers do is that they do not perform P delta analysis. And then they give this effective length factor as 1. And they say that they have taken maximum. That is not acceptable. This is acceptable only if you have performed P capital delta analysis, P delta analysis in your software. And P small delta then you can take from this chart. I think I will stop here. And now we can uh, take up uh, the parametric study. And in the meantime, I will just have a look at your questions and uh, we will see what, what we can discuss. Thank you. So I'm unsharing my screen so that Others can. Yeah. And then you are sharing the screen. We'll be having now parametric studies uh, presented by uh, us. That one, our Mr. Anand Kulkarni sir will present the first parametric study. Anand. Uh, one second, I'm just yeah. trying to share one second. Just to give you the background, the example what will be studying in the afternoon session, Anand, our director who had designed this building, he has done various studies with the same building, having different parameters and trying to see the effect of changing of the parameters. Arvind, I think uh, there's I'll some issue with the screen sharing. Yeah, yeah. I'll check. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Can start. OK. Uh, so good afternoon to all of you. and. Uh, we have a couple of interesting parametric studies ahead. One of them I'll be presenting. This is for one building uh, which is uh, under construction. Name is Autograph. The location is in Mumbai. It's about 55 story building and it has a height of about 170 meters. And the aspect ratio is about 5.5. So it's a good uh, aspect ratio for any tall building. Uh, so what we are going to study in this case that we are going to have uh, different parameters we are going to study 
uh, by making certain changes in the original model. So these parameters are time period, model mass participation ratios. Mainly we are concerned about the torsional behavior of the building, the displacements for the earthquake and wind, and the distribution of uh, shear force and moments in the shear walls and columns. So the modifications that we are looking at uh, in this case, they are decoupling of shear walls. So we will have, uh, there are some coupled shear walls and we will uh, try to remove those uh, coupling elements or, or release those coupling elements, see what happens. Sometimes we have to do this uh, because uh, the shear stress exceeds and uh, sometimes we are unable to design with a given cross section. The developers, they do not allow for a composite section. So sometimes we have to release this shear coupling beams and uh, then we have to see what happens to the structure. Uh, the another aspect is that uh, modeling of uh, infill panels. So in this particular building, we have uh, internal walls as 100 mm thick C4X, I would, I would say AAC blocks and lightweight partition block walls and the external walls are RCC walls and uh, those are non-structural RCC walls we have tried to model and see what advantage it gives to the structure. The third one is uh, we have eliminated uh, certain internal beams, rather almost all the internal beams and we have studied how the building behaves uh, if it is converted into a sort of a flat slab system, but uh, there'll be, of course, uh, the peripheral beams uh, maintained as it is. And the last thing is that we have added certain shear walls, uh, uh, rather L shape to the shear walls, L component to the shear walls. And we have seen, studied what happens to all these four parameters. Yeah, so this is a, this building, if you see, it has a very strong core and uh, uh, it has a well distributed uh, shear walls uh, in both the directions. Next. This is the uh, elevation of the building. So it shows the uh, various flows. Yes. So the modification, uh, we'll first see uh, all the layouts uh, with the modification marks on it so that it'll, it will be easy for you to understand. So these are the, this is the core and uh, the yellow marked elements, those are the coupling beams. And we have uh, studied one option to release these beams, decouple and see what is the effect on the structure. Next. This is the modeling of infill walls. Uh, here, if you see on the periphery, uh, we have uh, certain small red elements shown uh, along with the structural walls uh, or the shear walls. Those are the non-structural uh, walls and uh, RCC walls. Those we have tried to, they are uh, just adjoining to the opening, window openings. So those we have tried to model and see uh, what is the advantage of that. Next. So here you see all the all the internal beams have been removed and large uh, flat slabs have been uh, provided. It's not really a flat slab. It is a beamless uh, slab in certain areas. And uh, we are going to study what happens uh, and what is the contribution of these beams. Next. And this is the uh, last option that we are, modification that we have done that is adding some uh, L shape to the uh, walls, shear walls, existing shear walls. So we see the time period, uh, the time period uh, in this case, if you see uh, uh, the, by decoupling the shear walls, uh, what we see there is a increase in the time period. Uh, Whereas by modeling of the wall infill panels, we see uh, there is a significant reduction in the time period. So there is an increase in the stiffness. Uh, by doing the, uh, removing the internal uh, uh, beams, there is no significant uh, uh, 
it doesn't affect significantly the behavior of uh, the uh, building rather the time period or the stiffness and uh, by adding the l shape on it improves the behavior of the building in terms of uh, the uh, uh, stiffness to a certain extent next Model mass participation, uh, just we see that, you know, the coupling uh, is very important here, plays very important role. It completely disturbs the, uh, the behavior of the building. Uh, if you see, if you decouple the walls, then the first mode uh, will be the torsion. If you see the originally, the first mode is translational in X direction. The second mode is translation in Y direction and third is the torsion mode. But if you see the first mode goes into the torsion, the second mode is almost a torsion, but a mixed mode. And uh, the third mode, you see uh, there is some change. Uh, so the third, uh, the second parameter, if you see uh, in case of, if you remove, uh, if you add the more infill walls, uh, there is no significant change in the uh, modal mass participation in the X direction, or even if it is just a 5% increase in the uh, uh, change in the uh, Y direction, and little bit uh, change in the, uh, torsional behavior, the RZ factor of the building. But overall, we say in this case, uh, it has not really helped us uh, much uh, as far as the, uh, you know, the display, uh, the uh, modal mass participations are concerned. Uh, by replacing the uh, beams uh, and removing the internal beams and converting into large span uh, slabs, I would not say flat slab, uh, it has not changed the behavior of the building. Uh, there is no significant change observed uh, in this case, if you see uh, in the modal mass participation. And also while adding uh, the L-shaped wall, it also doesn't help us much in improving the, uh, you know, the behavior of the building. So what I'm talking, it is irrespective to the particularly this particular building. And uh, it, this results may vary for uh, any other building because uh, the stiffness distribution, the symmetry, the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the overall stiffness, all these things uh, matter in this case. But this is uh, something which will give some guideline, and we are going to discuss this uh, during the uh, concluding part of this parametric study. So the this is again uh, the modal mass uh, participant ratios that we have studied. Next. So displacements that we see here uh, with the decoupling, yes, definitely there will be increase. With the modeling of infill panels, there is a sub substantial reduction in the displacements that we see here. Uh, by replacing the uh, beams with the slab, we don't get any major difference in the uh, displacement part of the building. And by adding L-shaped shear walls, yes, there is a reduction in the displacements. Similarly, you can see the results for uh, the Y direction where modeling of infill panels has helped us to reduce the displacement in that particular direction. It means the building has a particular weakness in the stiffness in a particular direction. So these have helped uh, to a great extent uh, in reducing the uh, displacement in Y direction. Now we just see what happens to the shear force and bending moment or turning moments. So very surprisingly, uh, what the results, what we get is almost uh, by modifying all this uh, four parameters, we have not uh, seen any major change in the original uh, distribution of the shear and uh, the overturning moments. Mainly, if you see this building is a very, having a very strong core and uh, the design is predominantly, the lateral load is predominantly resisted by the shear walls. So, uh, you know, these parameters which uh, we have, uh, the modifications we have carried out have not significantly affected the, the distribution of the bending moment and shear forces. So it means that, you know, you can carry out certain uh, uh, param uh, the changes in this type of building without altering your design forces. So next. Yeah. So conclusions, uh, 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 I mean, just hold on here because there are four or five slides uh, which are due to the uh, constraint of time. I'm not going to 
go through each and every side, slide, but I would just would like to discuss uh, the conclusions. Uh, see, uh, so if we see uh, the changes and uh, the modifications, how they affect the various uh, design parameters. So modeling of infill panels, uh, if you see, uh, or rather first we start with the decoupling. So it doesn't affect the time period to a great extent because this building is already stiff. So uh, the uh, these elements are not really contributing in uh, reducing the time period or adding to the stiffness. But yes, uh, they are also responsible for uh, controlling the torsional behavior of the building. And because of that, you, uh, we saw that, you know, the, uh, there is a significant change in the distribution of the model mass uh, ratios. And also it is, it helps you to improve the displacements. So there was a significant reduction in the displacements. So what I would say that, uh, you know, the coupled shear walls in this case, will help you in case you are stuck up with the problem of torsion or uh, controlling the deflection, the coupling of shear walls will help you. Uh, modeling of infill panels helps you to improve the stiffness of the building. So if you have a problem with the stiffness of the building uh, or the displacements of the building, those can be very well controlled by modeling the infill panels. Uh, However, we couldn't get major uh, change in the uh, design forces, but at times you may get some relief in the uh, forces in the columns and uh, rather in the shear walls. So uh, that advantage also you can get if you model the infill panels. Uh, surprisingly, in this case, if, uh, we removing the uh, uh, certain internal beams has not really affected the structure anyway because uh, if you see the structure is mainly uh, having a major, uh, a very strong core and uh, well-distributed shear walls. So, uh, and a continuity of diaphragm was very important here. Uh, this diaphragm is absolutely very uh, well knit to the core. And that is how we uh, say that, you know, in this case, so this certain decisions, you know, su suppose sometimes we are uh, forced to remove such type of internal beams for various, uh, reasons, the developers or the architect, they want some flexibility. So this, if you have such kind of a good core and well-distributed shear walls, you can easily take a decision of removing this kind of beams and go for a large fan slabs and satisfy the requirement of the developer. But provided you have a strong core and very well connectivity with the core, you have a continuous diaphragm action. Now, uh, the last topic is the L-shaped uh, corner shear wall. We just wanted to see what, what is the effect of this uh, shear wall. So yes, uh, they definitely help you to uh, uh, reduce the torsion and improve the behavior of the building. And also it adds to the stiffness uh, and uh, reduces the displacement. So if you have to control the displacement, you can uh, have uh, this, uh, all the four options are available to you. All the three options are available to you. You can uh, couple the shear walls. You can use coupled shear walls. You can model the infill panels and you can also have this L-shaped uh, corner shear walls. And if you have to deal with the torsion, then yes, you have again, uh, coupled shear walls will help you. The L-shaped corner walls will help you. And if you want to add the stiffness to the building, again, this infill walls, uh, panels will help you. But at the same time, you see in this particular building, by doing all this modification one by one, we couldn't find any change in the design process. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, conclude with this part of a parametric study. And uh, only thing which I would like to say in this case, this parametric study is confined or limited to a, this particular type of a building. Uh, the results may vary with uh, uh, from building to building because of the various other factors which also contribute while resisting the lateral loads. But you may get some insight uh, to the uh, idea was uh, doing uh, behind this uh, parametric study was to give you some insight 
you know, by making all these small changes, uh, how you can improve the behavior of the building or how you can control the displacement. Uh, and with that, I would hand over to uh, Arvind again. Uh, we'll have one more parametric study. And I'll just share, uh, it will be presented by uh, Adi Deshpande, sir. Will you share the screen, please? Yeah, 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 yeah I'm <clears throat> sure. Just stop this. So good afternoon, all the panelists and the participants. One second, one second. Oh, sure. Till the time screen yeah, one second, uh, I'm sharing is starting, yeah. I'll just give a background that Mr. Anand could. I mean, whenever you start, there is no issue. In between, I'm yeah, just yeah. filling the gap. Yeah, yeah. I'm just filling the gap. So the, what Anand has done is taken one building, has changed the various parameters within the building. That is the shear walls, L-shaped shear wall, coupling, decoupling, and infill panel. Whereas what Mr. Deshpande has done, he has taken different heights of building and seen the effect, what exactly the contribution of different elements. Hi, it starts. Wait one second. Now, now I'll get it. Okay. Because we are on modeling how the different elements, standard elements of the building change the different parameters, which will also time period stiffness, and especially in many of the uh, uh, cities or towns, there are high-rise committees and they have additional requirement over and above the code. And sometimes it becomes difficult to understand in what way to proceed to achieve the desired result. So effort yes. of Mr. Deshpande is to show you that. Harl, please. Yeah, you can start. Yeah, good afternoon all the panelists and the participants. <clears throat> I am going to make a very small presentation. As we all practice, we review our first cut uh, dynamic analysis results to ensure the total provisions like the mass participation factor for the first three modes together should be at least 65%. The fundamental time period in two principal directions should be at least 10% away from larger value. So these conditions, we do ensure that we are fulfilling. But apart from that, some of the additional, or you can say, uh, some rule kind of norms that also help in improving the behavior of the structure are like the time period value, fundamental time period value. We would like to bring it as close to the value of 0.1 in where n is the number of levels in that particular building. And also, we should try and ensure that there is no torsion in the, or the minimal torsion in the first two modes. Now this, as I understand, the first norm will help us in fulfilling the drift requirements automatically, whereas the second norm will help us in improving the performance of the structure. But of course, this entire thing will de depend on how we are placing our shear walls, what is the density of the shear walls with respect to the plan area, and what is the distribution of these shear walls so that the required uh, conditions are fulfilled and the required desired performance is achieved. Uh, next. So as a first case, I have taken one building which is 180 meter in height and the 
height is to width ratio is 6.43 and 5.3 respectively so it's a very uh, strong uh, configuration and there are 55 levels of slabs in this particular building next so purposely we have tried to vary the percentage of shear walls in this particular configuration so stage 1 showed you the initial configuration what we had selected and then in the second stage we added some additional shear walls and now we will see what is the effect of this on the parameters that we were looking at next so in stage 1 as you can see from the chart the dynamic time period in x and y direction were 5.89 and 5.55 respectively and we because we increased the thickness by additional shear walls it dropped down to 5.74 and 5.387 marginally it has reduced and but for achieving that we had to increase the shear wall density from 3.7 to 4.7 in y direction in x direction there were limitations due to architectural planning so many constraints and so we could not increase the density in the x direction but the one conclusion what we can draw is there is no uniformity in terms of shear wall density in principal directions it could be different in each direction but the torsion as you can see has been minimalized and negligible in both the cases next now this is roughly 90 meter height building where aspect ratios are of course uh, 3.29 and 2.18 next here again in stage 1 we had uh, modeled certain number of uh, shear walls and then for, for improving the performance of the structure we added additional shear walls which is depicted in the stage 2 picture of the building next now here again as you can see because of the increase in the shear wall density the time period value has reduced and that is what we desired actually so 3.627 in x direction and 2.94 in y direction we could achieve from uh, improving the shear wall density and so the whole crux is that we have to optimize the percentage of shear wall in each direction and it depends on the configuration of the structure next this is third building which has got 32 slabs height is roughly 96.5 meters and the aspect ratio is 5.5 and 4.45 next here also initially we were not allowed certain shear walls and then we had to add certain number of shear walls in each direction for improving the performance next and as you can see here also the torsion there is no much problem as such the modes but by increasing the shear wall density we have been able to achieve the value of time period near to what we were targeting as i said as per the thumb rule norm of point 1 so this was just to elaborate that we have to do number of trials and iterations to achieve the required performance of the structure but keeping the optimum percentage of shear walls in terms of plan density that that is the crux of the presentation thank you so much with this uh, yeah. we we break for lunch yeah. right now it is 140 so we will have a clear break of 40 minute 220 we start initially we have 10 minutes of presentation about our company and introduction of the persons who have credited for this webinar apart from the speaker so please come back at 220 exactly 40 minutes from now and we will yogendra singh will start at 230 thank you thank you okay thank you thank you everyone welcome back to webinar 116
Uh, now I quickly introduce our EFC team member and principal coordinator, Mr. Arvind Parvekar. He also director at Epticons Consultants. He is graduated from SPC in 1987. Further, he pursued masters in structures from MS University, Vadodara. He is having more than 30 years experience in the field of structural design. He conducts various programs on NDT for PWD Meta Nasik, ISSC Mumbai, PWD Thane, and Sidko Navi Mumbai. He has experience of working on more than 2,500 projects, including infra, structural assessment, large volume NDT projects. Important project executed by Mr. Parvekar, bridge over Narmada, bridge over Narmada at Bharuch, Surat, Orissa, and Worli Sea Link. He developed, he developed in-house well-equipped NABL accredited lab with team of 35 engineers and technicians under Epicons. Now I request Parvekar sir to address the audience and introduce Epicon consultants. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Stop share. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back from uh, the lunch break. I hope you all have, have, must have had a good lunch and will be there till end of the uh, session. And I'll just take this opportunity of 10 minutes to uh, introduce Epicon's Consultants Private Limited, <coughs> the current body uh, behind Epicon's Prince of Concrete, which has uh, uh, arranged this workshop. So we are basically a structural engineering firm and having 35 years, more than 35 years of experience and around more about 150 technical workforce, more than 8,000 completed projects and more than 85,000 expert manholes. We are ISO 9, 2015 certified company with NML accredited uh, concrete testing lab. And we have been uh, in the field of of course, structural design. And apart from structural design, we are in the field of project management consultancy, architectural and detail engineering limited to uh, industrial structures, mostly industrial and institutional structures. And uh, it is separate being for uh, dealing with existing structures where we deal with uh, assessment, non-destructive testing, assessment, retrofitting, strengthening, uh, investigations, failure investigation, all kind of uh, fire fire assessments, earthquake assessments, all kinds of things related to existing structures. And in all these uh, uh, services field, we deal with all kinds of structure, industrial, institutionals, residential, hospitality, special structures, infra also we are dealing with in, in, in uh, repair rehabilitation field. And of course, uh, of course, industrial structures. Uh, there is a long list of clients. We have the, we are, we are, we have displayed only a few in the government field. There are there is large field, uh, private field also, but uh, in government field we are uh, 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 associated with major institutions like nuclear power corporations. The Maharashtra PWD here we are done Gujarat PWD, Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, MMRD, Sidco, ONGC, Bharat Petroleum, TPC, and Go on many, many more. You can we have a major further list on our website. Uh, in the morning, with the uh, introduction of uh, Mr. Anand sir and Dispanta sir, you have seen the glimpses of various high risk projects. So I am not going to repeat that. I'll just uh, I'll just uh, explain a few of the upbeat upbeat projects we are doing. Uh, apart from regular uh, structural designs, here we are. Actually, a part of a world-class campus development for um, uh, for commemorating the 150 years of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, 
Sabal's uh, center city, and here it is from PWD Government of Maharashtra, and we are developing a triangle of, say, Sevagram, Pavnar, and all this this area with all uh, integrated development, including tourism development. There are large, small, small, and big uh, project project part of that or, or part of that. One of these is this is auditorium, and apart from that, also there are big other projects. Then uh, we are proud to be associated with this uh, one of the unique uh, assignment to us in uh, project management, where we have been uh, instrumental in uh, uh, developing and maintaining uh, the concrete quality for durability specifications, stringent durability specifications with all kinds of uh, tests. So this was a peculiarity of uh, this particular project, apart from its uh, uh, regular uh, quality issues. So this was a separate, uh, typical different project where we are, we are involved. And lastly, we have been, this is in design stage right now, which is a metro bound and operation control center where it is uh, MMRDA project where we are architectural and project management consultants. Uh, where, uh, in from this project, uh, from this site, there will be uh, uh, all the 14 line metro lines of Bombay will be controlled, operation control center. With a project cost of 972 crores and built up area of around uh, more than 8.5 lakh square feet. So this is one of our, going to be one of our biggest project for project management. Uh, as far as higher rise structures are concerned, uh, morning New York, we have seen the glimpses of the, uh, the buildings themselves. Here is a, a small presentation of what is the what are the heights we are uh, dealing with. We have started right from 245 meters, and uh, of course, starting from 70 meters, which is the limit for high, high rises. So, we all kinds of uh, high rises we have done. So, these are the names of the high rises: Renoal Green, Renoal Forest. Raymond's SPR City, Mahindra Life Stresses, Ozone Proof, Nuala Arin, Puranic City, Vijay and Cleo, Puranic Toyobe, Vijay Oruvia, Vijay Oruvia, Hiranandani, Arkar Palazzo, Rizvi Builders, and Kavra Builders. All, all high rises are uh, part of our portfolio. And uh, as far as uh, geographical extent is concerned, we have our offices at Rani Mumbai and one small office at Ahmedabad. And uh, as far as uh, the all other uh, triangles you are see are the various places where we have been associated with our projects in one or the other capacity. So where we have almost uh, have a pan India presence in that sense of as far as project services. Some international projects also we have done, uh, though not many. That's all with uh, me uh, from me uh, regarding introduction of the constraints of concrete. And I think uh, now we are at two thirty, and we can. Are uh, we credits? You have to tell credits. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before before um, starting up, Yogendra uh, Singh's slide or Dr. Yogendra Singh's lectures, I'd like to mention uh, uh, a few of our employees specifically who were instrumental in uh, uh, making the parametric studies of uh, whichever you have seen in the morning. So those were Mr. Manish Wadikar, who is our senior design manager in our Dhani unit. Mr. Uh, Nitin Tongse, who is the senior design manager in our Andheri unit. And Mr. Sankit Srivastav, who is a, uh, a junior engineer, very enthusiastic and research oriented uh, uh, young engineer who, uh, who, is, who was instrumental in doing that parameter studies. I, uh, I like to men specifically mention that. And uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think we can start with uh, Yuginda Singh's lecture. And before that, I'll also like to make an introduction of one of his students, Ms. Payal. Rubeha, can you uh, project her into introduction? I'll just put off share, who will be, who is also part of his team.
Ya. Ya, ahí que But anyway, anyway, I think like final start at the end of her lecture. In uh, end of lecture. Uh, we will introduce her. We'll make, break the protocol and uh, we'll introduce. <laughs> but she is a PhD student working under yeah. Doctor Professor Yogendra Singh, and whatever project we saw autograph, she has reviewed and she has done complete analysis again. And there was a demand of many of the participants that we should like, we would like to see the real life building and what problems we occur. So it's a typical building, which a Mumbai or say any megaton builder would prefer for various constraint as a well selling point. So it's building name is Autograph. We have seen it is 171 meters now, and she will demonstrate the entire design. Of course, Dr. Yogendra Singh will be having commentary when she's talking and her formal introduction we can give at the end. Yeah. Okay. Fine, sir. Fine, you can start. Uh, request Dr. Yogendra Singh to start. Okay, so uh, it's me, na? First, I, yeah. I will... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, okay so... Thank you and uh, welcome again after this post lunch. I hope you will not feel sleepy. Yeah, so now Pyle is connected. Yeah. So first, first this will be, um, uh, Pyle, I will be presenting that uh, earthquake instrument design and then after that you can take ah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. First yeah. Yeah. Maybe sorry to you. Announced incorrectly, there is a session by Dr. Yogendra Singh ah, yeah. for nearly two hours. And then ah, either way, we can do it. But I just want to inform better, that better. Uh, ah, better. Uh, I was looking at uh, the questions which have been uh, questions and queries which have been asked by the participants. And one of the questions is regarding modeling of shear wall using uh, finite element and uh, white column. So, Pyle has prepared uh, a case study where she has modeled a building using finite element as well as uh, um, white column. And uh, we will have some interesting discussion on that. Ah, we will take up that. So what I will do, I will start with earthquake resistant design. So I will share my screen. I think you can see my screen. Not yet. Uh, yeah, no. Okay. So in the morning, we talked about uh, modeling. Now we will talk about earthquake resistant design. So modeling is applicable for all types of load. And here we will talk specifically about uh, the behavior of RCC buildings during earthquake and um, how we can design. So when we talk about earthquake, uh, what comes to our mind is a graph like this. So what we see here in the top, it is record, which we have obtained from an accelerograph. It is called accelerogram. The record is called accelerogram. And uh, it is record of ground acceleration with time. So this is for a famous earthquake, El Centro, you might have heard. I have taken from A.K. Chopra's book. So the first one is the record of uh, acceleration. The second one is the record of velocity. Uh, velocity we can obtain uh, either from integration of acceleration or we can also directly record it uh, using a seismograph. So it is a seismogram. It is also called seismogram. It is uh, record of velocity. Similarly, we can integrate the velocity once and we will get uh, displacement or we double integrate the acceleration, we will get displacement. So you can see all the three graphs are varying in a random fashion in very zigzag manner. And what is interesting here is that uh, the acceleration is changing its direction. Uh, very rapidly, it is changing its direction. So this is a characteristic uh, of earthquake. No other load has this type of uh, repeated uh, nature. Uh, wind load is also changing direction, but that 
uh, reversal takes long time so it's it's not so quick as we have in case of earthquake so in case of earthquake uh, since the acceleration is changing its direction and earthquake force is inertia force which is mass into acceleration so uh, the inertia force which is actually a fictitious force so in case of earthquake there is no force as such it is uh, the movement of the ground and that movement of the ground is causing a fictitious force in our structure so we have to be clear that actually it is not a force it is it is only a fictitious effect which we get similar to that of a force i mean i give this analogy i have given this earlier also that when we are standing in a bus and the bus suddenly stops then we feel like somebody has pushed us forward but actually nobody has pushed us so basically it is uh, the acceleration which has been applied or deceleration which has been applied and we get an uh, effect similar to that of a force that's why we call it uh, fictitious force the other issue here is that this force is very large uh, when i say very large uh, actually if you see here the maximum acceleration is 0.319 g it is something similar to what we have in our zone 5 as 0.36 g so it is only 31% or 32% of the gravity in vertical direction uh, 1 g is always acting but we never made any issue about it but in horizontal direction even this 30% or 32% of g is a very large force the reason what we discussed uh, in the morning also that in case of lateral direction the effect of the force is much more severe so same force if it is applied in vertical direction our columns will be subjected to axial action but when this force is applied in the lateral direction our columns will be subjected to columns and shear walls will be subjected to bending direction so horizontal force of the same amount is uh, much more damaging as compared to the vertical force so even this 30% of g acting in horizontal direction can cause a lot of damage and uh, the real earthquakes which we are expecting in zone 4 and 5 are much larger uh, than that um, in case of uh, some earthquakes the horizontal acceleration can be as high as 1g as well in case of a really really large earthquake but 0.6 or 0.7g we can easily expect even in our country uh, in zone 5 in that range we are expecting so you can imagine that what type of forces uh, it will cause on the structure and uh, it is not possible or rather it will be much uneconomical if we design for this full force so we never design for this force we design for a fraction of this force which will come be coming on the building and the morning i stated that uh, actually we are designing only for 20% of this force and uh, 80% we are depending on ductility so what does that mean it means that earthquake force is much larger than the capacity even if we are using the forces as per our code everything is followed faithfully even then it is only 20% the strength of the structure is only 20% of the force which will occur on the structure if the structure was designed for that much force but we are designing for lower force so our structure can take maximum this much force for which we have designed so a fraction 20% of that force uh, it is taking now what will happen to the structure the structure due to this larger earthquake force will get damaged it will uh, yield it will undergo inelastic displacement it will continue to deform but what is happening the earthquake is reversing its direction in the meantime and the same earthquake which was pushing our structure in one direction will now push it in the other direction and that's how we manage our structure to survive so we take uh, both these characteristics into account the first characteristic is that earthquake force has very large effect earthquake has very large effect on our uh, structure which causes damage so invariably our structures will get damaged only that extent of damage we control but we never design our structures not to get damaged during earthquake second uh, issue which we have to take into account in earthquake design is its reversible nature because we depend on this a lot so when uh, the force is reversible it is helping us helping us in a way that uh, the earthquake which was causing deformation of my structure let us say uh, from left to right will now 
act in the opposite direction and will support my structure or cause its deformation in the other direction. But it has a problem and that problem is of fatigue. So you are familiar with fatigue that uh, if on a bridge, uh, the vehicular load, the moving load passes a number of times, then every time it is subjected to some stresses. And every time the stress, even if it is less than yield stress, it causes a tiny damage. And that damage goes on accumulating. And if the number of cycles reaches something like a million or several millions, then the member will fail in fatigue, although the stress level was much less than the yield stress. So this is called high cycle fatigue or fatigue in general. What we have in case of earthquake, the stress is more than the yield stress. So stress cannot be in fact more than yield stress. The strain is more than the yield strain. And um, um, even in few cycles, uh, if that strain is exceeding the yield strain, it will fail. Uh, just to give you a simple example, if I give you a steel strip and ask you to break it, what you will do? You will take the strip, band it once so that it is permanently banned. Permanently banned means that the strain provided is more than yield strain. So it has a plastic strain, it has a permanent deformation, and then you bend it in the reverse direction. And you do it a few times, it will break. So this is called low cycle fatigue, where the strain level is very high. So in case of earthquakes, the strain level is very high. And as a result, every structure, whether made of steel or concrete, it will fail under few cycles. So we have what we call it low cycle fatigue. Or the damage is cumulative. So number of cycles is also making a difference. So how many cycles our structure can sustain, we have to take that also into account. So these two complications make earthquake resistant design different than design for other forces. For example, dead load and live load, which is gravity load or wind load. Now, another important issue is that all the earthquakes which have occurred in the past, those were unique. For example, some of the well-known earthquakes I have included here, all these earthquakes caused a lot of damage. But if you see their accelerograms, these are uh, very, very different. So somewhere, these are plotted on the same scale. So same scale means that whatever this peak low, peak acceleration is there, it is also plotted on the same scale. So what you see in Mexico City earthquake, the acceleration is much smaller. Whereas here, the acceleration is much larger. Here, the acceleration in North Ridge earthquake, the acceleration is very large, but the duration is small. Here, the duration is large, the acceleration is somewhere in the middle range. Here, the duration is large, but the acceleration is very low. And uh, all these uh, earthquakes have caused a lot of damage. So all these are well-known damaging earthquakes. Now, why these earthquakes, especially when we are talking about the last one, the Mexico City earthquake, what, why it has caused damage? Uh, that is interesting. So it is not only the amplitude of acceleration, which we call peak ground acceleration or PGA, not only that is causing the damage, the peak uh, acceleration will result in peak force. So it is not only the peak force which will cause, how this force is reversing its direction. What is the frequency of reversal? What is the period of reversal of this force? That is also important. For example, in Mexico City, you see, although the uh, amplitude of acceleration is small, but it is taking a long time in its reversal. And uh, the structure has to survive during that uh, reversal period. So it becomes difficult. Or we can also think it like this, that the frequency of vibration is matching with the frequency of vibration of our common structures, five to 20 story buildings. Those have frequency in the same range as uh, this earthquake. On the other hand, here in the uh, Chile or Northridge earthquake, the frequency is much higher. Frequency of the earthquake is much higher. So this has a detuning from our structure. So these earthquakes, uh, our damage was similar to what we got in Mexico City earthquake, although the amplitude or PGA was much larger. So two important characteristics of earthquake are amplitude and frequency content. 
and there is the third one also that is the duration because as i said that earthquake during earthquake in each cycle some damage is caused and that damage is accumulated so longer the duration of the earthquake more damage will be accumulated so we call it cyclic degradation of a structure so stiffness and strength of the structure degrades in each cycle it reduces in each cycle so that cyclic degradation also we have to take into account now one question which we have to face with is because these earthquakes are uh, uh, unique these earthquakes are different thousands of records have been now uh, recorded for different earthquakes and all those records are different no two records can match so for the same earthquake if we record earthquake at, at different sites we will get different accelerograms if for different earthquakes we record at the same site those are also going to be different then one question is now for which earthquake i should design my structure for the answer is definitely that one earthquake will not be sufficient because i do not know the earthquake which will come in future will be totally different than all the earthquakes which have been recorded in the past it is not going to match with any of those earthquakes which are available with me in the database so one single earthquake which i am considering from the past is not going to serve the purpose i have to consider a large number of earthquakes uh, how many currently the consensus appears to be minimum number is 11 so at least 11 earthquakes uh, we, we should uh, consider uh, and if we are interested in uh, calculating the collapse probability or we want to do fragility analysis then we should have even larger 30 earthquakes which uh, 30 is the perhaps you may be knowing the 30 is the minimum number of uh, uh, samples which we should have in one set uh, for any statistical analysis so we have to consider these earthquakes statistically to consider the effect of the earthquakes statistically we use this concept of response spectrum so in response spectrum we are obtaining response of a single degree freedom system for earthquake so for example here this is a single degree freedom system single degree freedom system consists of a single mass and it is connected by a column or a spring or any stiffness element and it is subjected to ground acceleration u double dot g so when it is subjected to a ground acceleration like this u double dot g it will start vibrating and the acceleration of the mass itself we are representing by u double dot so this dot is representing derivative with respect to time so double derivative in time u is displacement u double dot is acceleration ug is the displacement of the ground and u double dot g is the acceleration of the ground similarly we can define u dot g also that is the ground velocity or u dot that is the velocity of this structure now when it is subjected to this ground acceleration the mass will undergo an acceleration u double dot and we can calculate the inertia force that is m into u double dot but actually for design we need our column force we don't need uh, the inertia force which will be acting on this mass for design we need the column force and the column force will come from the stiffness times displacement so that is k into u if we do a little substitution k we replace as m omega square and uh, i obtain the maximum column force that is k maximum value of ku and uh, k is constant so i can take out so it depends on the maximum value of u and then i substitute k as omega square i get this force as m omega square d where this omega square d is a very interesting quantity we call this as pseudo acceleration capital a so this is pseudo acceleration and we represent it by um, capital a or sa we also call it a spectral acceleration so sa so this quantity we are actually interested in because this quantity will give me the force in my column by directly multiplying it by the mass of the single degree freedom system so for uh, any single degree freedom system i can calculate the force in the column provided i know the pseudo acceleration and the pseudo acceleration we can obtain as omega square into d where d is the maximum value of displacement u max this is the maximum value of u and we call it pseudo acceleration because d units of d are that of length 
meter, let us say. So omega square d, omega is the angular uh, velocity. So that is uh, um, radian per second. And omega square will be radian per second whole square. Radian is unitless because it is uh, angle. It is uh, uh, a ratio. So the units of omega square d are actually meter per second square, similar to that of acceleration. But it is not equal to u double dot or u double dot max. So it is not same as the real acceleration, but it has the same units and same effect because the force we are obtaining by multiplying this by uh, mass. So it has similar effect, that of acceleration and similar units. That's why we call it pseudo acceleration. So this pseudo acceleration is more important to us than the real acceleration. And we plot usually the pseudo acceleration with the different properties of the single degree freedom system. And that plot becomes very important. In the same manner, we can calculate the pseudo velocity that is omega into d. It has units of meter per second. Again, it is not equal to u dot, not equal to the real velocity. But if it is a uh, uh, undamped system, then these will become equal. In case of a damped system, both are different. And the difference uh, increases with the damping. And what we do is we consider a large number of such single degree freedom system and uh, uh, apply this uh, ground motion at the base of all these single degree freedom systems. And these single degree freedom system we select in such a way that their period is increasing or they have different period. How the, we can change the period? If we keep the mass same and increase the length of the column, keeping its cross section same, then the stiffness is going to reduce 3i by L cube. So stiffness will reduce and then the period will increase. Alternatively, if I increase the mass, then also the period will increase. If I keep the column uh, length same, but I increase the mass or I can do both. I can increase the mass as well as the column length. So I will get different periods of a structure, single degree freedom system. And each single degree freedom system is representing a single story building or a single mode of a multi-story building. So, you know, a multi-story building can vibrate in several modes and each mode has a characteristic period. So that period we can represent by these single degree freedom systems. And uh, if I plot uh, that pseudo acceleration, which we have obtained the peak of that pseudo acceleration with the different properties, I will get a plot like this. This plot we call response spectrum. And we have plotted a spectral acceleration or pseudo acceleration, not the real acceleration. So we are more interested in this pseudo acceleration. And when we plot it with respect to the period of single degree freedom system, then we will get this response spectrum. Now, what is the advantage of this res uh, representing uh, our ground motion in terms of uh, this response spectrum? The advantage is that for a single story building, I can get the column force directly. How? We have seen that the column force is mass into pseudo acceleration. And pseudo acceleration, I can read directly corresponding to a period. I can read the pseudo acceleration directly from here. So I can get the column forces in a single degree freedom system directly here. But in case of a multi degree freedom system or a multi-story structure, what will happen? There will be several modes. So I can get the forces corresponding to each mode directly from this plot, which is our uh, response spectrum. And then I can combine those. The method of combination of different modes that you are familiar, we can do either a SRS SRSS combination or a CQC combination. So if I know the forces in different modes, I can combine those modes to get the resultant force, which is occurring in that member. So this response spectrum becomes a very important way in which we can represent the effect of the ground motion. Another advantage of this response spectrum is that I can do statistical operations on this response spectrum. For example, if I am doing statistical operations on these ground motions, I try to calculate mean and standard deviation of these ground motions. What I will get if I take a large number of ground motions and try to calculate their mean and standard deviation, I will get a flat line because somewhere one ground motion will be giving me peak, other ground motion will be giving me the trough and so on. 
so um, i cannot do statistical operation on one ground motion but i can do statistical operation on this response spectrum for example if you plot the displacement response spectrum in for al um, centro earthquake uh, okay so before going to that let me uh, tell you that this response spectrum need not to be only in terms of spectral acceleration i can plot for any response quantity pseudo acceleration is one response quantity which gives us the force directly but i can also plot it for displacement the peak displacement of the single degree freedom system i can also plot it for velocity or pseudo velocity i can also plot for um, any other quantity like stress in uh, member i can also plot it strain in member all these are response quantities so this term response spectrum means that any response i am plotting with respect to frequency or with respect to period frequency and period are just inverse of each other so if i do that i will get a plot that plot is called response spectrum so if i do this for a typical earthquake let us say el centro earthquake then this is the displacement response spectrum i take the peak displacement of each uh, uh, single degree freedom system and plot that with respect to the period i will get this similar way if i do the pseudo velocity i make a plot of pseudo velocity i will get this you can see that these plots are also jagged these are also varying okay but this variation is not like the one which we had in the time space there they, these are having uh, values in one direction this is not reversing so it is in one direction and this jaggedness i can take care of if i take a large number of uh, earthquakes so i can do statistical operations on this response spectrum and that's why over uh, the last half century this has been very uh, useful and people have been using you know, response spectrum for design all the codes gave response spectrum for design of earthquakes now they are uh, they have started talking that uh, in place of response spectrum let us use a set of time histories rather than going into response spectrum which loses some information let us use the time histories nevertheless still the response spectrum is the uh, important concept for design of structures which is there in all the codes of the world then this response spectrum is affected by several characteristics of earthquake and site it depends on the earthquake that means what is the magnitude of earthquake what is the fault mechanism whether it is a dip slip or it is a strike slip or it is an oblique type of fault whether it is normal or reverse i'm using this terminology you may be hearing for first time but just to tell you that all these affect the shape of the response spectrum and most importantly this response spectrum is uh, controlled by the local site how deep is the soil deposit at a site how deep is the alluvium there or what type of uh, what is the shear wave velocity in uh, the rock at a site that governs the shape of this response spectrum for example this type a is uh, response spectrum typical response spectrum in near field near field means close to the site and on rock rock site where the uh, soil is uh, very stiff or we are measuring uh, the acceleration directly at the rock then we will get this type of shape on the other hand if we are in uh, long uh, sorry we are in the far field far field means uh, more than at least more than 10 kilometers away from the source means away from the source and uh, it is on soft soil then we will get this type of soil so you can see here the peak is occurring at very short period somewhere close to 0.3 0.4 second but here the peak may be even more than 1 second and uh, you will be surprised that in case of uh, recent uh, nepal not so recent now so in case of nepal earthquake in kathmandu this peak occurred at 5 seconds the reason for that was the deep deposits of soil in uh, kathmandu valley so there this peak was at much longer periods so you can easily understand that uh, how wrong we can be in predicting uh, forces if we are using the code 
uh, response spectrum because in our code response spectrum the peak goes maximum up to 0.67 or 0.7 second we can say so up to 0.7 second we have uh, the peak beyond that it is increasing but in case of a real earthquake it can be this peak can be even at 5 seconds and uh, if we are constructing a tall building let us say here you can easily understand that how much gap will be there in the forces that's why the code says that in case of uh, tall buildings which have longer period it is essential to perform a site specific analysis and in site specific analysis we take into account the local site conditions we also take into account how far the earthquake source is there from that site so these two are important just the codal uh, response spectrum may not be adequate codal response spectrum is conservative or adequate in case of low rise buildings because the period of low rise buildings will be in the short period range so even if by mistake in our code we are assuming the peak corresponding to 0.3 or 0.4 second we will be uh, conservative in design of low rise buildings but we can be highly non conservative in design of tall buildings where the period is longer so if i am constructing a tall building on soft soil then i have to be very very careful in that case i should uh, consider the period local site period and that local site period will give me an idea that uh, where i am expecting the peak of the response spectrum or the site specific uh, response spectrum is important in that case now uh, this is an interesting representation of the response spectrum here on x axis we take log of period and on y axis we, we take log of pseudo velocity and if we do like this then the axis which is at 45 degree that gives me the displacement and the axis which is at 135 degree that gives me the pseudo acceleration so on the same graph i can read displacement i can read pseudo acceleration i can also read pseudo velocity so this is an interesting representation which we use for plotting our response spectrum so response spectrum when we are plotting on this graph i can read the acceleration along this axis directly i can read velocity directly along the vertical axis i can read displacement again on this axis and what you see from this shape it is very interesting the initial portion the acceleration is constant you can see that this is more or less parallel to this axis or it is more or less having constant acceleration so in the initial range of the response spectrum the acceleration is constant in the middle range the velocity is constant and in the long period range the displacement is constant so our response spectra have three distinct ranges the first range which we also call short period range and you can see here this is up to roughly 0.5 second in case of el centro earthquake because this graph is for el centro earthquake so this is up to 0.5 second and this is roughly up to 5 seconds or 6 seconds and beyond 6 second it is uh, displacement control so uh, short period it is acceleration controlled in mid period range it is velocity controlled or velocity constant velocity and in the long period range it is displacement control that is characteristic of this response spectrum and we can simplify this shape if i take a large number of earthquakes and take average of those the shape will be something like this so i can generate in log log this is linear but when i will plot it uh, in um, sa versus uh, t normal then it will become curved so on normal graph it will become curved but long long uh, log log uh, graph you can see that it consist of some line segments so the first line segment which starts at 1y 33 second period or 33 hertz this value we call zero period acceleration zpa zero period acceleration sometimes it is also called effective p ground acceleration because what it is representing it is representing a structure which is having high frequency 33 hertz that is quite high frequency or a period 
which is very low, 1 by 33, 0.03 second, which we can treat practically zero. And which type of structure will have such a zero period or high frequency, which is very rigid. Like a concrete block, if we embed into soil and it is moving during earthquake. So we can see that the acceleration of this block will be same as the average acceleration of the ground. If I'm measuring the acceleration at a point in soil, that may have slight difference, but this block, what it will do, it will average out that uh, variation in the acceleration if there is any on this block, and it will give us the effective peak ground acceleration or effective acceleration of the ground. So that's why this is considered as a substitute to peak ground acceleration. And mostly this is used in our response spectra to normalize our response spectrum. So what is given in our code, that is also a normalized response spectrum or a spectral shape, because that is normalized by this G, Z uh, or zero period acceleration. And uh, this zero period acceleration is also called as zone factor. So this zone factor Z, which is given in our code is some representation of effective peak ground acceleration or zero period acceleration. And uh, when we multiply it by the spectral shape, then that becomes response spectrum. So what is given in our code, there is a slight problem in nomenclature. What is given in our, in our code as SAYG is actually not SAYG. It is SAYZ because it is normalized by zero period acceleration Z. When we multiply it by Z, then it becomes SA in units of G because Z is also in units of G. Then roughly at 1 by 8, roughly we can say 0.8 second. So at 0.8 second, till 0.8 second, the acceleration is increasing. Then at 0.8 second, this, uh, sorry, 0.1 second, the acceleration becomes constant and it continues up to this point C. And beyond that, the velocity becomes constant. And we know the relationship between acceleration and velocity. So acceleration is, uh, pseudo acceleration is omega square d, velocity is omega into d. So acceleration is omega into v and omega is two pi by t. So if the velocity is constant, acceleration will vary with one upon t till this point d. And after this point d, the displacement becomes constant and it continues up to this 10 second. Usually beyond 10 second, we are not interested. Here it is given up to very large also, a very large period of 33 seconds, but we will not have our structures in this range. We have uh, the period of interest up to 10 seconds. In fact, we do not have instruments which can record even up to a period of 10 seconds. Keep in mind, this is period, period of single degree freedom system, not the duration of earthquake. So when I'm saying uh, instruments which cannot record up to period of 10 seconds does not mean that they cannot record the earthquake for 10 seconds. The earthquake signal which they are recording, that signal does not have energy in this frequency range. So it is one by 10 Hertz, so very low frequency. So in this frequency range, usually those uh, earthquake, those uh, instruments cannot record. So that's why in our code, the response spectrum was given up to four seconds only. And when they have extended beyond four seconds, that is not correct. I will explain why. So what we have to understand is that if I plot this earthquake uh, response spectrum on normal SA versus T or A, A and SA are same, um, pseudo acceleration or spectral acceleration, both are same. And uh, we can plot this response spectrum for different damping. This damping is representing the damping of the single degree freedom system. And this is representing the peak pseudo acceleration. And we know uh, that peak pseudo acceleration, which depends actually on capital D, the peak displacement, that will depend on damping also. If my uh, structure is having or single degree freedom system is having large damping, then the response will reduce. If it is having a smaller damping, then the response will increase. So you can see that response depends on damping and it depends on period. So up to roughly 0.1 second it is increasing, then somewhere here it becomes proportional to one upon t 
and then if we go further beyond six second or so then it becomes proportional to one upon t square in the displacement control range this acceleration will become because displacement is constant acceleration is omega square into t omega is 2 pi by t so it becomes 4 pi square by t square into displacement so it becomes proportional to 1 upon t square okay so this is the response spectrum which is given in our code in case of uh, equivalent static method you can see that that increasing arm is not there so we will come back to this later let's see first this response spectrum which is given in our code it is all the spectra are starting from one and then it is increasing up to 0.1 then this is constant acceleration range then there has to be constant velocity range up to four and our code is assuming constant acceleration beyond that this is the problem actually beyond four second or beyond six second it should have displacement control range for example if you compare it with the asc7 response spectrum this is more logical so what they have up to this t naught which is close to 0.1 second it is increasing then this is constant velocity acceleration then constant velocity this is proportional to t sorry proportional to one upon t and then beyond this tl that is long period corner period beyond that it is proportional to t square so it will reduce even faster beyond tl but what our code is assuming our code is assuming it to be constant now what implication it can have on force it will not have much implication because anyhow the value of sa here has reduced and the minimum base shear may govern here but it will have large implication on calculated drift because drift is proportional to t square in this range so when you will multiply this by t square the drift will increase like this so it will satisfy the force condition easily but it will become very difficult to satisfy the interstory drift using this response spectrum beyond four seconds a better approximation could have been that whatever is that velocity control range this one upon t that one upon t had continued up to six, six seconds that was closure to reality because as i said that uh, there is very little information available in accelerograms beyond four seconds those instruments which were used in old times they those were able to record up only up to this frequency or inverse of this period so they those were recording earthquakes with this frequency the frequencies beyond this were not present there so that's why the information beyond four second is not available but uh, recently whatever uh, earthquakes or new instruments the earthquakes have been recorded based upon that this has been obtained that actually we get a displacement control range here where the spectral acceleration is actually proportional to one upon t square but uh, don't worry in our um, country in our code committee also this effort is going on and soon within few months you may get uh, a different response spectrum where uh, you will get a displacement control range beyond a particular period that period may be four second that period may be six second or even longer that varies from point to point location to location so you may get even maps of that period like in asc 41 they have contour maps for the whole america for this tl also and there this tl varies from 4 second to 12 second minimum value is 4 second in some region and say in other regions where the value is maximum this is 12 second so up to between 4 and 12 second this transition from velocity control range to displacement control range occurs and this point we can get by intersection of velocity control range and acceleration control range so which we obtain in our code also now if i am doing a dynamic analysis then i have to use this code in dynamic analysis i am using multiple modes so if my first mode is let us say somewhere here second mode may be here third mode may be here and higher mode may be even in this range where the acceleration is decreasing but if i am using equivalent static method in equivalent static method my uh, I'm using actually single mode. I'm using single period. So what code says that if we are using a single period, then we are not allowed to reduce the um, acceleration 
when we are uh, our structure is having period less than 0.1 second although it doesn't have any practical significance because even our single degree single uh, story building will have a period of 0.1 second so all our buildings will have a period longer than 0.1 second so it doesn't come into picture only in case of uh, dynamic analysis when you are we are using multi degree uh, freedom models when we are having multiple modes there we can have some mode here in this range and then this uh, range this arm of the response spectrum will come into picture that is one thing second thing you see that here the um, all the response spectra are starting with value of SAYG equal to 1. Why? As I explained, these are not response spectra. These are spectral shapes. And these are normalized with respect to the zero period acceleration or JADPA or JAD. So when you will multiply this by JAD, it will become response spectrum. And in different zones, you will get different uh, response spectrum. And uh, the effect of local soil is taken into account here by change in the graph in this period range, in the velocity control range and the displacement control range, this, these graphs have been uh, increased for uh, uh, flexible and the medium soil. So if I have uh, flexible soil, soft soil, or I have uh, medium soil, then this value is higher. But there is an error in our code in this range. Why? Because it has been observed that in soft soil, earlier, it was thought that the amplification will occur only in long period range. But now it has been found that amplification occurs even in short period range. Even in that acceleration control range, the um, spectral acceleration increases in soft soil. So this shape also needs to be changed to something like this, where there will be some amplification in this range also. So that will come in due course of time. Till then, you can continue using this. Only difficulty I see is that if you are really designing a tall building, which is having period more than four seconds or more than five seconds, then you will have difficulty in satisfying the drift. And uh, there, I think you can calculate uh, forces using this response spectrum. But if you are having difficulty in uh, getting the drift, you can continue the same one upon T formula beyond this four second also. Okay, then another important issue is defining the label of earthquake because earthquake is a rare phenomenon. It has certain re uh, return period. Now the question is for which return period we should design our, our structures. So if I plot the annual rate of accidents versus the peak ground acceleration, which we are observing for different earthquakes, then we get a curve like this. What does this curve indicate? This curve indicates a simple fact that smaller earthquakes are very frequent. Those can occur almost uh, with certainty. So if I take a very small earthquake, it will definitely occur. But as the acceleration increases, the probability of occurrence goes on decreasing. And we use a concept of what we call uniform hazard spectrum. So what is this uniform hazard spectrum? that we choose some probability and then we plot our response spectrum for that probability. And what are the common probabilities which are used in literature? One commonly used probability is this, 50% in 50 years, which corresponds to a return period of 75 or 72 to be more accurate. And we call this as the serviceability earthquake. So the serviceability earthquake has an average return period of roughly 75 years. And it has 50% probability, 50-50 probability occurring during the lifespan of our building, which we usually take as 50 years. So this is one important earthquake we should keep in mind. Then another important earthquake is this 10% probability in 50 years, which has a return period of 475. We roughly say it as 500 years. So 500 years return period earthquake, that is our design basis earthquake, DVE. So this is important. World over, the structures are designed for this DBE, design basis. Then the third important uh, probability of occurrence is 
2% in 50 years, which corresponds to the return period of roughly 2,500 years. So 75 years, 500 years, 2,500 years, these are important return periods and the corresponding earthquakes are called serviceability earthquake, design basis earthquake, and maximum considered earthquake, MCE. Why we call it maximum considered earthquake? Because we want our structures not to collapse at this earthquake. So we are designing, this is interesting, please keep in uh, mind, we are designing for DBE, but our intention is that our building should not collapse under MCE. So this has a little uh, paradoxical situation that we are, there is a little anomaly here that we are designing for DBE and we are assuming that the structure will not collapse under MC. This is not totally baseless because when we are designing our structure for DBE, we are taking response reduction factor into account. We are uh, considering response reduction factor, but still there is some reserve strength. It is assumed that beyond that response reduction factor also, there is a reserve strength. And that reserve strength takes care of our building in MCE. It will make sure that the uh, collapse will not occur MCE. In other words, when you are using reduction, you are not doing it for R. You are doing actually for 2R because first you convert from MC to DV by dividing it by 2 and then you divide it by R. So actually you are dividing the force which will correspond to MC by 2R, so 10 times. So that's why I said that we are designing our structures roughly to 10% and the actual capacity of the structure is approximately double because we are using a partial factor of safety on material, okay? The partial factor of safety on load is not really a partial factor, I will explain that in the next slide, but we are using characteristic strength of the material, which has 95% confidence, not more than 5% samples should have strength below that. And uh, we are uh, using partial factors of safety on concrete and steel. So that gives strength roughly double of that. So that's why I said that 20%, we are, we are designing for approximately 20% of what will occur during MC. So that two is canceled out by that Z by two. And that's how when we are designing for DBE with the response reduction factor R, we hope it is not checked anywhere in the code, but we hope that the structure will not collapse during MC. So keep in mind that there is no conservatism in design of our structures. If this MC occurs, then the chances of collapse are not zero. In um, ASC 7, they have come out with a concept of MCER. So they are deciding MCE based on the risk of collapse. And how much is the risk of collapse? You will be shocked to know that is 10%. So those buildings which will be designed for ASC, if those are subjected to that MC, those have 10% chances of collapse. So that means the... Um, 10 buildings out of 100. Okay, it is really huge number. Only thing is that we will not have MC earthquake on a large number of buildings. MC earthquake will occur in a uh, smaller region and that's how uh, the damage can be controlled. But definitely it is not a very uh, happy situation uh, what we are currently using in our design. And that's why people are demanding better performance than this. 10% collapse itself is not a good performance. And then even those buildings which are not collapsing, those will damage badly. There may be 100% economic loss. If there is no life loss, even then there can be 100% economic loss. So question is, are we willing for, are we ready to accept that 100% loss? Those people who are purchasing their flats in Mumbai, spending whole of their life savings, they will have nothing if the earthquake comes. So will they like to spend a little more so that their uh, investment is safe, it's safer? I think if that is properly communicated to them, they will definitely go for that. And that's where the performance-based design can help us. 
and uh, we are um, in preparation. In fact, we have submitted two revisions of the draft already to the code committee where we have uh, given the procedure for performance-based design. It's very closely following ASC 41. Uh, there was some concerns in the committee that if uh, we give this alternate procedure than the code, then people may start misusing that to uh, design buildings which are poorer than uh, in the code because uh, this per performance-based design requires sophisticated analysis. And our people, if they are not doing that sophisticated analysis and they get stamping done from here and there, uh, our peer review system is also not uh, that well in place. So then there may be issues. So currently we have limited it to um, design of code compliant building. That means you cannot, you can use this method to improve the performance beyond the code but you cannot flout the code using this. So that's what the approach we have taken. So if some, concern, some owner, some builder or some owner, he or she wants the building to perform better than collapse prevention at MC because of our code, maximum it guarantees is no collapse under MC. And that too, there is intention, there is intended uh, in the code, but there is no mechanism by which you can ensure, you can convince your uh, client that the building which you have designed will not collapse. There is no mechanism. It is only intended in, in the code. So to determine its performance, we need some procedure. So that procedure is coming up. We hope that in few months, that code should be uh, at least circulated. It should be sent for wide circulation if not notified and uh, within a year or so it should be notified then you will be able to design buildings better than this what i mean to say is that what is given in the code is minimum bare minimum which we have to follow we should not think that uh, there is a lot of margin in the code there is a possibility to make errors there is no room to compromise there is no room because this is the bare minimum because the earthquake forces from the beginning we have learned that those are very large and we were never designing for the actual earthquake forces and we were making a compromise because earthquake is a very rare phenomena 2500 years so everybody thinks that 2500 years that unlucky year of 2000 that unlucky 2500th year will not occur in my lifetime but we do not know that uh, unfortunate event may be just the next second we we may not be knowing that so if we can, if we can afford to do that, and I think those people who are doing investment in uh, these uh, costly apartment buildings, they can afford a little, a small percentage more, which can be used to safeguard the buildings. We should go better than the code. So we should think how to design buildings even better than the code not uh, try to find out the ways by which we can escape and uh, flout the code. What is given in the code is the bare minimum. Okay, so uh, this type of contours are under preparation. Uh, although this is from an old effort, NDMA uh, developed some guidelines. So future hazard donation map, it will not be in the form of zone one, two, three, four. It will be something like this. From here, you can read the pseudo spectral acceleration at minimum two periods, 0.2 second and one second. And once you know that, using this methodology, which is adopted in ASC7, it, it is based on three parameters. One parameter is this SDS, short period, 0.2 second, this value, and another value is 0.1 second. And the third value is this TL. So if we know these three parameters at 0.2 second, spectral acceleration at one second, and the value of TL, then we can develop this whole spectral shape. So the exercise is going on to develop these contours for India like this, so that we can develop the response spectrum. Now, what is the status of the current code? That is another uh, issue and uh, people are confused about it. That what is JAD in our code? When we say uh, zone factor, what it is representing? So one thing I explained that this zone factor is representing actually zero period acceleration or 
effective peak ground acceleration. It is not equal to peak ground acceleration. It is effective peak ground acceleration. Effective peak ground acceleration is that if I put a very rigid block in the soil, and then what acceleration, uh, peak acceleration that rigid block is recording, that is our effective peak ground acceleration. And it is slightly different than what we are getting from uh, the record of our uh, acceleration. So the peak there will be slightly higher than this. So this is slightly smaller than that. And uh, it also takes into account the frequency content of uh, that earthquake to some extent. So this zone is, the joint factor is zero period acceleration or effective peak ground acceleration obtained from deterministic seismic hazard assessment, DSHA. So deterministic seismic hazard assessment does not give us any return period. It gives us the possible values of effective peak ground acceleration at a site. And we can obtain the mean value, we can obtain the sigma value. So mean value is the most probable value and sigma gives how much variability we are expecting. So this JAD value, which is adopted in our code is median value or mean value. Uh, it's not clear whether it is median or mean, but there may be slight difference between the two. So it is the median value which we obtained from DSH. Now, what is this? What this value is representing? It is a deterministic value. So we cannot directly relate it in terms of return period, which we talked SE, DBE, or MC. But an exercise was done for California region. And what they have obtained is that 1.5 times this JAD can be considered equivalent to the EPGA in MC. So EPGA in MC is 1.5 times JAD. And this will now explain why our code is using a load factor of 1.5 on earthquake. All codes of the world, they are using a load factor of one for earthquake. This to some of our designers using a load factor of 1.5 on earthquake doesn't make sense because in case of earthquake, we are not designing really for force. Actually, we are designing for displacement. So we should not apply any factor of safety on uh, force. So to explain to you, to make it clear to you that 1.5 factor, which is given in our code is not actually a load factor. It is a correction factor to convert our JAD to MCE. So JAD, what we have obtained is median value. MCE corresponds to medium plus one sigma, and that is roughly 1.5 times JAD. So when we multiply that 1.5, then it becomes MCE. And DV is half of MC, although that relationship is also not constant. It varies from place to place. In America earlier, in the UBC times, 84, 87, they were using this relationship of 1 by 2. Now they have reduced it to 1 over 1.5. Those who are familiar with ASC7, they know that DV there, they are obtaining as 2 thirds of MC, not 1 by 2 of MC. But let us assume that in our code, this 1 by 2 is to convert dV into MC. So dV will be 1.5 into Z by 2. So that's why this Z by 2 we are getting in our base here. Z by 2 into I by R into S A by G into W. And 1.5 is given in the form of load factor, which is not actually load factor. That is a factor to convert this earthquake uh, Z into the MC or dV. And two third of DBE is considered as SE, serviceability earthquake. So if I divide this by uh, two third, that means I divide this by 1.5, I multiply by two, three, it will become JAD by two. So now to summarize, you can see in Indian code, JAD by two does not represent DBE. This is one misconception which uh, is prevalent in our fraternity. So be clear, JAD by two is serviceability earthquake. So when you are using an earthquake without a factor of safety, partial factor of safety, factor of 1.5, it is serviceability earthquake. When you multiply it by 1.5, that Z by 2 multiplied by 1.5, then it becomes DVE. So when we are using factored load, then it is becoming DVE. And if I multiply this by further by 2, then it will become MC. So this relationship between MC, DVE, and SE should be clear. 
So when we are calculating the drift and uh, in IS 1893, it is given that it is to be calculated for unfactored load. And in 16700, it is given that it is to be calculated for factored load. What difference it makes? That means that IS 1893 effectively is calculating the interstudy drift for serviceability earthquake. And a value of 0.4 for serviceability earthquake is very large. I will explain that. Uh, serviceability, if, if we compare our code IS 1893 with other codes of the world, the interstory drift is, the maximum interstory drift is of the order of 2%. But that 2% is the maximum interstory drift or inelastic interstory drift. And what our code is calculating? Our code is calculating the elastic drift which we are getting from the design, which is for the reduced load. So during earthquake, the drift is not reduced, the force is reduced, drift remains more or less same. So um, if we multiply that by, if, if, if I want to know the inelastic drift, I have to multiply that by R. So that 0.4, if I multiply by R, that is um, five for our SMRF, then it becomes two, which is at par with other codes. In uh, ASC7, it is uh, maximum is 2% or for some structures, for other structures, it is even less. In Europod, it is even less than uh, 2%. So this 0.4% actually corresponds to 2% in other codes because we are calculating at the reduced load. They are calculating at the full load multiplied by R without dividing it by R, in other words. So 0.4% is sufficiently large interstory drift at DBE in comparison with other codes. So if our code specifies 0.4% at serviceability earthquake, that will be very, very large, especially for tall buildings. That should not be permitted. So actually, it should be what is given in IS 16700, that 0.4% drift should be calculated for DBE. That means for 1.5 times JAD by 2 or corresponding to the factored load. So this 0.4% is corresponding to factored load. There is an error in IS 1893. Uh, and we should correct that in the near future. It should not be for unfactored load. It should be for factored load because unfactored load is in our code is representing serviceability earthquake, not DB. Okay. So this discussion I wanted because a lot of confusion is going on uh, in our codes. I will skip this. I will also skip this. I want to explain uh, the effect of inelasticity. So first of all, what is inelasticity or nonlinearity? Uh, usually we use these terms uh, almost synonymous uh, in our common language, but actually these mean different, nonlinear and inelastic. So let's start with linear. When we say that a structure is behaving linearly, when the display load versus displacement relationship here, this F is the load and U is the displacement. So if the load displacement relationship is can be represented by a line, then it is linear. And usually if a structure is behaving linearly, it is elastic. So most of our structures in small uh, displacement range behave linear elastic. That means their load displacement is linear and elastic means that if you give some deformation and then unload it. If you apply load, it will get deformed. If you unload it, it will come back to the original position. There will not be any permanent deformation. But if you go on increasing the load, then what happens? This load displacement curve no more remain linear. It becomes nonlinear. So this is called nonlinearity, that the load displacement curve is nonlinear. When we say what is, uh, we say structure is nonlinear, what does that mean? It means that the load displacement behavior of the structure cannot be represented by a straight line. It is a nonlinear curve. So this becomes the nonlinear. Then another issue is, okay, before coming to that, uh, this nonlinear behavior, we usually represent by two lines. We call it equivalent bilinear idealization. And uh, what is this equivalent bilinear idealization? That initial line I take 
along the initial uh, behavior uh, initial load displacement curve of the structure and then i take another line which may be horizontal or which may be at some positive or negative uh, slope as well but these two lines are selected in such a way that the area under the two curves one consisting of these two lines that means equivalent bilinear curve and the actual nonlinear curve is same why we are concerned about area because in case of earthquake we are talking about energy dissipation and energy dissipation is nothing but the work done and uh, the energy uh, returned back so uh, work done is important and work done we will get from the area under the load displacement curve so we uh, do this equivalent bilinearization in such a way that the area under the two curves is equal and with this idealization our calculation becomes simple that's why we do this idealization and here what we see if i am loading my structure up to this point and this point we call yield point so keep in mind yield point we are not representing this this we call first yield where the first rod in one of my beams or columns has yielded this is that point this point is a notional point it is not there even on the actual load displacement curve this is the point where the two lines are meeting so we take this as the notional yield point and the corresponding force we call yield force or yield strength and the corresponding displacement we call yield displacement so till yield point we are assuming this structure to be linear elastic what does that mean that the loading and unloading will occur along the same path and that path is linear but if i go beyond this point and start unloading anywhere here then it will not go back to the original path rather the unloading will take place along a path which is parallel to the original path so we will get it like this and if i start unloading from here sorry loading from here or applying loading in the other direction then it will also follow the same path so this type of behavior we will get and if i apply a cyclic load i will get uh, what we call hysteretic behavior and in each hysteretic loop some energy will be dissipated for example here in the linear elastic range loading and unloading is along the same path so whatever work i do in loading the same amount of energy i get back while unloading but here what is happening the work done in loading is this whole area whereas in during unloading i am getting only this much uh, energy back so what is happening the remaining energy has been dissipated and this is important in case of earthquake that the size of our hysteretic loop size of um, the hysteretic loop of our structure should be sufficiently large so that it can dissipate energy at same or higher rate than what the earthquake is imparting to it so earthquake is imparting energy to my structure at some rate my structure should be able to dissipate that energy at that or higher rate if it is able to dissipate that energy at the same rate then it will be able to survive that quick if it is not able to dissipate at the same rate the energy will get accumulated its displacement will go on in accumulated and it will collapse so this energy dissipation is very important and it comes from its inelastic behavior i will skip these things i will go to this important concept that how we can take advantage of this ductility one way of taking advantage is what i have skipped that we we can do actual time history analysis where we take into account the hysteresis also and uh, we do a time history analysis that is one way i am skipping that because of the time and uh, i want to discuss i want to spend time on this concept because this is central of our uh, code based methods so if i have a hypothetical structure which has very high strength that's why i am saying it hypothetical because we will never design such a structure so that structure will remain linear elastic during the whole earthquake and here the load displacement curve is linear right up to the maximum earthquake which is occurring so under that earthquake the force which will be occurring on my structure is let us say fe e stands for elastic and then the displacement this displacement also i can call delta e the elastic displacement but 
real structure, I will never design for this much force. I will design for a much reduced force Fy. And ratio of this Fe and Fy, we can call response reduction factor, R. So this, this ratio is, we can say, as the effective response reduction factor, although the response reduction factor which is given in the code is slightly different. It includes effect of overstrength also. But let us, for the time being, skip that. So ratio of Fe to Fy is R. And in our curve here, the equivalent bilinear curve, the ratio of this maximum displacement to, to this yield displacement, this is defined as ductility ratio. So um is mu into uy. So this mu is um by uy. This is ductility ratio. So ratio of these two is ductility ratio. Now in this behavior, one interesting finding people have seen they have analyzed a large number of elastic and inelastic nonlinear structures for different earthquakes. And what they have found that on an average, the maximum displacement of elastic and inelastic structure is same. And accordingly, this observation, it is not a theoretical derivation, it is an observation. And this observation is called equal displacement principle because the displacement of uh, elastic and inelastic, linear and nonlinear structure is same, which is given by this delta. And ratio of Fb and Fy we have already seen is R. Now, if you take the similar triangles, you can prove that the ratio of Fe to Fy is same as delta M to delta Y. And we get a very important relationship, R is equal to mu. And this is based on equal displacement principle. Equal displacement principle says that the maximum displacement under a given earthquake of elastic and inelastic structure, irrespective of for what force you have designed that inelastic force, both will have the same displacement or R will be equal to mu. What does that mean? If I have a ductile structure, I can have a larger value of R, but suppose my structure is have low ductility, let us say it, it can have only this much ductility, then I have to design it for larger earthquake. So the force for which I have to design depends on ductility. And whether my structure will be able to survive a given earthquake or not, that will depend on the combination of strength and ductility. It is not dependent only on strength. It depends on the combination of strength and ductility. So um, mu will decide R. This is valid for equal displacement principle. But uh, equal displacement principle, there is a limitation. This is applicable only for long period structures. What are long period structures? Which are having their period in velocity control range or displacement control range. It is not applicable to those structures which are having um, period in um, acceleration control range. And uh, which structures have their period in acceleration control range? which are having period less than, let us say, 0.7 seconds, because that's where the velocity control range starts. So there, equal displacement principle is not valid. And what is has been observed is that it is equal energy principle. And what is this equal energy principle? That the energy or the uh, area below the two curves, that means the load displacement curve for uh, the elastic structure, which is this triangle, and for the inelastic structure, which is this trapezoid. So both these areas have to be equal. So we can see that in this case, the maximum displacement of inelastic structure is more than that of the elastic structure. Or in other words, R is less than mu. So in this case, the response reduction factor will be less than the ductility ratio. And uh, the expression by equating these areas, some geometric simplification we can do. And for this equal energy principle, we get R is equal to square root two mu minus one. That means my structures will have less reduction factor as compared to the ductility ratio. So short period structures are subjected to disadvantage. The reduction factor there is less. Long period structures, their reduction factor is slightly higher. That is equal to mu. And here it is square root two mu minus one. Based on this principle, the response reduction factor for different types of structures have been proposed in the code. Either I have to find out this displacement myself, 
using nonlinear analysis, then I can calculate actually how much ductility is available in my structure. And uh, then I can calculate the R. But calculation of ductility is also not easy because it requires nonlinear analysis. So to save the designers from the labor of performing nonlinear analysis, code has simplified their life by providing this value of response reduction factor R. But these are supposed to represent the ductility. These are either R is equal to mu or square root two mu minus one. Okay. But historically, these response reduction factors have not been obtained from analysis because at that time, the tools to perform nonlinear analysis were not available. So it was difficult to find out the ductility. These are based on the experience during past earthquakes. So what people have seen, uh, observed that uh, what type of forces these structures are able to survive, based upon these, these response reduction factors have been obtained. So these are not based on analysis. That's why if you do a real analysis, you will find that actually you do not get this much ductility. So in our code, if we are uh, doing the nonlinear analysis of uh, buildings designed as per our code, uh, you never get a ductility of five. It is much less. You will get 2.5 or three in that range, you will get the ductility. Then are these buildings safe, which we are uh, designing our as per our code or not? Still these buildings are safe and the region lies in a provision in the code, which most of our engineers hate. And that provision is BV var by BV correction. The code says that irrespective of the period of the structure, which you are getting from analysis, you have to design your building for the base shear, which is obtained from empirical formula. And that ratio of the two base shears invariably comes out to be between two and three. So that compensate for this lack of ductility, which is there in our code. If that clause was not there, then our buildings would have been unsafe. So we have done and still we are doing that study. We will publish it also. And uh, the region why our buildings still have uh, satisfactory performance is because of this clause, BV bar by BV. Our people do not understand it and they think that they are unnecessarily penalizing the building by doing this BV bar by BV correction. And they always search for some means or other to um, somehow do away with that clause. So they are looking for different formula for the period by which the design base shear can be reduced. But believe me, uh, our structures would have been unsafe, highly unsafe, because the ductility which we are getting is much less than this. Okay, And that's the reason. Uh, it, this provision is not there only in Euro code. All other codes of the world they have. But in Euro code, the response reduction factors are much less. The maximum response reduction factor they are using is 3.5. So there, this response reduction factor is less. And uh, if we have to use this response reduction factor of 5, then it has to have really uh, large ductility. That type of ductility, at least our analysis, what we shows what we have seen is not showing. So uh, this thing, uh, this issue will be settled only by experiment and uh, performing experiments on real size buildings is very, very difficult. So uh, we can depend only on nonlinear analysis and whatever nonlinear analysis we have done, it shows that this much ductility, ductility ratio of five is not there in our buildings. We, we don't get this, this much ductility. So it is only the BV var by BV, which is our savior. So this is available for different types of buildings. Um, in case of shear walls, it is four. And in case of shear walls with SMRF, it is 4.5. Uh, sorry, five, if we are having ductile shear wall with the SMRF, then this is five. And in case of uh, ductile frame SMRF, also this is five. Uh, some people are arguing that uh, perhaps the shear wall with SMRF or the shear wall uh, without any uh, ductile shear walls without any frame, this four can be perhaps increased. So because the shear walls are also providing more or less same level of ductility, but it needs to be 
tested it needs to be validated with experiments then only something conclusively can be said uh, at the moment these values may be even irrational not only these values may be inaccurate these may be even irrational because these are not based on any study these are based on the collective judgment of the code committee and in this case it has been borrowed from some other codes and um, i do not know because this is not documented anywhere that how these values have been arrived at that history is not known okay so another thing uh, is regarding the damping factor that is also another crucial factor so is 1893 says that the damping factor is 5% so whether it is a steel rc or masonry structures damping factor we will take 5% earlier earlier versions of the code uh, those who are in uh, profession for a longer time they know in 1984 code uh, the steel or even 2002 code uh, for steel buildings we were using 2% damping and for masonry buildings we were using 10% damping and 5% we were using for rcc so these are more uh, based on the judgment how people are doing but in 16700 one thing we have to keep in mind that this effective damping reduces as the period increases so in case of taller buildings this damping reduces that's why in 16700 it is not 5% uh, if i remember correctly it is 3% or 2% 3% i think if i remember correctly so in uh, 16700 uh, we allow only 3% damping the reason is the dependence of the damping on the period so we do not get 5% damping in long period tall buildings then this is the minimum base shear you are familiar region is again um, same thing that uh, if we are not having adequate ductility we should have some minimum safeguard okay now coming to these uh, irregular buildings so this modes of vibration this has caused a lot of confusion and a lot of questions are coming there what our code says is that the first three modes uh, building will be said to be irregular if the first three modes contribute less than 65% mass participation factor in each principal direction in ideal condition what will happen in ideal condition if the building is not very tall and uh, it is symmetric in both the horizontal directions then the first mode will be in one of the horizontal direction the second mode will be in the other horizontal direction and the third mode will be torsion there will not be a coupling coupling means what the mode which is having uh, maximum participation in x direction will not have any participation in y direction so these two directions will not be coupled then similarly the mode which is having vibrations in y direction will not have any participation in x direction and these will not have any torsion so these will not have any participation in the torsional direction also so these three modes are independent of each other and their periods are well separated and the participation in the first mode fundamental mode in each direction will be more than 75% that will happen from a balanced Uh, ideal building 75 percent 80 percent if it is low rise you can get even 85 percent but if the height increases that will go on reducing so what the code is saying that currently that the first three mode should have 65 percent why first three mode because some coupling may be there buildings will not be perfectly symmetric in both the directions so some torsional coupling will be there but total the contribution should not be 65% the first three modes together should have 65% in both the direction secondly the third mode uh, or torsion should be the third mode torsion should not be the first or second mode because what will that mean that will mean even if our if our building is symmetric it is possible that the first mode comes out to be torsional mode the indication which it is giving is that our building is torsionally flexible so we have to keep in mind in case of earthquake ground motion 
there is a torsional component also which we do not even record we are recording only x and y and z uh, components there are accelerations in the translation but we are not calculating the accelerations in the torsion but in real motion there will be always some torsional motion in the ground motion also and further our center of mass and center of stiffness will not be exactly at the same location which we are computing there are variations in the real structure and due to that the, there will be a, an eccentricity between center of mass and center of stiffness which we call accidental eccentricity so even if our building in plan and in design is perfectly symmetric still it will have some torsional component in during real earthquake and if building is very flexible in torsion then what is going to happen this torsional mode uh, this torsional motion will get amplified so to control that code says that the building should not be torsionally flexible how we can ensure it this can be either ensured by calculating uh, the radius of torsional stiffness or and then checking it with the, the eccentricity eyr or a simple check which is adopted in our code is that the torsional mode should be third mode that will ensure that the stiffness in torsional mode is higher than the stiffness in the translational modes which we are assuming to be first and second mode and that difference between two modes should be at least 10% so um, uh, personally the um, i agree that the torsional mode should be 10% away from the translational mode that i understand but why the two horizontal modes should have a difference of 10% that is not clear to me that doesn't uh, show any um, uh, uh, what we what we say is uh, uh, apparent advantage so it it is not uh, very apparent that uh, this 10% difference in the periods in the two directions that means you cannot have a perfectly uh, square building which is having uh, both the periods same that our code does not allow it considered that as an irregularity that appears to be uh, a misconception in the code which we are in any case we will discuss and decide in future but uh, the torsional mode should be should not be first or second mode and it should be uh, having period shorter than 10% shorter than the second mode and uh, another clause is that in buildings located in seismic zone 2 and 3 only first condition should be satisfied that means this one and in seismic zone 4 and 5 both the conditions are required so uh, of course in zone 4 and 5 uh, the irregularity clause has to be more stringent and that's just a decision uh, it does not have any theoretical basis then the other issue is torsional irregularity what i was talking here it was torsional flexibility that if my building is flexible in torsion then even if it is regular even if it is symmetric it can have due to accidental uh, eccentricity and due to torsional motion in the ground it can have amplification of torsional motion that is to be avoided that is taken care of by this clause and uh, if my building is not perfectly symmetric then it will have larger displacement at one end and a smaller displacement on the other end the displacement the end at which we are having larger displacement we call flexible end or flexible side of the building and uh, where we have smaller displacement that we call uh, rigid side of the building so the difference between this maximum displacement and the minimum displacement that needs to be controlled and code says that this delta max on the flexible side should not be greater than 1.5 times the delta b because if it is more that is showing that the distance between the center of mass and center of stiffness is very large and uh, that will cause lot of torsional force and you can argue and ask that what is the harm in having torsion if i am designing for that the problem with torsion is that those columns which are located on the flexible side those will undergo larger those will experience larger forces or lar those will undergo larger displacement and hence those will experience larger forces and the chances that they are yielding first are more 
so first these will yield and once these are yielding then the stiffness of this side will reduce and when the stiffness of this side is reducing the torsion will increase further the flexible side will become more flexible so the torsional effect will increase further and we will have a sequential failure of columns each row will fail one by one okay so although we are um, exploring investigating this also that how true it is if uh, we uh, want to design such buildings we have to ensure that different elements in the building should not fail sequentially we have to ensure if we want to design our buildings based on uh, linear analysis then we should ensure that the uh, demand to capacity ratio in all our elements should be of the same order it should not happen that some of the members are having demand to capacity ratio close to 1 and other members are having demand to capacity ratio close to 0.5 in that case what will happen those uh, members which are having demand to capacity ratio of close to 1 because in any case earthquake is much higher uh, five times higher than what we are designing for so if that higher earthquake comes those members which are having higher demand to capacity ratio those will yield first and once those members yield there will be a chain reaction there will be a sequential type of failure rather all the members should yield simultaneously so if these members are yielding simultaneously then the center of stiffness and center of uh, mass will remain more or less at the same location and in that case this chain reaction or torsional behavior will not get amplified then coming to the analysis procedures uh, kulkarni sir uh, how much time at what time i should finish uh, around 4:30 around 4:30 okay okay so still i have 20 25 minutes i can take all right i will plan accordingly so four types of analysis are currently available one is what we call linear static procedure or equivalent static load method this is a single mode analysis and here we compute the base shear and then that base shear we distribute along the height and here also we take into account the period of vibration that period of vibration may be obtained um, using empirical formula or it can be obtained from dynamic analysis also but in any case we have to scale the base shear to the period which we are obtaining using uh, empirical formula that's why we call it as a static method then second method uh, is which is more common or most commonly used it is linear dynamic procedure what is linear dynamic procedure here the model remains linear whatever modeling we have discussed in the morning that was related to linear modeling so the model of the structure remains linear but the force or the earthquake effect we can consider dynamically and two possibilities are there we can do a mode superposition using response spectrum we can do a mode superposition using time history or we can do a direct integration time marching scheme we also call it linear time history analysis lthe so three types of analysis are possible here one is direct integration where we solve we analyze the whole structure using time history second one is we first decompose the structure into number of modes we analyze each mode we represent each mode by a single degree of freedom system we analyze that single degree of freedom system using time history we are still using time history and then we superimpose those the third one the most simple is that we use a response spectrum rather than using time history we are using a response spectrum and as i explained we calculate the response of the structure in different modes corresponding to that period in those modes and then we superimpose that response using srss or cqc so that is the simplest linear dynamic uh, procedure which most commonly we use but all the three methods will give you close results so if you do mode superposition method using response spectrum or mode superposition method using time history if the time history is matching with the response spectrum these will result in <coughs> sorry more or less similar results you you can check that then we have their counterparts 
in nonlinear analysis when we make nonlinear model of the structure we can perform a static analysis which we call nonlinear static procedure this is nothing but the pushover analysis the so called pushover we are not covering pushover analysis in this talk but maybe sometime in future we can cover that we have covered this in our earlier talks also some of you may be familiar also because now we have started using pushover analysis in our design offices as well some of the designers are using that so non linear static procedure or the pushover analysis as uh, we talked in case of linear static method this is single mode non linear method here we are considering non linearity but we are considering response in fundamental mode only some people have tried multi mode pushover analysis but it is it is not very successful it is not very popular so uh, pushover analysis or non linear static procedure is mostly single mode analysis then we have the most rigorous analysis which is available that is non linear dynamic procedure mode superposition is not valid in case of uh, non linear methods because we know superposition is valid only in case of linear system in non linear system superposition is not valid so there we have to we cannot do mode superposition we have to do direct time history analysis on the non linear model so non linear dynamic analysis has to be time history analysis so this is nltha non linear time history analysis it cannot be done using response spectrum pushover analysis can be done using response spectrum analysis and that's why it is more popular because uh, it is simple it requires less effort and it can be done using uh, uh, response spectrum all these options are now available in our software you can use that modeling linear modeling i have already discussed now one thing i want to discuss in today's talk is how to select ground motions and scale them so selection and scaling of ground motion is one task which is required if i want to perform a non linear time history or even a linear time history analysis i should select the ground motions so the source of the ground motion is of course the past records so we can uh, have the earthquakes recorded in the past so those are the best and as far as possible we should use those records which have been recorded on the same type of site same type of site means the similar layering of soil and similar distance from the source because both we have seen in uh, while uh, discussing response spectrum that the shape of the response spectrum depends on or the characteristics of the ground motion depend on the source site distance and also the site conditions local site conditions and it also depends on the magnitude so as far as possible if i can get a similar magnitude as i am expecting uh, to occur in the vicinity of my site same distance and same type of soil if i can get that record i should use that but that is very rare you will normally you will not be able to find these conditions matching although now we have thousands of records available but still those are not enough then we have the second option what we call simulated accelerograms these are being generated using different uh, analytical procedures but not very successful still these are not considered to be good enough for the purpose of analysis and then the third thing is which we were using earlier now it is not recommended it is artificial spectrum uh, artificial accelerogram so these are spectrum compatible accelerograms which we develop totally artificially we just have the response spectrum and corresponding to any response spectrum we can generate a ground motion totally artificially but these artificial ground motions are known to have characteristics very different than the real earthquakes in some cases these will be highly conservative in some cases these can be even non conservative so that's why people say that we should not use artificial accelerograms earlier 10 12 years ago we were using that but now we do not use artificial accelerograms we should go for recorded accelerograms as far as possible so we have to take recorded accelerograms of course these these accelerograms are the best 
but the problem is that these are generally not available and uh, especially for this combination of magnitude distance and soil conditions it becomes very difficult to get ground motions satisfying this combination so what should we do we may take uh, recorded accelerograms and we can scale those accelerograms to the targeted response spectrum how we can do that for example here in this blue color this is our response spectrum for which we want to design our building or which we are using to design our building or which is there at our site so this is the target response spectrum and i have selected a time history which is giving me response spectrum like this which is given in the red color now one simple uh, scaling can be in terms of pga so i scale this such that this pga or zero period acceleration this matches what i see here from here i have shifted it up i have multiplied this by a factor and such that this matches here but the matching of pga you can see doesn't mean that uh, the response spectrum has also matched response spectrum of this uh, scale time stream may be much lower and sometimes it may be even higher so it, it is not the correct way or uh, the reliable way of scaling the response spectrum the other possibility is that i scale it corresponding to the period of my structure so what i am doing rather than scaling it with the zpa i am scaling now with respect to the sa at t1 what is this sa at t1 t1 is the fundamental period first period that is fundamental period of my structure and i am matching with that scale factor so what is happening at some places it may be low or lower than the target spectrum at some places it may be higher than the target spectrum and uh, using one time history it is not possible to match it with our response spectrum so what we will do we will take a number of time histories in such a way that the mean of these uh, response spectra number of response spectra should not be below the target response spectrum individual response spectrum may be below at some places it may be above some places but the their mean should not be below this response spectrum at any place so that's how we can scale it so we have done this scaling with respect to t1 so we get this sa t1 and this is scale factor so this is a better scaling way where we take the scaling with respect to sa t1 so uh, just to give you an example this was the response spectrum response spectra which we have selected uh, and let us say we want to is, uh, scale these with respect to one second period let us say my structure is having a period of one second and uh, um, in zone 5 if i take uh, the target response spectrum then you know the value of sayg in our code will be Uh, one upon t, so at one second that will be one, and zone five I am multiplying it by z. So for serviceability earthquake, it will be 0.36 g. So I can scale all the ground motions here, but when I am scaling here, you can see that only at this point those are matching. Other points there may be large dispersion. So you see here there is so much dispersion here, and the median of these or mean values of these may not match with my uh, period. or with my response spectrum at other periods it is matching at this period but other periods it may not match so in that case what i have to do is i have to go for a spectral matching of the ground motions so in a spectral matching of the ground motions we alter the frequency content of the response spectrum also although it is not advisable to i mean it, it is not recommended to do that but in many cases we do not have uh, any choice because if i select the best available uh, ground motions to me and try to scale their response reduction factor like this still i am not able to match with the target response spectrum although i have considered a large number of ground motions here so in that case i do the frequency domain spectral matching and by doing this frequency domain spectral matching i can bring any response spectrum close this is better than the artificial earthquake 
but it is somewhere in between the recorded earthquakes and the artificial earthquake. So I'm trying to bring it as close to my um, uh, target response spectrum as possible. Okay, now in case of a structure, there are multiple modes. These multiple modes have periods. So I have to decide a range of interest. So that range of interest, this is the fundamental period. And when I am performing nonlinear analysis, then it is this fundamental period increases because my structure becomes flexible. So this is my effective period. And this is the period which is giving me, let us say, 90% participation. So corresponding to that, I have calculated this period and that this range, which is there from the effective period to this higher mode period, this range is important. At least my, uh, tar my uh, selected time histories should give me response spectrum close to the target response spectrum in this range. Okay. I will skip this conditional mean spectrum. Yeah. Another important uh, method of scaling is what we call based on SA average. So SA average is the average geometric mean of response spectra, uh, uh, geometric mean of the spectral values between the period range which we have discussed. So the effective period to this high mode period in this range, and this can be roughly taken as uh, 0.2 t to 3 t, where t is the fundamental period. So in this range, we will calculate the average spectral acceleration like this. This pi is representing uh, the uh, geometric mean. So geometric mean of these spectral ordinates and these spectral ordinates are considered at 0 0.01 second. So each 0 0.01 second, I will take these spectral values, take a geometric mean of these, and that mean I will use to scale the ground motions. And it has been observed that if I scale the ground motions using this, and if I'm doing this at some places, the ground motions may be higher and some places it may be lower, but still the overall response is quite close. So with this uh, scaling factor, I can avoid the need of a spectral matching and still I can get the response, which is quite close. I just wanted to share some of the websites where these spectral, uh, or sorry, these ground motions are available. These are some of the websites. Uh, India, for Indian uh, time histories also, we, our department maintains a website by the name PASMOS. And uh, you can go to this link, link is uh, already there. I will share the PDF copies of this presentation. So you can see these links from there. Uh, this peer database is one of the best databases where most of the information is available. So you can, this is Japanese uh, website. So Japanese ground motions are available here. So you can use this uh, European or Japanese or American, and you can select time histories from there because uh, from Indian database alone, you will not get the sufficient uh, number of ground motions which are matching with your conditions. So you have to look for ground motions from other countries as well. And you should have access to all these uh, ground motions. These are mostly in public domain. So you can, you have to just maybe register and then you can download the uh, ground motion records as per your requirement. Then there are some software which uh, help you in selecting the ground motions. So in these software, you can give your uh, response spectrum, the target response spectrum corresponding to which you are looking for the ground motions. And you can give the value of M, R and site conditions, and it will give you uh, those ground motions which are closest to your search. So you can get here um, and then you can do spectral matching. So Seismo match is uh, one such software where, and you, you can get a complimentary copy of this also. And using Seismo match, you can uh, 
match the time history using wavelet transformation. So this reduces the distortion caused in the process of, uh, th this is the most uh, recent technique, the most advanced technique, by which we can uh, modify the recorded ground motions to match a target response spectrum without disturbing their uh, dynamic characteristics much. So a number of software are available. Quake Manager, this is also, this is uh, by Jam and uh, it is available uh, openly uh, in public domain. You can look and uh, this is how it looks like. So the, these are easy. And uh, NIC Berkeley website, here also you can get uh, software which you can use to process. Okay, then this is another one developed by Professor VK Gupta from IIT Kanpur. So it is also available, the wave gen, uh, it is available here also. It is similar to uh, this first one, Seismo Match. So Seismo Match is also based on uh, uh, this wavelet transform. This wave gen is also uh, based on wavelet transform. So you can download this also and use it. Okay, so I think, yeah, last thing, this drift. So, um, we discussed that our code gives 0.4% uh, limit on the story drift. But the problem with IS 1893 is that it has written that this 0.4% is for unfactored load. Okay. So one of the conditions given there is that you need not to do BB bar by BB correction while determining the displacement you can use the analytically obtained period. Now, why so? Why we don't require uh, the scaling in case of displacement? The reason is simple. There is uncertainty about the period of building. Okay, so when you are reducing the period, actually the spectral acceleration increases. But the shape of uh, response spectrum is such, if you plot the displacement spectrum, then the displacement is increasing with increasing period. So if you make an error causing longer period, then you will be underestimating the force, but you will be overestimating the displacement. So in our normal analysis, what we do, we always get a flexible structure. We always get longer period. That's why the empirical formula is always giving a shorter period. And that's why we get the higher spectral acceleration and higher base shear. But the displacement will be always higher for the longer period. So while calculating the displacement using the analytically obtained uh, period, we are already on conservative side. So we need not to make it further conservative by increasing it by the factor which we are using for the base shear. So that is not required. So that's why the code says that this scaling, BB bar by BB scaling, that is required only for force calculation. It is not required for displacement calculation. Displacement using your uh, analytically obtained period is already on conservative side. So we don't need any further conservatism there. Secondly, if you recall the equal displacement principle which we were talking, which displacement our code is giving? Our code is giving this displacement, okay, which is corresponding to the design force. Actual displacement is this, even for our inelastic structure, we can reduce the force, but what is equal displacement principle showing? Equal displacement principle is showing that the displacement will be equal. And in case of equal energy principle, the displacement of inelastic structure will be even longer. So even if, if we assume that the equal displacement principle is valid and the displacements of uh, the elastic and inelastic structure are same, then the displacement we will obtain will be corresponding to this force. The force we have reduced by R, so our displacement has also been reduced by R. So to get this maximum displacement or total inelastic displacement, I have to multiply this displacement also by R. So the displacement which I am getting 
from our normal analysis where i have used reduced forces that displacement is not the maximum displacement of my structure that is rather a reduced displacement so to bring it to the maximum displacement level i have to multiply this by response reduction factor r and uh, when i multiply this by r i will get the actual displacement of my structure in the morning somebody raised this question that should be while doing p delta analysis because we should use the actual displacement using p delta analysis uh, we are doing when we are doing p delta analysis for the reduced force then um, uh, actually we are underestimating the p delta forces so yes that is right if i want to calculate the actual p delta effect then i should perform p delta analysis also corresponding to the real delta and real delta will be r times the delta which i am getting from my analysis so one way of analysis could be that i perform p delta analysis for no unreduced uh, uh, lateral load that means without reducing the earthquake force by delta sorry by response reduction factor i should perform the p delta analysis and then whatever forces i am getting in the member those i should reduce by r rather than reducing the lateral force by r so if we are reducing the lateral force by r and we are applying that force then i end up underestimating the p delta effects because the relationship between earthquake force and p delta effect is not linear it is a non linear analysis we also call it geometric non linearity so it is a geometric uh, non linear problem if i perform the p delta for the reduced force or i perform the p delta analysis for the uh, elastic force and later on i divide my member forces by response reduction factor r the results will be different the second case is going to give me the higher forces so a more logical way uh, is to perform the p delta analysis also on unreduced displacements or multiplying the displacement by r same thing is applicable in case of gaps between adjacent buildings so i should multiply both the buildings with the corresponding response reduction factors and uh, then if i add i will get the separation if my floors are at the same level then i can uh, consider the code allows some pounding uh, there because if the floors are at the same level those are hitting each other directly then the difference then the damage will not be much in that case i will uh, i can use the gap as half of this what is given in the code and keep in mind this 0.4% in our code is at the reduced load the actual earthquake displacement will be r times this so that corresponds to actually 2% which is at par with the, the other codes at db not at se but at db so this should be used at db okay just to give you an idea uh, i have here i have uh, taken these values from asc7 so uh, this is we can say our important factor 1.5 this is our importance factor 1 and this we can say importance factor 1.2 so you can see here the maximum drift for importance factor 1.5 is 1.5 even for ordinary buildings you will see so it is other than masonry shear walls means uh, frame buildings so there it is higher but for 1.2 factor it is maximum value is 0.2 so we can see that the maximum value is of the order of 0.2 average value if we take that is 0.2 so usually more than uh, 2% 0.02 we should not allow in case of euro code it is even more stringent so here the maximum value permitted is uh, 0.1 that is 1% uh, sorry 0.01 that is 1% and a reduction factor this this factor we we can apply reduction factor for different classes which is 0.5 uh, for class 3 and 4 and 0.4 for uh, 
sorry, 0.4 for class three and four, and for class one and two, it is 0.5. Okay, so this point, this two percent or 0.4 percent, that should correspond to dV. Okay, I think I will stop here, and now we will discuss, um, or Payal will take up demonstration of uh, that autograph building. And maybe before that, she will take up an exercise in which she will uh, compare two methods of modeling shear walls using uh, shell element and using uh, white column. Okay, so thank you. I will stop here. So I will stop sharing. Thank you, sir. Uh, Avi, can you introduce Parik uh, Payal? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, you are there. No, I have got. Okay. She has sent me. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. So, friends, I am happy to welcome and introduce Ms. Payal Gwalani. She is. PhD student in the Department of Earthquake Engineering, IIT Roorkee, working uh, with and the joint supervision of Professor Yogendra Singh and Professor Humberto Varum, Professor, professor at the University of Porto at Portugal. She has a master's from UNIT Nagpur and bachelor's from Symbiosis Pune. She received two awards from director of UNIT for being the topper in her branch in master's. She has received the gold medal from late president Pranab Mukherjee for just my being topper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, I am getting the photos in between. Yeah, received gold medal from late president Pranab Mukherjee for being topper of her batch. And yeah. this is the last set. This is not this set. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I'll uh, request now uh, Payal to start her presentation. I'll just stop share. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes. Yes. And uh, yes. is the screen visible? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the last session of today's webinar. Uh, my name is Payal Gwalani, and uh, today I'm going to focus on how to do linear analysis and design of RC buildings in ETABs in SAP 2000. And uh, this I will go through. Now, this is the flow of today's presentation. These are the steps that we need to perform to complete linear analysis and design of a building using any software. So the, uh, today's presentation, I'm going to continue some of the steps I'm going to show you on the slide and some of the steps I'm going to show you in the ETAPS model. So for the ETAPS model, I have prepared two uh, different types of ETAP model. One is a autograph building model that was uh, given to us. So it's a 55 story tall building. That model is already analyzed and designed using these steps. I'm going to show you the results of that model and discuss the results and outcomes of that. And at the same time, for showing different modeling approaches, I'm going to show a model, a simple 2D model to understand the modeling of different structural elements and how to perform different steps of seismic loading. Uh, so, uh, it's my understanding that most of the people who are attending the seminar are familiar with the ETABS or SAP or other software. So, my major focus today is on how to do modeling of different elements and how to perform different uh, seismic loading steps. Uh, that includes equivalent static analysis, response spectrum analysis, and time history analysis, how to check the drift check, and how to perform the load combinations and other stuff. I'm not going to focus on how to define material properties and how to start a new model, uh, or how to apply dead load on gravity loads and other stuff. So. 
uh, modeling of frames. Usually, if we model in any software, we prefer to go for a center line model. And different there are different ways to model each element in a different softwares. Uh, but this element should uh, should indicate or rather it should uh, display uh, the behavior of the element that uh, uh, it should it should study the element of that we are studying it should analyze or it should predict the behavior of the element that we are studying so uh, for in case of sap and etaps we prefer frame section to model uh, frame line element to model beam and column in case of wall, there are two mod methods to model wall elements. One is using a white column analogy. The other is thin shell element. Uh, thin shell element. I'm going to demonstrate both of these methods today. Uh, the fourth is how to model slab. The one way to model slab is using a shell element. The other is if the slab, if the in-plane stiffness of slab is not that important to be considered in the model, it can be modeled the, as a rigid diaphragm. Now, uh, along with the members that need to be modeled, the important thing is uh, to, con okay, I'll do this later. First, I'll show you. Okay. This is a uh, uh, ETAPS model that earlier today, I made this ETAPS model. This is a 10 story building, 10 story uh, shear wall. And this I have modeled using white column analogy. I'm gonna back, Step all the steps that I have used to model this. First, what I've done is I've taken uh, using, using section designer, using section designer, I have modeled a column uh, member. And this column member is along uh, the length of this column member is 400, uh, sorry, four meters. And the thickness I have, uh, uh, thickness of the chair wall I've taken as 200 mm. Now this element uh, shear wall I have modeled using section designer in ETAPS and I have kept this uh, just to get an idea this is a concrete column and reinforcement to be designed. I here just to get an idea I have kept first all the section uh, property modifiers as one. Now how to model this uh, ETAPS uh, this shear wall in ETAPS model is it's simple as modeling a frame member using this. I have modeled this from here to here. Now this is how I have modeled a column. It's simple, this is how we model a column. Now, if you see the extrude view, You can see how this is modeled. This looks like a wide column, which is having a uh, four meter length and the thickness is 200, uh, 200 mm. Now, how to connect this shear wall to the neighboring elements? For this, what I have done is, there is one option is you model a beam at the top of each, at the top of each story, at the top of shear wall at each story. This beam, can have any properties. Let's stick to the beam's thickness to be equal as the shear wall. And the depth can be made anything. Here, I have not changed any of these properties, not given anything uh, here, this here. Now this beam, I'm gonna model this as a rigid diaphragm. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna assign rigid offset to this beam. So this I have done is, I will go to assign frame, and from here, end length offsets. So from here, I have defined end length offsets along the length of the beam. So this, I have defined this as 4,000 mm. It is completely rigid. And the frame self-fit option is based on the clear length. The uh, clear length is the portion where we are not considering it as rigid. So this automatically, it will consider the self-fit of this beam as zero. Now using this, you can see I've already done this end length offsets is there. So this is a rigid beam. And I have applied a load here, a lateral load here, which is a few thousand kilonewton. And I run this model. 
this is a very simple step how to model shear wall using white column analogy. Now, if you see the mode shape of this uh, of this shear wall, the first mode period is corresponding to is seven point nine four, and it is the out of plane moment. Uh, it is the first mode shape which in which the stiffness is very less. So the first mode is corresponding is in the out of plane direction. Now the second mode is also uh, is a combination of out of plane and uh, twisting. The third is like the same. Now this fourth mode is the in plane translation mode. Now, at the same time, I have modeled uh, shear wall using shell element. Now, how to model shear wall using shell element is uh, I've gone to define, and there is this option of wall section. So now I've defined shear wall using wall sections. Here, shear wall is modeled as shell th uh, thin element, and I've assigned thickness to the same properties to this shear wall also to compare the results of this model with the one with that we are guessing, uh, getting using white column analogy. Now, this is modeled here. Uh, once you model this shear wall using thin shell element, how to draw this is, I'll just show you an example of how to draw shear wall. This. Now, this is how we draw shear wall in one story. Two other stories as well, using this rep to other stories. And this, I think when we use uh, one thing, when we model shear wall using thin shell element, this model can has to be assigned a peer label in order to get the bending moment and the forces in the shear wall. So what I've done is clicking on this shear wall, let's go to assign shell and peer label. This peer label, if we assign this peer label, what this peer label does is it computes the forces and gives outcome of those results at the top and the bottom of the shear wall at each story. So now we can view the results, the bending moment and the shear forces coming onto the shear wall using this. Now the next important step in case of shear wall is uh, using modeling shear wall using thin ele ele shell element is wall meshing options. Because since this is a finite element analysis, the discretization of the element uh, will help in getting the re uh, optimized results. So here, just for an uh, uh, just for to the display, I am using the mesh sizes. Let's say uh, ten on the horizontal uh, and ten on the vertical. So these steps I have followed here, and now I am going to run this analysis. So what I'm going to compare in the two models and what is interesting to see the results in the two models is what happens to the mode period. Now, if you see in this case, the first period was out of plane direction and the period was around 7.94 and the in plane period and the period corresponding to the translation in X is around 0.4. Now, if you see in this model,
the first period corresponding to translation in y direction is 7.89 and if you see the next few mode shapes these are a different combinations now we can get a better view of the mode shapes using uh, going to display show tables structure output and here i select the modal information so from here i can get a better understanding of the modal information of what is happening so this results i have copied it here now this is the modal shape is the response of the of the shear wall when it is modeled as a white column analogy now if you see the first mode is in translation in y and the mass participation in that direction is 6.64% uh, and the period is 7.945 now if you compare the same thing using in which uh, model in which shear wall is model this shell element and uh, let's say the meshing is 5 5 cross 5 the mass participation in the uh, y direction in the first mode is 61% so the mass part is and the period is even 7.8 and when you see the meshing is, if I uh, discretize the meshing fire further, now this period, there is slight change in the period and it reduces to 7.881 and the mass participation also uh, reduces slightly. So here what we can uh, observe is shear wall when it is modeled as shell element, the this is the rigid compared to what we obtain the period that uh, shear wall model is the shell element is comparatively rigid to what we have obtained as shear wall model is uh, white column analogy and if you see the period corresponding to translation mode uh, in this model there is only slight difference uh, this period is 0 0.401 now this period is 0.399 using shell element and uh, uh, if we further discretize also, this period is uh, same only. But this is just to have an idea of how shear wall is modeled separately using two different methods. Now, what happens if we model shear wall in combination with a frame? One thing is, uh, sorry, bending moment. I'll show you the bending moment here. Now this is the shape of the bending moment diagram and you can see the different in-plane uh, bending moment that is acting on the shear wall and different stories. Now we can compare what is giving us from this white column analogy. Now, if you see, there is some difference in the bending moment diagram, which is obtained from the two models. This is a clear model uh, this way in which there is a decrease in the loads at the top. If you see, this is 3000, 6000, 9000. Now, if you come here, there is change in the bending moment throughout from here. So this highlights what is the difference if we model shear wall using a thin element and using a white column analogy. Now, same can be observed if we model shear wall in combination with the frame. So now what we have done is I have modeled a 2D building in which there is frame shear wall interaction. In the first model, I have modeled uh, columns. Uh, the design on the two columns and the forces in the two models are the same. In this model, the beams and columns are modeled as uh, uh, beams and the columns are modeled as line sections. Same is the case in the other model. Here I have assigned cracked section properties to each frame section. So now if you can see, in case of columns, 
these catch section properties uh, sorry these catch section properties i have taken from is code uh, 1893 so here i have assigned uh, bending uh, property modifiers along uh, in uh, bending in uh, zx sorry axis second axis and the third axis x direction and y direction same is in the case of beams also this property modifier is corresponding to 0.35 in both the directions and is case of shear wall the property modifier that we are uh, assigned is 0.7 that is given in uh, that corresponds to corresponds to the factored load in case of uh, given in is one six seven double zero this so the same i have modeled here the property modifier I've assigned to this one and this shear wall is meshed into 10 uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, fibers along the x direction and 10 fibers along the y direction and there is same method i followed here and here and if you can see there is still difference in the period and shape and the moment of vibration uh, difference in the uh, mass vibration and uh, difference in period now this period comes from the dif uh, from different stiffness because if you see to compute period it depends upon stiffness and it depends upon mass now mass in this case in both the cases rather it is the same the mass is coming from the dead load which in this case of the model is point around 424 and it's the same in the other model same so the mass that is there that uh, that is used in the computation of the period is the same so the difference in the period comes due to the difference in the stiffness and we can observe here also Now this is the first mode which is in the y direction and if you go to show tables from here you can get that the first mode is corresponding to y direction in which 65% of the mass participates and the period is around 1.308 and the next other modes are also in the out of plane y direction and the first mode that comes in the translation along x direction is the sixth mode in which the mass participation is around 67% and the period is 0 0.091. Now if we compare the same with this model, in which shear wall is modeled using white column analogy, you can see the first uh, uh, first mode mass participation is sixty nine percent. So the mass participation, if we compare in both the models, it is less in the mod model in which shear wall is modeled as shear shell element, and it is more in the model in which we consider shear wall is modeled as white column analogy, and the period is also more. Now, if you see the period corresponding to translation along x direction, this period is around 0 0.106 and the mass participation is 70%. Now, if we keep on changing the meshing, the period, so I've already run the analysis for uh, different types of meshing in which I have discretized the in the first case, the, there is no meshing in the model in which the shell element has no meshing. The other is in which the meshing is 10 fibers along the x direction, 10 fibers along the y direction. And in the third, it is 20, 20. So I have compared what, uh, what happens to the period and the mass participation in different modes. 
uh, okay. sorry, in the different models. So this is where shear wall is modeled as white column analogy. Now, if, if we compare this to the pre results, which is obtained in case of shear wall, which is modeled as shell element, but no meshing. If you see the period corresponding to out of plane uh, translation in the, uh, in the Y direction, this period is comparatively close but if we see the further periods in which translation is in the direction of the force and in the direction of shear wall, these periods are very far away from each other. This is 0 0.106 and this is 0 0.089. Interestingly, if you see the mass participation in the first mode and uh, compare the, the mass participation is the same. If we have no meshing, that is default option in this, the mass participation in the two models in which shear wall is modeled as white column and it is modeled as shell, this mass participation is the same if there is no meshing, but the periods are nowhere close to each other. Now, if we go on increasing the meshing, if we go on refining the meshing to get the period very close to each other. So now if I refine the meshes 10 cross skin and the period in this case, it's there is slight reduction period and this goes from 1.327 to 1.308. But the period in the translation along X direction, this comes a little closer to what is obtained using white column analogy. Now, as we go on further finishing this me mesh, this period comes more and more closer to what we have obtained using white column analogy. So by default, the shear wall model, which is in which shear wall's model is shell element in the model, building model is compared as rigid to, uh, to the building model in which shear wall's model is white column analogy. So as we go on refining the mesh, this period becomes comes closer to what we are obtaining using uh, this white column method. Now let's see how bending movement distribution is given in the two models. It's, it's expected since the period are very different in the two models. So the bending moment that we obtain from the two models would it be very close, would be a little different. Now here you can see the shear wall models uh, gets the bending moment as expected and it is further reducing as we go at the top. So this bending moment corresponding at the base is around 2827. Now if we compare the same to what is obtained in this model, Now this is 2728 here and this is 2827 and as we go on seeing uh, the bending moment in which we are obtaining using white column analogy is less than what we obtain using the building model in which it is modeled as shell element. This bending moment is 1573 and here it is more than this, 1659. One, and at the same time, if you compare the bending moment in the column, I'm gonna do one thing here. Let's not see the bending moment in case of shear wall and see what happens in case of columns. Now this shows the bending moment diagram in case of how uh, this is distributed in columns. And if we compare here in this model, a 
okay so yeah, here is that uh, maximize view in case of columns cannot be seen because this is modeled also as column but we can read the values from this uh, table and this value is corresponding somewhere near 10 well, is it possible to select only those columns which we want to show and then plot the bending moment diagram? Yes, sir. I can do that. In this column. Okay. In this column, at the bottom, the bending moment is around 8.8 .8 kilonewton. And at the top, this is uh, in the com uh, minus 1.84. And if we compare the same results, Here it is 11 at the bottom and at the top it is 2.29. So what happens in case of frame shear wall interaction in uh, using uh, in which shear wall is modeled as shell element and one which it is modeled as white column analogy is the bending moment that is distributed, the distribution changes. If we compare the moment in case of shear wall is more if it is modeled as shell element and uh, bending moment in case of column, it is more when it is uh, when shear wall is modeled as white column analogy. So this shows how the interaction uh, affects the bending moment distribution in both the models. It affects the period. It affects uh, the other uh, parameters also. So if if you are done with this part, then we will have a small commentary I will like to have here, then we'll go. So before you go to the next problem, please uh, let me know when you are done. Huh? Uh, sir, sir, I am done here. Okay, okay. So to conclude, I mean, the idea of uh, having this comparison was to uh, just to show you that if you model the shear walls using uh, two methods, what difference it will make and which one is uh, more accurate. So uh, you have seen that in case of finite element model using shell element, there is an issue. And the issue is that the mesh should be sufficiently small. If the meshing is not a small, then you will get a rigid structure. And uh, if you are using uh, element of the full story size, then it is very rigid. You have seen that the period in that case is much smaller. And as you are increasing the fineness of the mesh, you are dividing in, into larger number of elements, it will approach towards the correct results. So in case of uh, uh, wide column method, you are getting the exact stiffness matrix in any case. So there, the results will be more accurate. But in finite element, you have to have sufficient masses, sufficiently fine mesh. And uh, how much is sufficient? This question is again uh, varies from problem to problem. So you have to perform a sensitivity analysis and the, any finite element problem, whether it is shear wall or any other problem, the rule is that you should divide the, or you should increase the number of elements gradually and see how the results are changing. And when the results stop changing, that mesh you have to consider. So minimum a 10 by 10 mesh in uh, a story are required. So you have seen when we are doing uh, 20 by 20 meshing, then we are reaching quite close. But uh, if we are not uh, using sufficiently fine mesh, then the results we will get uh, will not be correct. In case of uh, shear wall model using finite element, it will give a much stiffer model. And as a result, the period is reducing and it is attracting more force and the bending moment in shear wall is more and the bending moment in the columns is reducing. So if we are using a white column, it is better. But the advantage of finite element is that in white column, you cannot consider opening. So if there are openings uh, in irregular fashion, if it is uh, a coupled shear wall where the openings are arranged uh, vertically, then you can do that also using white column. So a white column modeling is easier. 
it is preferable it gives you more accurate results but it is applicable only in limited cases it cannot be applicable in all the cases on the other hand finite element modeling you can use for any geometry you but there should be sufficient uh, number of uh, uh, elements you have to mesh it sufficiently finely then only the results will approach the correct result okay so pile you can take up uh, the next problem okay. the next part in case of modeling is to model the rigidity of the joint now this is the major portion where we get questions from different people that how to model rigidity in case of the joints so uh, i think in the earlier sessions we have already learned how to model what is given in ac 41 2017 sir has explained uh, this method uh, this uh, concept so how to model this in case of e tabs or sap is let's take this model now uh, how to consider joint rigidity in case of beams and columns is we can select all the columns uh, sorry all the beams go to assign there is option uh, frame and this n length offsets this uh, option automatic from connectivity based on the frame section sizes that we have already defined it considers what is the size of the joint and based on the connectivity it computes what is the length of uh, automatically it can uh, computes what is the length of the uh, joint that is coming onto the beam and this automatic option and here if we are using ductile detailing and if we are uh, yeah, using this capacity approach of keeping the beams stronger than columns 1.4 uh, uh, sorry uh, strong column weak beam phenomena so in that case the rigid zone factor in case of beams is uh, equal to 0 and similarly i am going to select all the columns and using the same option automatic from connectivity here i am going to assign the rigid zone factor as 1 now depending upon how the design how the variation of uh, bending moment in case of column varies in case of beam different uh, options are there if the bending moment in case of columns is greater than 1.2 times the bending moment in, at uh, sorry bending moment of all the columns meeting at a joint is greater than or uh, bending moment of the beam meeting at the joint by 1.2 times then we consider Uh, the portion of the col uh, col column that is coming onto the joint is rigid. So here, that is why I have assigned this portion as rigid uh, one. And if the beams are stronger, then this beams become rigid. And if it is somewhere between point eight and one point two, half of the length that is coming of the column remains rigid, and half of the length of the beam that is coming remains uh, rigid. So this is one option. Uh, the important aspect in case of modeling of structural elements now one thing is sorry i forgot slab now modeling of slab in a using thin shell element is all the modeling is this almost the same in which how we do is uh, this is the uh, model in which slab is already defined this define frame section properties and slab sections so here you can see there are different slab sections def already defined for this model if you see the properties in which uh, the uh, slab is model is shell thin uh, sorry shell thin element and the thickness is given the procedure remains the same how to, uh, in case of wall how we model the same case is done in slab and this slab is also discretized into different fine meshing from here assign shell and from here i can change the uh, meshing option in case of slab also floor auto mesh options and the other is if you want to find uh, define stiffness modifier in case of slabs or even in case of uh, shear wall we can uh, select that slab or uh, shear wall go to for a uh, shell and from here stiffness modifiers we can assign different uh, stiffness modifier corresponding to bending in plane bending out of plane bending and uh, other modifiers now the important is 
the major problem that if it happens is when his shear wall is sorry the slab is not modeled but it is modeled as a rigid diaphragm if you compare the two software that is etabs and sap by default if you select all the joints in case of sap and go to assign joint and diaphragm options uh, there is an option that says ki uh, assign joint uh, diaphragm from here and apply different diaphragm at different levels so that option is automatically available in case of sap but that is not there in case of etabs which mainly creates a problem and this, uh, people are using etabs for to model a building usually they define the usually they select all the joints and assign a single diaphragm to all the joints but in case of etabs it's a little manual labor but we have to select all the joints in one story and go to assign join diaphragms and apply diaphragm at each story separately so this is one problem if you compare this to two softwares but this is a very important thing now if this diaphragm is different at each story if you see at the joints now this completes what is related to the modeling of structural frame elements now the next portion is how to apply uh, loads so here i'm not going to focus majorly on how to apply dead load and how to apply live load and wind load the other thing that is important that i'm going to consider now is in case of uh, earthquake to define seismic loading on the building model the first important thing is how to uh, to define the mass source where that mass source gives the computes the seismic weight of the building so in this building which is already designed and analyzed i'm going to show you how the mass source is defined so let's go to define mass source so now mass source mass source considers uh, sorry uh, seismic weight is uh, dead load plus some percentage of live load this percentage depends upon what is the intensity of the live load that is coming onto the building so now what the building which i am showing in this building the live load is less than 3 kN per meter square so i have taken dead now in this dead load pattern all the dead loads are there dead uh, wall load floor finish and other dead loads are also in this and there is live load which is uh, which i have given as 0.25 now uh, one more thing is ki in case of calculation of seismic weight we do not consider what is the live load coming on to the roof so i would suggest ki uh, we define two separate uh, live loads at the top story it is uh, roof live or something different which is not considered in case of the uh, application of mass source so here dead load plus per, uh, 2.25% of live load now this completes the portion of how so the model gets the seismic weight now to calculate the uh, base shear coming on to the building due to seismic loading there are different three methods here given an is code that is equivalent static analysis the next is response vector analysis and third is time history analysis so i'm going to demonstrate the steps in the simplified model how to uh, define equivalent static analysis how to come, uh, define response vector analysis and time history analysis but i'm going to show you the results of this uh, this uh, seismic loading in this model it's a little difficult uh, rather impossible to run this model in the short time that we have today so i've already ran this model and uh, i have the results and i'm going to discuss these results uh, and uh, in this presentation and show you the steps on this model So now the first is equivalent static analysis. Now to compute uh, seismic forces due to equivalent static analysis, uh, we are uh, base shear is A H into W. Now A H is in the code it is given as Z by two, I by R, and S A by G. So now if I have to calculate uh, the base shear that is coming onto the building manually, 
what I need is all the information related to importance factor R and other. For the building, for this building, let's say what is what are these value for this building that I've chosen. Now this is the plan of the building at the uh, for, in the platform from one to nine and from ten to fifteen. And uh, let's see the model response of uh, what is the response of the building before going into how to calculate forces using equivalent static analysis. Now this building uh, period I've uh, calculated corresponding to crack section modifiers uh, given in IS16700 corresponding to factored load. So the period that is coming of this building, uh, the fundamental mode in X direction is uh, 6.39 period of vibration and the mass participation is around 60%. Now, the second mode that it is showing period is corresponding to 5.89. This period is in the Y direction and the mass participation is around 55%. Now, if you see the third mode is there is no almost negligible participation in X direction and similarly in Y direction. So this mode corresponds to torsion. So this period is corresponding to torsion. Now, if you see in case of response spectrum analysis, we need to consider the modes till which we get 90% mass participation. So by default, if you go into ETAPS and there is a modal load case, only by default it considers 12 modes. So this number has to be increased till we get 90% mass participation in both the modes to get uh, the complete results of response spectrum analysis. So if you see in this model, I have increased the maximum number of modes to 20. And let's see, till 14th mode, I'm getting 90% mass participation and this period is around 0.29. Now, let's see. the vibration in each fundamental mode. So this is how the building vibrates corresponding to first mode in Y direction. Okay, it jumped. This is the third mode in which there is twisting uh, torsion in column. And this is the second mode in Y direction. Now to compute the forces coming onto this building uh, using manual or uh, software calculation, first we need to know is what is the response reduction factor for this building. Now this building has combination of frames, uh, uh, shear walls, and there are some columns till the ninth floor. So to get an idea or uh, if this frame is to be designed a structural wall system where the entire base shear is carried by structure walls and either it is a 12 system building where there is sharing of the base shear with, between columns and shear walls. First, I have defined a load case, a uh, random load case and obtain what is the percentage distribution in case of columns and in case of shear walls. So if you can see, this can be obtained from display, show tables, joint output. Here I've selected reactions and I've selected here only two cases, response spectrum analysis are of X and Y direction, same two load cases. And from here, for each joint that is at the base corresponding to response spectrum, X, I have obtained what are the forces, distribution of forces. From here, we have to identify which of these joint labels or unique names correspond to the columns and which of these correspond to the beam. So it's a little manual task, but I've done that. And these are the columns which I've, uh, which I've separated them and, the, and uh, these above are the shear walls. Now, if you see the total shear force is around 4,000 and the contribution of columns in this uh, sharing of this base shear is 
only one person in the x direction and if you see in the y direction similarly the contribution of column to base share is 0.5% even less than 0.5% so this building is made, is made uh, a structural wall system in which the entire base share is carried by the shear walls and the frame uh, shear columns uh, are not major contribution so in this case if i have to design this building as a ductile rc structural walls the response reduction factor is 4 so um, now uh, the importance factor i have not given, shown importance factor in this but the importance factor corresponding to this building since uh, is 1.2 from 4 and this is the period of vibration uh, formula that is given in the code it is for buildings with structural walls, this period depends upon the area of the shear wall and at the height also. So this period should be greater than what we are obtaining from infill walls. So based on the properties of the building that we have available, I have computed what is the period corresponding, uh, period coming from the different formulas given in the code. So if we compute the period of this building compared uh, corresponding to bare fit period, it is around 3.55. Now, if we compute the period corresponding to uh, RC structural walls, now in case of uh, this, I've selected all the walls that are at the base of the of the shear of the plan. So, uh, area, this period corresponds to 1.8 and 1.51 in both the directions, and which is less than what we are obtaining from infill. So if I want to perform equivalent static analysis, I'm going to use this period formula for using the, uh, for analyzing the building. But if you see the comparison between what is obtained, the actual period of vibration that is coming from the analysis that we are doing from the model and what is given in the code is very less. So the actual period is responding to 6.4 and what we are getting from this formula is very less, even 1.8. So based on this, I have computed what is the horizontal base shear coming onto the building. Uh, this seismic weight I've taken from the model and I've computed what is the base shear that is coming from equivalent static analysis here. So this is all done using manual calculations. Now I'm gonna demonstrate how this is done in, the, in case of model in this building. Let's go to define load combinations and there are different options. I've already added EQX. Now this EQX, this is if we do not want to consider the uh, eccentricity, this option can be X direction. And this is X direction plus eccentricity. So we can select here and uh, X direction minus eccentricity. So if we select all these three options, it will give you the base shear, which is the worst most combination of these three. Now the range of the story range till which it wants to compute the height. So here I've given from plinth to terrace, the response reduction factor is four. The zone factor in this building is in somewhere in uh, zone three. So this, uh, this I've given as 0.16 period I've manually calculated and have given period here. Now, based upon what is this response spectrum given in, okay, it is showing IS 1893 2002. This is by default, it keeps on changing in ETAS, but this is actually IS 1893 2016. And same is in case of EQY. I've computed the period here and given this value. So this is a very simple step how to define equal, uh, equal for seismic loading using equivalent static analysis in the model. Now, the next is using a uh, response spectrum analysis. The results I'm gonna compare at the later state with all the three models. So the next is how to do it using response spectrum analysis. Now, uh, this is the code spectrum that is given Now, this is the response spectrum that is given in the code corresponding to zone three. So this I have already defined and 
I've made a notepad file of the same model in the model. And if I go to, let's say I show you the steps in this model. Define, function, response spectrum. Now here you can take IS-1893-2016 also. It is already given here. In the latest version, IS-1893-2016 is already inbuilt in this model. So from here also, I can define different properties and this more uh, this response spectrum shape would uh, change accordingly. Defining soil type importance factor and everything. This can be done from here. Another way is if you want to defer, define a response spectrum of your own, which is not, let's say not record uh, to this code or somewhere your own response spectrum, site uh, specific response spectrum. So the other case is using from file, add new function. Sorry, this is user. Add new function. This is period versus frequency value. And from here, so this is one way to add response spectrum here. Now to define response spectrum load case. This is response spectrum load case. Now, if you see the response spectrum that I have defined in this function is, this is the spectral shape multiplied into Z. So the scale factor that I'm going, that I need to use here to compute AH, Z is already defined in case of the response spectrum. So the scale factor computes to be one by two into I by R into G. So this value comes out to be around 1.4715. So the same is defined here. This is response spectrum, the direction of X, acceleration corresponding to U1, and I've defined this as 1.4715. This is here from here, we can define the diaphragm eccentricity. Modal damping is kept constant at all the modes 5%. Modal load combination method uh, is CQC. Now, similarly, response spectrum can be defined in the Y direction also. Like this is uh, one method of defining load case using uh, response spectrum analysis. Now, the third method is time history. So in this case, what I have done here is there is a time history. I have made that time history is uh, compatible to the response spectrum corresponding to zone three in, uh, given in uh, design spectrum given in port corresponding to zone three. So this is the time history that we have selected. Now, how to define time history in a model? Let's go to define function time history from file add new function this is time and function value from here you can see the file first line is to be skipped so let's see this and i'm going to convert this to user define so from here I can define IS code compatible time history. And to define load case, so let's see in this model load case. So this is time history analysis. This is load case is corresponding to time history. This is linear direct integration. Acceleration is corresponding to U1 direction in case of X. This function is IS code compatible and the scale scale factor. Since 
this is made compatible to response spectrum in which z value is already multiplied so to uh, compute ah value the scale factor in corresponding to time history would be the same corresponding to that we got from response spectrum analysis so i applied the same scale factor here so the number of output time steps this can and the output time steps size this controls the amount the time in the, the model takes to run the time history and the number of the points in which you want to save the analysis results this time history has around uh, 3000 points and it is at a distance of uh, it is at a time interval of 0 0.01 if i want to save the results at each time step and this is a 55 story building now this only running a linear analysis in this model will be take more than five or six hours just to run one time history and the result file will be around let's say 50 gb uh, data now to reduce that amount of uh, day storage and uh, to reduce the computation time what i've done is i've uh, selected a fewer number of uh, the time history would be run completely but the results would be shown at a fewer steps so this i've reduced to 500 steps and correspondingly i have changed the number of output temps uh, time step size in case of damping the damping is provided corresponding uh, uh, relay damping is uh, proportional damping is provided here uh, this is corresponding to first mode and the mode in which 90 percent of the mass is uh, participating so if you can see in this model the first mode period is 6.39 and uh, sorry the first mode period corresponding to x direction in which 90 percent mass participation is there is around 0.476 okay uh, this has to be 0.476 i made a mistake here so the period corresponding to vibration in x corresponds to 90 degree uh, sorry 90 percent mass participation and this by default i've kept the same what is available uh, given in e tabs now similarly to define time history in y direction if you see the steps are this different. This is uh, corresponding to U2. And here, the first step uh, period mode should be 5.89. And the uh, period corresponding to 90% mass participation in Y direction, that should be 0.329. So I made a little uh, difference here, a uh, mistake here to run the analysis but it should be corresponding to the first mode in y direction and the mode corresponding to 90 percent uh, in the y direction so this is how uh, we define time history uh, seismic loading in case of models and i have already uh, ran the analysis and got the results which i'm going to show you now Now, this is the base shear that I have uh, corresponding to equivalent static analysis that I'm, uh, we are obtaining from manual calculation. And this is the base shear corresponding to equivalent static analysis that is coming from the model. So now if you see, these results are very uh, close to each other and there is only slight mistake, which is as it should be that the results that we are getting from equivalent static analysis from manual calculation and what the model is giving is correct so we understand how e tabs is computing base shear so this sh should match now if you see the base shear that we are getting from response spectrum analysis this is very uh, this is around this is uh, less than what uh, uh, we are getting from equivalent static analysis and uh, time history analysis is giving us uh, different results. If we make a uh, spectrum compatible uh, time history, these may, uh, results should be like would be close to each other. The slight difference in this uh, results is due to the mistake that I made in computing uh, proportional damping. But if these base shears are, uh, if you can see, there are uh, compare this results. This. Uh, sorry, 
this base shear, if you see, this is from response vector analysis. So here we have a direct comparison of uh, what is the base shear that we are getting from equivalent static analysis, response vector analysis, and time history analysis. Uh, now the code says ki we have to design using uh, uh, using capping on the period. So we have to increase this force to equivalent static analysis uh, base shear and design using this. So if you do that, even in that case, it should exceed what is the minimum design base shear criteria given in the code. And before going for design, the important step is to check for uh, drift. Corresponding to uh, earthquake, this uh, interstory drift, maximum interstory drift value throughout the building height should be less than 0.4%. So to, to perform this check, what I've done is, I've defined a load combination case. To check this base shear corresponding to the design load case. So the design we are doing is corresponding to 1.5 Z. So I've defined a load combination. Uh, it is like EQX diff check. And this applies 1.5 scale factor to EQX and similarly, uh, defining a uh, EQY drift check corresponding to 1.5 EQY. And here I have uh, computed what is the drift maximum interstory drift coming throughout the maximum interstory drift distribution throughout the building model. So if you can see this result here, So in the A for this building, the maximum interstory drift corresp corresponding to uh, uh, design load in X direction is 0.2%, uh, around 0.3%, which is less than 0.4% uh, limit given in the code. And similarly, in the Y direction, this is around 0.3%, less than 0.4% given in this in the code. So this building uh, is no is safe in case of drift check given in the uh, criteria given in the code. Now to run the, this analysis, uh, to complete the design part, uh, to get the final forces to be used for uh, design, we need to apply, apply uh, VB bar by VB correction in case of uh, response spectrum analysis, or if we are going, uh, if we have computed the base shear using time history analysis, then we have to apply this correction factor. So this correction factor I have used here. And once this VB bar by VB correction is already assigned, the next step would be to define the different load combination. So in case of tall buildings, it should be designed for all the load combinations given in IS-1875 uh, part 1 to 5, IS-456 and 1893. Uh, so 1 1.5 dead load plus 1.5 live load. And for all the earthquake load combinations given here and wind load. So this is already defined in these load combinations. If you see this, this is dead load minus live load. And this all load combinations are defined in this case. And once this load combination is done, the next stage would be to go for concrete frame design. In this, uh, let's uh, multi response analysis, number of interactions curve. And uh, here, uh, there is this new option in case of the uh, revised version of ETAS. Previously, it was not there. Uh, do you want to consider strong column peak beam uh, capacity ratio design? If you consider they take this as no, then it computes the forces which are coming onto the beam and column and computes the beam column re capacity ratio based on the actual forces that are coming from the load combination. If you consider this as yes, then it computes the forces that are coming onto the beam and column use uh, to keep the ratio at a joint uh, for, uh, more than 1.4 and uh, yeah, this uh, somewhere more than 1.4. But I would suggest to use this with precaution because 
it's uh, usually this beam uh, beam uh, design for beam column capacity ratio 1.4 it tries to keep 1.4 but it may go beyond 2 and sometimes 2.2 and other, other stuff so it goes beyond 2 sometimes so this creates a little uh, increases the over strength of the building so this is, is I'm considering yes yes this is the uh, other factors given partial safety factors given in case of steel concrete and once this is done the next step would be to complete the analysis using start design uh, to select what are the load combinations to uh, find out the forces and next would be to start the design uh, so this here completes my presentation. If you want, uh, it will take some time to complete the design of this uh, building and uh, we can discuss, uh, dis discuss the outputs of this design file. I think we should take question answers sir, in, from that any almost 256 questions whatever is possible we can take yeah i'm uh, trying to uh, answer in the meantime as much as i can through typing yeah. but yeah, yes but there are there, you are seeing in chat but there is question and answers there are sir, questions okay. since morning so yeah, I, I yeah. looking at that also initially i started with question and answer and then i uh, <laughs> and then i said let let me go for the most recent ones <laughs> are struggling with yeah okay. so a lot of question and answer yeah so pile um, at what stage you are done yes sir okay so okay so how do we start with question answer uh, should we start from uh, the most recent ones or we should start from the first ones because yeah, ideally from answer. first one, but uh, like that depends on you, sir. But we can some book, yeah. have been already answered. Yeah, yeah. So let us see how much time we have and we can start from the last one. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is a suggestion already. Please answer the question asked in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> answer. We want to answer all. <laughs> but you can select, sir, not necessarily all. Yes. So whatever is already answered in the presentation. But also, I have to read it. Let, let me read. Let me, what do I do? Let, let me start from the latest one and we will try to go to cover all of those. Okay. okay so one question is how we reduce the torsion in min, mid landing beam supporting stairs, which need high shear strength. Okay, I think he had put this question earlier also, but then he thought that we are answering last one, so he put it in the last also. No problem. <laughs> this is this is an interesting question, and uh, this we get uh, in different forms. This question we get that because of the compatibility, we get torsion in many places. Somewhere because of equilibrium, and somewhere because of the compatibility. So for compatibility, for equilibrium torsion, wherever uh, the stability of the component is depending on torsion, there we cannot make any compromise. There we have to design for torsion. But where we are having compatibility torsion, for example, at mid landing or uh, um, uh, at the secondary beams we are connecting, we have a choice. We can design for that torsion or we can uh, allow the beam to crack. But in that case, you have to make your client very clear that your beam is going to crack. He should be prepared for that. Otherwise, he will catch it. So uh, better will be that you design whatever forces are coming. Why you want to avoid torsion? If uh, the torsion is there, it is coming, you design for it. OK, another question is, why manually calculated time period is less than the software calculated time period? which we should use. So uh, actually, in the morning, we discussed that there is a lot of uncertainty about stiffness of RCC members. And uh, due to that, there is uncertainty about the period. And the period during earthquake, during a single earthquake itself is not constant. It is changing. 
and uh, when there is an uncertainty what should we do we should uh, um, consider the extreme limits and in case of period there are two extreme limits in one case we are considering the shortest period which is conservative for forces and in another case we are considering longer period which are uh, conservative for displacement and both we do so what we do is that we make a model based on uh, the most uh, flexible stiffness of the elements that will conservatively estimate our displacement and then to take care of the forces we scale the base shear based upon the period which is given in the code so it takes care of both the stream extremes so we should use the analytical period for developing the model and calculating the displacement and for calculating the forces we should use the period given in the code okay then please show us the procedure to model urm in fills in etab i think i have shown that uh, strut so you have to simply connect it using a truss element or you can also use somebody else also ask this question uh, regarding frame element so we can even uh, use frame element but in that case we have to release it my screen itself is changing i've written okay one question is uh, although it is uh, written to pile what we can take up in shear wall you cannot have in plane stiffness modifier while in column you can have how you capture the difference please elaborate so uh, in finite element also i think shell element also there are in plane modifier pile yes sir so, uh, so can you show that now how we can have uh, in plane modifier in case of shell element if i select a shell and uh, let's go to assign shell and from here there are stiffness modifiers so we can assign stiffness modifier corresponding to uh, bending in uh, mn direction in the outer plane direction also in plane and outer plane and interaction also yeah so actually the bending is this this m1 m2 etc are outer plane ha huh. these are outer plane those which are corresponding to bending bending means outer plane and membrane means in plane so in plane bending is taken care of by in plane membrane forces mm. so in shell element the in plane bending is not uh, reflected as bending it is reflected as uh, mm. the normal stresses because bending is also causing actually normal stresses so uh, whatever you want to apply on in plane that you apply on membrane f11 f22 f12 and whatever you want to apply in outer plane that you apply on m11 m22 and m12 okay um, similarly in white column also if hmm. we select uh, not this one white column also if we select a column from go to aside frame from here there are uh, property modifiers from here we can pro provide property modifier uh, moment of inertia corresponding to 2 axis and 3 axis right this is same as in column because in it columns is, it is column so it it is similar to column okay yes so one question it is coming again also i am try to answer but i think it's not clear so i will explain uh, the question is how to average time history results so uh, time average of time history result doesn't mean that we have to average for a single time history you will read the peak results of each time history suppose you are interested in bending moment in a column so you will read the peak value of bending moment from each time history separately and then you will take average of that bending moment it is not averaging the bending moment in the time domain in the whole period so that is not to be done so please be clear Which one I should take? Maybe I have done.
okay if we design for response function of r then is it okay that we will be designing for ductile nature yes if you are using a response reduction <coughs> factor that means you are depending on energy dissipation and when you are depending on energy dissipation the ductility has to be there if you don't want to provide ductile detailing then use r is equal to 1 Same questions are coming again. Let me start going upward. Some of the questions are not clear to me, so I will not be able to answer. Maybe I have to talk. The person should write to me personally, then I have to discuss with him. okay question is how to model by the time i read it hollow circular reinforced concrete section with inner and outer hoop stirrups and provide cross link and connecting inner and outer main reinforcement in section designer and sap okay this is a uh, typical case of uh, what i started in the beginning of uh, the modeling lecture you cannot model everything okay you can model only that software e tabs or sap or any software cannot provide you solution for everything please keep that in mind so if you understand the behavior of a hollow section yourself then you will be able to model if you do not understand the hollow section you will not be able to model okay so now let us come to if suppose you have a hollow uh, column in bridges we are dealing this with uh, quite frequently where the piers are hollow what should we do how you can design it so as far as modeling is concerned there is no much difference you have to model it using a line element moment of inertia will be calculated in the same way only thing is that the section will be hollow circular but the things do not end here you have to design it uh, for uh, axial force bending moment you have to design it for shear and you have to provide adequate ductile detailing so for designing for bending moment and uh, sorry axial force and bending moment interaction you have to develop pm interaction curve their section designer can help you so in section designer you can generate pm interaction curve for this and then you can uh, design the hollow section column but the problem is in shear because the behavior in shear is very different so there is a paper by priestley i can share with you if you write me an email i will share with that you and there he provides the procedure that how the hollow sections hollow circular sections should be designed for shear then confinement is another issue so in case of uh, hollow sections there is the bursting type of failure inside the hollow section so that needs to be prevented so here the confinement will be done through the cross ties and the stirrups encasing the outer reinforcement as well as the inner reinforcement and uh, since nothing is available what i recommend is that you calculate uh, the amount of reinforcement in an equivalent uh, rectangular section and provide at least the same volume of concrete there because the confinement depends on the volumetric ratio we are using uh, for uh, um, as the transverse reinforcement so at least provide the same volumetric ratio uh, which has been given in the code for equivalent rectangular section okay there is one metro station design problem sir one question related to ductile detailing for capacity shear design if the shear force due to over strength plastic moment capacity of column exceeds the shear force obtained from r is equal to 1 analysis which should be considered okay so um, if you are using r is equal to 1 that means you are not 
depending on ductility. In that case, I mean, in bridges, we follow this, that uh, if uh, the shear force due to capacity is more than what you are getting for R is equal to one, you can go for R is equal to one. Whatever forces you are getting for R is equal to one, you can use that in your design. Okay, uh, this question was asked earlier also, but now it has been also maybe by other person. So the question is regarding the spindle beam or the coupling beam between uh, the shear walls above the openings. And there many times uh, there is not adequate space to develop these uh, reinforcement fully. In that case, we should not design it as a coupling beam. In that case, we should design the two walls separately. And this spindle can, the depth of the spindle can be reduced. So in case of uh, uh, the coupling beam or the so-called spindle beam, lesser the depth, less force it, it will attract. Okay, you will not get advantage, but the problem of development of the reinforcement will not be there. So if you design this as uh, slab only, you consider only the slab thickness. Do not consider the full thickness. Okay, uh, enlarge the size of the opening. Then it, it should serve the purpose. Okay, uh, one question is, can you please explain how to define section properties for fictitious beams and rigid arms? Okay. So uh, these fictitious beams are, as the name itself is suggesting fictitious beam. So their size and uh, properties, how we select that? So this is an in important question. So uh, you can select any size. Only thing is that the stiffness of these fictitious elements should be in a particular range. And that range is 100 to 1000 times of your normal beams. So in a particular story, whatever is a typical beam, you take that beam and uh, consider its size, value of E, I, et cetera, in such a way that the stiffness is of the order of 100 to 1000 times. Do not take it very flexible. If you are taking less than 100, then it will not act as uh, rigid. It will become flexible. If you take too high, let us say you take 10 to the power six, then it will cause numerical instability there will be problems in the solution. So what we have seen is that if you take uh, the stiffness of rigid elements, which you want to declare as rigid, if you take stiffness 100 to 1000 times, it is good enough. Is it advisable to design three cellars plus 26 floors in zone two with transfer girders or not? So actually transfer girders we have not covered here. Uh, and these are not also covered with our code also. Uh, theoretically, you can, you can design transfer girders anywhere in any zone. Only thing is you have to ensure that your transfer girder should remain elastic. The plastic hinges should not form in the transfer girder. How you can do that? That you can do it either by making your transfer girder stronger than earthquake. That means you design for R is equal to one or you perform a nonlinear analysis such that your transfer girder is stronger than all other elements which are connecting to it so that the plastic hinges form in other elements and not in the transfer girder. So you have to ensure that the transfer girder should not yield, plastic hinges should not form in the transfer girder during earthquake. Because if the hinges form in the transfer girder, then it will not be able to sustain the columns which are supported on that. So that is not to be allowed. It has to be stronger than all the components above and below which are connecting to it. Okay, how to avoid soft story in multi-story structures? Um, 
I saw one question in the morning also, uh, where uh, the person who has uh, asked the question has written about 2.5 times that earlier provision, which was there in the older code. So um, soft story, and let me tell you, more than soft story, it is the issue of weak story. So soft story is also a problem. It, it causes uh, uh, disturbance in the dynamic characteristics of the building. But more than that, it is yielding of the soft story. So if the soft story fails first, it, if it yields first, it will attract all the damage. And um, uh, that damage will be larger than its capacity, and it is going to collapse. So we have to ensure that the strength of this so-called weak story, I'm not calling it soft story, I'm saying weak story, strength of the weak story should not be less than 80% of the stories above. That we have to ensure. Now, how to ensure that? That's again a problem which cannot be solved by linear analysis. So ideally, you have to go for nonlinear analysis because strength comes into picture only in nonlinear analysis. So if you can perform nonlinear analysis, you can do that. In linear analysis, it is very difficult uh, to calculate strength of a story. We can calculate the stiffness of the story, but that is not enough. We have to calculate the strength. And uh, we have seen that the 2.5 uh, factor works well in case of buildings in which the ground story is open and the upper stories are having masonry infills. So in that case, that 2.5 works. But if in, you are having shear walls in the upper stories and uh, the soft story is due to that, then it is not going to work. In that case, it is not working. In that case, you have to perform nonlinear analysis. So in a nutshell, the conclusion is that sooner or later, we have to learn uh, nonlinear analysis. And uh, in many cases, linear analysis, especially when you are having irregularity and compact complexities in your building, linear analysis will not be enough. You have to go for nonlinear analysis. How to avoid soft story at uh, cellar level, which was bare frame, if there is no scope to add extra shear walls, then how to avoid soft story? Uh, this question is not fully clear to me, but uh, what I understand is that if it is cellar, I mean basement, so if this, that is basement, it, it must be having a lot of shear walls around uh, uh, the basement. So there is no issue of soft story there. You must be uh, saying about cellar means uh, the uh, still tech. Still? Ground floor. Again, okay. Uh, ground floor. Okay, ground floor, which is which is open. So yeah. there we cannot avoid. Don't, don't do that. You have to provide shear walls from top to bottom or uh, you have to increase the size of the columns or you have to provide extra shear walls so that the stiffness and the strength of this so-called open or cellar story is matching or close to what we have above. At least we can add extra thickness to shear walls and dust. Yes, I mean, whatever we do, we provide braces, we provide uh, n number of solutions you can do, but the strength and the stiffness has to be matched. There is no escape from there. We cannot say that I cannot match the strength and the stiffness. That is not acceptable. OK, uh, this issue of uh, gravity columns and uh, matching the deformation compatibility of non-seismic members like gravity, uh, that is very troublesome in uh, our current code. So they have allowed for gravity columns, but the ductile detailing requirement of the gravity columns are even more complex than normal uh, columns. So I will suggest that uh, generally do not recommend, do not use this gravity column detailing, use the ductile detailing and uh, design it and detail it as ductile column, as uh, little load to distinct column. As far as the share of the lateral load is concerned, that will automatically come. The only advantage you get in case of gravity column is in ductile detailing. But then your life is becoming very complex. You have to follow all those uh, codal requirements which are given in the code. So the simplest way is detail all columns as ductile columns. That's what I can recommend. Otherwise, you have to follow the recommendations what are given in IS 13920. 
okay um, in uh, answer to one of the questions i said missing mass correction can be applied and there is a question related to that that what is missing mass correction in uh, many structures for example suppose you are modeling a building with basement so uh, there if you do a uh, model analysis you will not get 90% mass participation the reason for that is that there is lot of mass at the base and the base is not vibrating at all so if you go on increasing the number of modes it will not uh, you will never get 90% so one way of dealing with that problem is that we fix our building at the top of the basement and uh, then we calculate the mass participation and design the upper portion with the base shear uh, calculated at that level alternatively what you can do is you can assume that the mass which is uh, embedded into the soil is moving along with the soil and in such case what should be the acceleration the acceleration in that case will be equal to uh, z by 2 into i okay there will not be any sayg the sayg will be 1 because it is similar to the case which i was talking about zero period acceleration so the mass is simply multiplied by z by 2 into i and that gives you the additional force that force you can consider on that portion additional portion which you have and in etabs and uh, sap there is a command available for uh, missing mass correction so there you can uh, just assign uh, the frequency uh, higher than 33 hertz so when you have frequency higher than 33 hertz on that mass z uh, by 2 into i will be automatically applied Uh, this question is coming many times in almost all our uh, discussions how to entertain releasing moment in secondary beams in stad and implement it in detailing okay <laughs> <laughs> this is a universal question every time somebody is asking this so sorry this is not allowed you should not do this you should not release that is not possible so that release is possible only in your model that release is not possible in the actual practice so as i said two approaches are possible one approach is that you do not allow this release calculate the torsion which you are getting in your primary member and uh, design your member for that torsion alternatively you may not design that uh, beam for torsion but in that case your primary beam is going to have helical cracks this has practically happened with me uh, in one building where i saw a very nicely helical very nice helical shaped uh, cracks uh, but then uh, you should tell this in advance to your client that this type of cracks will occur in the building and uh, those cracks are not going to cause collapse of the uh, building but those are going to happen so he is mentally prepared or if he says no 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 cracks are not allowed then you go for uh, design of uh, main beams for this torsional force okay uh, this is interesting question uh, in case in vertical direction the code says it has already replaced the value of sayg by 2.5 and the acceleration in the vertical direction is 2 by 3 z by 2 into 2.5 into i by r and the question is if we are taking this sayg sa already 2.5 is it not on conservative side if a building is having 4 second period of 4 second and uh, no sorry that that is a different question so uh, uh, whether this 2.5 is conservative or not that, that is one question so uh, what is to be noted here is that in vertical direction columns will be subjected to axial deformations and in uh, axial directions the columns are very rigid so what you can do is you can perform a modal analysis and see which modes are uh, involving vibrations in vertical direction and you will see that uh, the period of those modes will be very very small it will already come into the constant acceleration range if that is very flexible if you are getting very flexible or longer period in case in vertical vibrations you should look at your model and be sure that 
is it because it is is it really like that or uh, there is some issue with the modeling so our experience is that in vertical direction you will in any case you will get your period in uh, the maximum range here i am talking about the period of not of individual beams and columns or individual slab we are talking about the period of the whole building so where you should have significant participation in the vertical direction so please check it most probably it will be in that range only and it is not really very conservative acha then for example a building four second will also have to design sa based on four second sa on one second not one second it is even less uh, so four second when you are saying four second is the horizontal uh, period not the vertical the vertical period will be much less it will be 0.1 or 0.2 second or maybe even smaller than that in which type of structure we should go for period delta analysis in all types of structures always we should go for period delta analysis is it okay to use bending moment values to design for beam and slab from 3d computer model if so the moments are underestimated as compared to conventional code coefficient method for slab design and beam bending moment okay i understand so uh, what happens when we are modeling the slab uh, using shell element and uh, we are meshing the slab but we are not meshing the beam then what will happen the dead load and live load which is applied on the slab will go directly to the um, columns it will directly be transferred to the joints and in that case the beams will not attract uh, moment so one thing we can do is that we have to use the modifiers in slab out of plane modifiers in the slab and secondly uh, the beam should also be meshed along with uh, the slab so that the forces are transferred to the beam but one thing here is important that in all cases we are always over designing our bending moment why i am saying so because we never consider the flange action and uh, in sagging moment the flange action is not giving us much additional capacity but in hogging when the top is in tension or the so called uh, negative moment the slab provides lot of reinforcement so while doing uh, a strong column big beam check we should consider the reinforcement which is there in the slabs also and that will increase the uh, required moment in the column yes another question is regarding the modeling of a staircase portion so invariably in our buildings we are ignoring uh, staircase which is very important a staircase attracts lot of force and uh, during earthquake its response is important and a staircase has to be modeled as it is connected it is to be modeled using uh, inclined flights so the flight should be modeled uh, using inclined uh, area elements inclined shell element so what is critical natural frequency of a structure what exactly the period of a structure signify uh i am not sure what he means by critical uh, i can say natural frequency and uh, period of vibration so natural frequency of a structure a multi story structure is the one at which the, all the floors will be vibrating together so in natural frequency we say when all the floors are vibrating together that means all the floors are reaching their extreme values simultaneously those are coming to their uh, neutral position simultaneously and those are going to the other direction also simultaneously that is called natural mode of vibration and that frequency is called natural frequency and the uh, smallest frequency or the longest period we call the first mode or the fundamental mode fundamental mode also means that uh, which is having the maximum mass participation so that mode is usually the first mode that's why we uh, sometimes also call it fundamental mode this i have taken yes 
so we uh, staircase also have taken can you please discuss detailing of shear walls especially detailing of the central back part in case of walls with boundary element yes actually if time was there i would have uh, um, discussed uh, this portion in more detail in fact i wanted to discuss this portion in uh, more detail because the shear walls we are using in our indian buildings uh, uh, there are many uh, things which are not as per the textbook so first of all shear walls are supposed to take mainly in plane load and all our detailing is based on that so when the shear wall is subjected to in plane moment out of plane moment is very small we can ignore it and in that case confining at the boundary is adequate so if we confine it at the boundaries that is fine but in most of the cases the shear walls will be subjected to uh, bidirectional moment in plane moment as well as out of plane moment in that case it is important that shear walls are also designed and detailed like column so there is there was another question where somebody asked that what is the difference between a column and a shear wall detailing so there is no difference you can uh, design and detail shear walls exactly the same way as you do the column if it is subjected to bidirectional uh, moment then you should use p m1 m2 interaction and that you can generate using section designer for any placement of reinforcement so the placement of reinforcement in shear wall and in column is different that we have to take into account so sp16 cannot be used directly but uh, uh, when this section designer is available you can uh, make arrangement uh, of the reinforcement in any way you want to place then calculate the pm interaction curve for the full shear wall and design it for the interaction of p m1 and m2 uh, you you consider from there and uh, re regarding uh, ductile detailing if there is significant out of plane moment you should provide the confinement in the central portion also and suppose there is a beam which is connected in the perpendicular direction many times what happens that a beam we are supporting on the shear wall and that beam is transferring its moment to shear wall in out of plane direction this case is not covered anywhere but mm -hmm. what i can suggest uh, what i understand from the behavior that you can provide a confined element along the height of the shear wall at the location of the uh, beam and uh, detail it as a column or so some projection with some projection with some projection uh, that may be on both the sides or that may be on one side but there should be a portion uh, which should be designed at column it should be stronger than the beam so strong column big beam also you can follow and you should provide the ductile detailing also so that should be properly confined sir we think we should take one uh, complete separate session on shear wall at least a small I, I, i think i think uh, we can have maybe some saturday we yeah, will yeah. have a two hours discussion one session on shear wall session on shear wall because shear walls our code uh, is giving very little yeah. and that is not enough and in practice we are using shear wall in very complicated yeah yeah, yeah. correct okay what is the difference between gravity frame and moment resisting frame the difference is only in their stiffness so the lateral load resisting frame is very stiff the size of beams and columns is large in gravity frame the size of beams and columns is small now what difference it makes the difference it makes is that the force is distributed in proportion to stiffness so the lateral force which will be resisted by gravity columns or gravity frame will be very less and it is quite possible that you can keep that frame elastic okay because the interstory drift will be controlled by the lateral uh, or the moment resisting frame and you control the drift to an extent that either this gravity frame is elastic because it is very flexible so it will not attract too much of bending moment so it will remain elastic or very limited yielding is occurring here and uh, Uh, for that the criteria is available in is 13920 how how you will ensure it okay uh, one question is could you please explain what exactly code means when it mentions factored and unfactored load uh, frankly speaking i don't know 
Oh, and um, the code has also not set. But my interpretation is this, that what code means is, which I showed with analogy with the TBI also, that it means uh, the factors to be considered at serviceability and factors to be considered at design level. So serviceability factors we can consider for wind, that is my understanding. And uh, the uh, for earthquake, we should consider the factor load. So as far as design for earthquake is concerned, it should be factored load in all the cases. What percentage of mass participation is acceptable? Uh, it is not clear mass participation in a mode, single mode or mass participation in all the modes we are considering. So both the questions are the, uh, answered in the code. The single mode, it has to be, I mean, combining the first three mode, it should be 65%. That's what the code says. Otherwise, it will be considered as irregularity. And uh, when we are considering the total number of modes, then the total mass participation should be 90%. And the question is, suppose you consider a large number of um, um, modes and still you are not getting 90%, then what to do? So one solution there is to go for time history analysis. You can do linear time history analysis. It's not difficult. Only thing is that it will need more computer time. Uh, Pyle has shown one example also where you can develop uh, spectrum compatible time histories and uh, you can use that. That is one thing. Another way is that in place of eigenvalues, you can, eigenvectors, you can uh, try Ritz vectors. Ritz vector are another way of decomposing uh, the stiffness matrix. So another way of developing orthogonal uh, set of uh, vectors, which we get uh, in any case uh, using uh, eigenvectors. So try with Ritz vector. If you are able to get 90% participation with Ritz vector, go ahead with Ritz vector. That can solve the problem sometimes. Otherwise, you go for time history analysis. Okay, whether the drift check should be done only for earthquake or it should be done with dead load and live load. This question uh, we have uh, discussed, but I would like to take up this again. Uh, in my opinion, what is given in IS 1893 is not acceptable. It is giving uh, the check of 0.4% under unfactored earthquake force. That means the serviceability level earthquake force, which is uh, not acceptable. It should be done for the uh, factored load that is with a factor of 1.5 so that it becomes dB. Then whether we should consider dead load or live load also along with this, actually dead load and live load are not supposed to cause any literal drift because these are vertical loads, but these can cause period defects. So it's better to check the drift for the combination of dead load, live load, and earthquake, all those combinations which you are doing with factored load, including period defect. So that should be less than 0.4% or 2% uh, in reality, because 0.4% is uh, for reduced load. Shall we have to scale down the base shear value when the static to dynamic ratio is less than one? Uh, perhaps this means BB bar by BB correction. So no, you don't have to scale it down. If, although I do not, I have not come across a structure where this will happen. But in case it is happening, uh, we are not reducing. We are, we are going what, because I said uh, that the period is uncertain. So uh, to take care of that uncertainty, we have to consider the extreme value, the longest predicted value and the shortest predicted value of the period. So both values we have to consider the shortest one for calculation of forces and the longest one for the calculation of displacement. Okay. This is another question. I mean, it, it is a debate uh, logic that uh, code says that you can perform um, site-specific analysis 
but using site specific analysis if you get forces less than um, what is given in the code then why it is not allowed to use the site specific value because the code puts the limit that you cannot design for lesser than the code the reasons are obvious it is not because of the scientific reason it is uh, more to prevent uh, unethical practices because we know um, in our country anything can happen if you give uh, somebody the power to certify the level of earthquake for which you have to design okay so to avoid that type of situation in the code it has been given that uh, uh, spending money is a different issue but by spending money on uh, i mean you give me the money which you have to put in the building and i will reduce the earthquake forces for you that type of situation should not happen so you should put that money in the building and uh, that will save the occupants in future so that's the purpose scientifically you are right if we really do a rigorous uh, and this site specific uh, studies these are also not full proof these these are uh, also uh, subject to lot of interpretation and uh, people can interpret differently so if freedom is given to them to interpret they can interpret it in many ways so the code takes away that freedom it says that at least what is given in the uh, code you have to design for that if you want to improve upon that you are welcome but you cannot reduce below that sir what time to what time you want to continue you have to do and yeah. and the participants i have no problem uh, no uh, then uh, what we can do is we can formally close and uh, whatever and uh, we can still continue this okay okay so that and people Payal, go and, yeah payal wanted to say something her yeah. summary is over or no yeah payal no. your lecture is over yes sir yeah. okay fine okay so we can do but questions are so many and all are uh, interesting questions yeah. i would love to answer all those but no. provided we have yeah so, now we have ample time we will just formally close and then uh, continue whoever want to listen they can listen okay but then um, if some of them are leaving then um, they will not be i mean then they have a choice they have a choice that's why what what we can do is yes or what we can do is we can prepare answer to these questions and that's the and send to them so we will write down the answers to these questions and there we can club and uh, also um, rearrange these questions and then we can so i will take help from uh, mr sanket and uh, then then we can sure. develop these questions answer to this uh, you can very well continue just to say formally thanks and we can we can continue normally what we do is after our regular workshop you used to be always surrounded by interested participant student so similar thing can happen here but uh, let formally because you know so many people also have some issues so yeah. i mean you, you can close i will also say thank you and then we can continue then we can huh, still continue and then we can write to them also there is no issue hmm. so uh, we'll take this i take this opportunity to uh, give a word of thanks uh, we are very very thankful and grateful to professor dr yogendra singh to uh, have this wonderful two day session uh, as usual and uh, <coughs> he's on a, one of us now so i don't know how to thank him i'll try and i want to uh, thank uh, payal for the efforts he has done and our manish nitin and sanket who had also they have done some uh, efforts in last week for this parametric study our administrative team that is viha anand and reshma has done a tremendous job this this was a paid seminar and obviously uh, paid seminar needs lot of efforts to registration and all such things still if if some hiccups are there we are sorry for sorry for that and will Try to improve in that, but uh, they have taken huge efforts. So we are thankful to them, uh, all of them, and obviously to the uh, thankful to all the participants who are from uh, all corners of the country and abroad also. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just, uh, Mr. Jain, you can even also want to share something. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I mean, you can sh show the slide. 
really people have come from all the corners of india and eight other countries so i think it is a national integration program nanta ji said i can we are on patil sir fine that side will come meanwhile i'll just mention few of the important persons who are present senior persons which start with satish dupelia at a very senior age also he came and attended the morning session hemant tolakar abhay ghate rc tipnis sridh bilare vinay saplekar girish dravid might be i have missed few names uh, but still okay yeah this is the slide so this you can see it's a national integration program <laughs> uh, uh, because of dr yogendra singh we had to revise our geography and count how many states are there in india and i can i'm surprised there are two unknown states also which we, <laughs> could, not, <laughs> which we could not identify and we also did it by two methods so one total says 404 second says 414 now which to take i don't know but uh, once again it shows the popularity and the impression of yeah. dr you can there is international registration also from australia ah. bangladesh malaysia saudi arabia eight other countries eight other countries and we will definitely have a follow up session what we what dr yogendra singh promised in fact he used to come earlier twice in a year we can think one more also we were stay thinking about having a series of four or five lectures continued maybe in may or june as per his convenience but one follow up session will be definitely taken up and one more announcement for the all the participants that who have attended this time our next webinar will invite them at a very nominal fee of 150 and students will be admitted free so with this i once again thank dr yogendra singh and declare that webinar is closed but the discussion can remain on because whenever we had workshop we have found people don't allow yogendra singh to move out even to take cup of tea even to go for <laughs> <laughs> so sir we can continue for 15 minutes is no issue yeah. but some people are waiting for formal closure that is why I... so sir thank you very much and we can continue again yeah thank you mr kulkarni yeah so those who want to leave they they will be free now and uh, we will continue for another 15 minutes so whatever questions i can take up i will try to take up and then with the help of uh, two uh, people sanket and uh, pile we will try to prepare a detailed answer because all these questions are very important yeah. they uh, are giving lot of uh, food for thought even for me so i will like to answer all these questions we will prepare a question answer Uh, bank sort of thing, and then we can share. So once again, um, uh, I mean, before you leave, I'm thankful to all the participants for coming in this large number. It is really uh, very encouraging. I I feel very humbled, and thank you very much. So now we can take up some of the questions. those who have some other work and want to leave they may go ahead okay uh, this question we discussed that uh, out of uh, wide column analogy or shell element which one is correct which one we should go for so uh, both the methods have their advantages but as far as the accuracy is concerned then in case of a slender shear wall the wide column will give you more accurate answer because you have seen as we go on increasing uh, the fineness of the mesh in uh, shell element model it approaches towards the uh, wide column answer Uh, but one thing we have to be careful here when we are using wide column that column uh, frame element itself should have uh, shear deformations because when we are modeling the shear wall using shell element 
then the shear deformations in in plane action it is considering but uh, uh, if we are using an euler beam where shear deformations are not considered then that will that may give us uh, uh, higher stiffness Okay, is there any reason for values of seismic coefficient given in table seven of IS eighteen ninety two minimum design earthquake horizontal loads? Actually, there is no um, theoretical uh, region for that. Only thing is that we want to achieve a minimum level of safety. So the assessment of seismic response or performance of a structure is a still very developing field. even with all this non linear analysis and performance based design there is lot of uncertainty first of all there is uncertainty about the non linear behavior itself so even if we are doing a very sophisticated analysis we are not sure that uh, the structure will be uh, having the safety levels as we desire so to ensure those minimum things this is based on the collective judgment of the code committee so it it's not derived based on any technical uh, exercise it is more based on judgment okay how can we model column as a fiber member uh, actually this question is not uh, relevant for today's talk uh, the reason for that is that we have uh, limited to uh, linear analysis of uh, structures in linear analysis the fiber model is not required fiber model is required for non linear analysis and two types of fiber models are available one is the fiber hinge model which is there in etf or sap so we can use a fiber hinge model then in some other software like uh, seismo struct there is a fiber model also available where the whole column is divided into a number of fibers and uh, then uh, the properties are estimated at the global level so both these models are possible but these are required for non linear analysis we don't require those for linear analysis in linear analysis our conventional frame analysis is accurate okay although i have answered this question earlier but there is no harm in explaining again so when we have floating walls and columns on transfer girders this question comes again so um, we have to ensure that the transfer girder is stronger than those and the connection has to be integral so we have to design the transfer girder in such a way that the transfer girder should not yield any relationship between degrees of freedom and number of modes to be considered no there is no direct relationship but uh, the number of modes required to capture 90% mass participation in general increases with the height of the building so if the number of stories in the building are increasing more number of modes you will require to get 90% mass participation but there is no direct relationship between the degrees of freedom and the number of modes required to capture Ninety uh, percent uh, mass participation. That depends upon the configuration of the structure, not the fineness of the finite element mesh you are creating. Degrees of freedom depend on the fineness of the mesh. If we do pushover analysis in gravity direction, then what we should take: displacement control or force control, and how it affects the results, and which one is more accurate? Okay. Uh, pushover analysis we have not covered here but pushover analysis we do for non linear analysis uh, when our system is yielding and we do not allow our structure to yield under gravity so whether you do pushover linear analysis or non linear analysis results will be same in gravity because in gravity essentially our structure is uh, behaving like um, uh, elastic linear elastic so there you can use force control because in force control you specify the limit of the force up to which you are pushing it and uh, in displacement you have to specify the limit of on the displacement 
So for gravity, uh, we should do it under force control and the behavior, the forces will be same as you have obtained from linear uh, gravity analysis. Only thing is that before performing the pushover analysis in the horizontal direction, we have to start from the results of the gravity analysis. So the lateral load will be applied, the earthquake force will be acting after the gravity load is applied on the structure. That's it. Okay, there is uh, a question about the code and the draft code suggested by IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, that it says that the torsional uh, amplification factor of 1.5 need to be applied in uh, case of response spectrum method. So if we are using sufficient number of modes which are capturing the torsional behavior also, we have 90% mass participation in the torsional mode also. Uh, then uh, I think this amplification of 1.5 is not needed in uh, the torsional mode. So what is given in IS 1893, we can go ahead with that. But if we are considering only few modes, where only the translational uh, modes, we are getting 90% uh, mass participation and uh, the torsional modes are not represented, not uh, captured there, then we have to consider this eccentricity in uh, response spectrum map. Should R factor be modified for different POs? By PO, I understand performance objectives here. So actually, uh, what is uh, this R factor is not uh, in context of performance-based design. So performances are not specified in terms of performance objectives are not specified in any document in terms of R. So theoretically, it is possible you can um, calibrate R factors with different performance objectives and decide accordingly. But uh, till date, no such study is available where you can calibrate R values with different performance objectives. What is the performance objective of IS code designed RC buildings? Uh, it's not clear. Nowhere it is mentioned. It is not documented anywhere. If you see IS 1893, 2002 code, there it was said that uh, the intention of the code is that the building should not collapse in case of a severe earthquake and it should not get damaged significantly in case of a moderate earthquake. But there is no mechanism to ensure that also. So in 2016, even that line was removed and uh, now nothing is mentioned in the code that what we are intending. If you design the building as per code, what do you expect from your building? That is not mentioned anywhere. Uh, intentionally, the code committee has removed that because code committee itself was not sure that whether uh, the building's design as per code uh, will be able to achieve a particular performance objective. So that is not there. So we cannot say what performance objective our buildings are going to achieve. And that's why we need uh, at least a supplement on performance assessment of code design building so that we can assess what we are really getting when we are designing buildings uh, from our code. But the intention is what we want to achieve is that in case of MCE, our building should not collapse. And in case of DVE, there should not be any uh, life safety hazard. So we should achieve life safety under DVE and uh, collapse prevention under MCE. That is the common understanding, but it's not documented anywhere. Okay, this I have answered how to get time series data for Indian earthquakes. We are running a website. I have given you the link also. You can get from there. 
okay in one time in one research paper the time history was scaled down what is the reason for scaling down uh, scaling down may also be required uh, if the target response spectrum is below the response spectrum of the time history then we have to scale it down in other words if i have recorded uh, uh, i have taken a ground motion which was recorded for a larger earthquake and uh, what i am expecting at my site the hazard is lower in that case i have to scale it down also so the time histories are scaled both ways those are scaled up as well as down so both are required and both are permitted although i have not discussed this in more detail but uh, i just had a glimpse of that you might have seen in my will conditional mean spectrum be a useful method for selecting ground motion histories yes so conditional mean spectrum will give us more or is a more realistic method of selecting time histories than the code based uh, response spectrum okay this uh, how we get this two third in the vertical acceleration uh, this question is coming uh, from many people so this uh, two third is based upon the measurement so in far field when people have done measurement on horizontal and vertical components in general the vertical component have been obtained on an average as two third of the horizontal component so this is based on measurement but this is uh, there in case of far field in near field when we are measuring very close to the source then the vertical component can be even higher so this factor can be even greater than 1 so it is not valid for near field i think this i have answered that why we do not get uh, 65% mass participation when we are modeling uh, with basement so when you are modeling with basement wall you will never get 65% or you will not be able to achieve 90% so in that case you should satisfy the 65% criteria when you are fixing at the top of the base uh, basement so you fix at the top of basement and then see then it will give you an idea that whether your building is regular enough or not in time period calculation building with a stilt floor which formula to be used so whenever there is an uncertainty you are not sure because there is no formula for buildings with a stilt floor the code says that the buildings with a stilt floor should not be actually constructed but if we want to construct them then uh, we cannot take any relaxation on the period we should use the period corresponding to infield frame because there is no other formula available so that formula is uh, reasonably conservative okay in case of beams horizontal members having axial stress more than 0.1 fck needs to be designed as column yes but before that we have to uh, see what is the reason why we are getting more than 0.1 fck uh, traditionally in conventional buildings it should not happen because if we are having a thick slab and that is monolithic with our beams so all the axial force will be taken care of by the slab so the beam should not be subjected to this force so if we have not modeled the slab either as rigid diaphragm or using shell element then this may happen and if that is happening we have to ignore it because that is due to our modeling that is not happening in the actual structure so if by proper modeling also you are getting it more than 0.1 fck then it is to be detailed and designed as a column but uh, if it is because of any modeling problem then uh, it is to be considered accordingly yeah um, somebody has said that torsion may not be necessarily third mode in all types of buildings yes if the building is very long it will not be uh, the third mode uh, but it shows that the building is torsionally flexible and in that case what we have to do we have to provide uh, shear walls in the transverse direction as close to the extreme perimeter as possible so that the building becomes rigid in torsional mode 
and uh, we have to somehow ensure that the torsion is third mode. We have to change our configuration. What is the maximum time period in tall structures which is permissible? I have not seen any limit on uh, the time period uh, in case of uh, tall structures. The limits are provided because why, uh, what is controlling period? The period is controlled by the stiffness and stiffness is controlled in all the codes by the permitted interstory drift. So if we are controlling the interstory drift, the period will be controlled accordingly. Okay, uh, this is also an important uh, issue. Sometimes we have composite uh, systems, composite systems like this in this question, it has been asked that the uh, like airport structure where uh, the roof is RCC, where as um, no a structure apart from roof, that means supporting a structure is RC, whereas the roof is steel. In that case, which response reduction factor we should use? So response reduction factor depends on the amount of energy dissipation or the rate of energy dissipation. So we have to look for where the energy is getting dissipated, where the hinges are forming. So if the hinges are forming in columns and columns are made of RCC, then the response reduction factor will depend on the RCC columns. For example, in bridges, uh, if the superstructure is of steel and uh, piers are of RCC, then we go for uh, RCC peers, but keep in mind if the hinges are forming in columns, then the response reduction factor will not be same as you are getting in case of frames. So the ductility of columns will be reduced. But if we have a RCC frame system and at the top of that we are providing a steel structure and a steel structure is just resting on that RCC frame, it is not developing any hinges or not uh, undergoing any energy dissipation, then it will be based on the system which is yielding, which is dissipating energy. So the key is the system which is dissipating energy. That should decide the damping, that should decide the uh, response reduction factor. Okay, uh, I have included something about flat slab, but I could not take up that. So there is a question about flat slab. IS 1893 says that shear wall is to be designed for 100% force. For what region this clause has been added? All right. So uh, the reasons for uh, the flat slab clauses in our code are historical. Uh, the reason is that uh, initially in our code, flat slabs were not there. When flat slabs were not covered by our code, our designers were interpreting in their own ways. The smart designers were interpreting that uh, then they can design it anyway because code does not say anything. So code does not uh, restrain us from doing anything. So we can do anything. The other ones, the more conservative ones were interpreting it that uh, um, because the code is not saying anything, that means this is not permitted. So we should not use uh, flat slab. The real situation is like this, that flat slabs are not to be considered as literal load resisting elements. These can be um, secondary elements, which are there to resist the vertical load to support the gravity load, but these should not take the literal load. But saying this is all right, how to ensure it that uh, the flat slab will not take any literal load? flat slab or any two systems will share the load in proportion to their stiffness. So when we are applying lateral load on flat slab and shear walls, the load will be distributed in proportion to their stiffness. But the stiffness of flat slab should be small. That is one thing. Secondly, in the flat slabs are prone to punching shear failure. And that is governed by the punching shear failure is controlled by the interstory drift. 
so inter story drift is to be controlled and as a result the shear walls have to be very rigid so that's why the code has come out with this clause that uh, we should design shear walls large enough and rigid enough to take 100% force and at the same time the inter story drift should also be limited to 0.1 and that 0.1 is based on this simple understanding because uh, in uh, uh, aci 0.5% inter story drift is the minimum which is allowed at uh, any value of uh, gravity shear ratio so that 0.5 they have divided by the maximum response reduction factor 5 and it becomes 0.1 but this is very very stringent and this issue was raised during the code committee that why we are making this stringent why why this is so stringent then the answer uh, the co in code committee was that we do not want people to use uh, flat slab we want to discourage it so one way of discouraging is penalizing it so we prefer that a flat slab should not be used Uh, we should uh, use the beam column frame system but internationally yes i agree lot of development has taken place and now a uh, lot of methods by which we can uh, design our flat slabs to have adequate uh, story drift without punching shear failure using uh, different types of shear reinforcement including studs that is there so i think we will stop here and uh, i will try to take up all these uh, questions which you have raised through um, i mean uh, we will make a compilation compilation and compile and uh, we will try to answer these and then we will circulate okay thank okay. you very much for okay. thank you thank you, thank you most of the people are still here still there yeah our 82 people are still there <laughs> thank you sir thank you very much Okay, Kulkarni Sir. So bye, bye, thank bye. you very much. And I'll keep in. I'll call you on Monday. Bye, bye. We will. We will be in touch. Okay. Right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Shall I? I'll close.